I don't. You just you went away. I heard Jimmy changes the screen, uh, the stream key, and then it just sound faded out. I don't know if I'm alone. <laughs> You're live. We're going live. On. We're going live for us. <laughs> We're going live. Let's do it. It's too late to run in terror because it's happening again. Skep Talk has begun. I'm your host, Forrest Valkai, and as always, joining me is the incomparable Erica the Gutsick Gibbon. How are you doing today? You can run, but you can't hide. Forrest and I will find you, and we will attempt to educate you on overly gratuitous subjects. <laughs> in The science is coming for you. The science is coming. You can't escape. There's no way. You can't run. <laughs> uh, and we're also starting on time this week. So suck it, various people in the comments. Uh, it's, it's an exciting we all, time. I'm we, sorry. We all, know the, we all know the variable that allowed for this. <laughs> it's starting Arden is producing time. this time is what it is. It's, exactly. it's Arden exactly. producing. Uh, Everybody Hi, shout out Arden Hart in the comments because she's our producer this time. Yes. Uh, Jimmy uh, pooped himself to death uh, and and uh, will yeah. not be back uh, at least until the next time that he is. Um, but uh, today, uh, <laughs> the F's in the chat for Jimmy. Um, but we're, we've got a great show for you tonight. Uh, we're very excited. Uh, I know I've just come back from a million things. I'm stoked as hell to be back here. Uh, Hats are occurring. We were discussing this earlier on today. We're wearing hats this time. So pre prepare for a hat theme show. Uh, Erica, what's going on with you? I, I offered to remove the hat, but Forrest was insistent. I was like, I can take the hat off. No, and, no. you know, for those of you, I'm very insecure about my head size. It's quite small. And so I was like, I can take the hat off. You know, it, was, it won't bother me. Uh, but secretly, I did want to keep the hat on. But other than that, mm. I'm doing really well. Things are actually like... Things are going really good for me right now. I'm beyond psyched. I, I didn't get a chance to tell you this, Forrest, but I'm going to take this opportunity to humble brag in front of everybody. I'm going to the field this summer, and I'm going to the field not just to take measurements, but to search for Miocene ape teeth on the coast of Lake Victoria. So I'm I'm beyond psyched. That's awesome. That. I'm, I'm excited. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to be um, taking lots of pictures to, to send once I have Wi-Fi again. So it's going to be... Dope. Uh, but then my dog threw up this morning and it kind of cast a shadow on everything. So it's, it's, you know, you win some, you lose some is kind of how I'm, I'm categorizing today. <laughs> that's huge. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. No, that's, that's great. I just got back from Paleo Dig this, this week. Um, I went out with a, a group great. from, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. We were digging up camel fossils in West Oklahoma. Um, yeah. It was yeah. awesome. By the way, for those who don't know, Camels and horses evolved here in the in, in the good old U.S. of A. And then they migrated. I think it was during the last ice age, if I remember right. They, they uh, migrated across to Eurasia um, and then have recently been brought back over the past you know, few hundred years. Um, it's freaking dope stuff, man. And so we were out there digging those things up as well as learning about a whole bunch of awesome native traditional cultures and things. Um, yeah, we were exploring uh, uh, indigenous cultures from this part of the country, which most indigenous cultures are in one way or another from this part of the country because this is where we force them in the later stages of the genocide um and uh that was one thing we learned about man if you want to hear me ramble for a long time uh about the uh the the washita massacre uh which they still call the washita battle here because america oh. is nothing if not a gaslighter um but uh when when custer went in and slaughtered a bunch of uh, men women and children in peacetime as they were camping in Wollonga River and, and killed people in their sleep. Crazy time. We learned all about it. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's a fun time. And uh, I'm going to take this off because it's driving me insane. Look at my hair now. Um, and so we've got, like, uh, we've already got calls. Sorry. It's long. It's long. Your, your hair is longer than I've seen it in quite yeah. some time. It won't stop growing. I keep trying to make it stop growing and it just won't stop. Uh, I'm going to get some of this removed cut it, soon. Cut it, cut it. Still hair. Still hair. <laughs> it just keeps happening. Um, but we've got a great show lined up for everybody tonight. Um, and I'm sure that uh, Erica and I will go on many a good tangent because, like, I know I'm psyched as shit. 
about like everything I've been working on. I'm sure you've got some cool shit to talk about too. Um, with that, uh, if it's uh, if it's cool with you, I'm just gonna jump right into to calls. Yeah. Oh, dude, I'm ready. Like I'm beyond ready to to skip talk about some cool science <laughs> and probably ghosts. Sick, nasty. Maybe ghosts. Oh my god, do you think do you think Deborah will call back? Deborah? And tell us about the Deborah? haunted ketchup. <laughs> Are you out yeah, there? The I know what you're ketchup. talking about. I, yeah. I'm really, I'm really hoping for that. That's really what I want to hear. Or I, the numerology guy. Oh, we have fun here. I'm really hoping for uh uh we got the the I've got a couple of dudes on Twitter who have been blowing up all of my tweets about how sex and gender are the same thing and any mm -hmm. science book who says otherwise is influenced by liberal politics. Uh and I've got one dude who's been following so many of my TikTok posts and now has moved to my YouTube channel to tell me that evolution isn't real and he can prove it because uh, uh, if, if, if a man evolved, he would have had to have wait for a woman to evolve in the same 80 years. No. Um, and that is statistically impossible. And so therefore evolution doesn't make any sense. I, I oh hope one of those guys call or uh, I would love to hear from Wesley as well. Uh, he's the guy who uh, says that the teeth in your mouth are proof of Jesus among many other things. Uh, and Jesus, uh, Jesus, Jimmy aka jesus won't let me talk to him because uh, jimmy's just had a terrible interaction with him so many times uh, he just doesn't want to let him back on if that guy calls in i have uh like two very particular questions for him that i would like to shake his way so hopefully we'll get some good people today like, i'm oh, i'm i'm I'm, excited. I'm hopeful i'm i'm genuinely is it is it perhaps the y5 pattern in the molar it stands for yahweh so it's the it's the yahweh five pattern that's how the teeth that's, equal jesus right? that's like, got to be what it is that's got to be what it is I'm like, i gotta know like now i gotta know i want i want to be enlightened more than anything <laughs> wesley please do let call me, in and um wesley, and, and please. yeah d tell us all about it let me see let me see really quickly just 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 very briefly just in case he doesn't because it you know I, I can only assume with my massive ego that he's he's watching everything that we do looking for the opportunity to call in but let me just double check because I did get an email last time uh, we he was on. Um, here we go. Um, I got an email last time he was on, and and he waited on the line for like an hour. And uh, Jimmy finally Jimmy, let him on okay. and just said, and, and literally just said, uh, uh, Wesley, Wesley, I just I brought you on just to say go fuck yourself, and then hung up on him. Um, and so like that, I so wanted so badly. Right, it's so uh, it's, it's it's so un. <laughs> uh, but I did find after that I I said publicly like I want a chance to like explore what this dude's talking about. Um, and I got an email that night from a channel uh called Now That's Debatable. Um, and they they sent me an email and they had had like an hour long conversation with this dude on stream. Um, and so I listened to their whole thing. Um, and I wanted to, I just pulled up that email so I could make sure I was getting their channel right. Um, but yeah, if, if anybody wants to watch that video, um, it's mm -hmm. called Satan said sad and delicious. Um, uh, Wesley believes I'll put it in the, I just put it in the chat there. Um, Wesley believes that, uh, uh, among other things that like Jesus said some words and everybody on the whole planet heard it. Uh, and if you say oh. you didn't hear it, you're lying. And then Satan said some things. He said sad and delicious. And every single human being heard Satan say sad and delicious. And if you think that you didn't say that, then you're lying. Uh, and and that 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 everyone had the same reoccurring dream for like a week straight. And if you say you didn't have that dream, you're lying. And and like and all of this happened in like when I was in fourth grade. Was that Yeah, that is so specific. It's so specific. It, like exceedingly specific claims this guy makes that's why i want to talk to him because after listening to that okay. hour of him explaining in nauseating detail the things that he believes uh i could go on and on uh it, it, you know like what, I, I i have like some very particular I, questions for that dude i i've got i had a similar experience once where someone who had been heckling my channel wanted to explain why he is um religious and doesn't like evolution and all that kind of stuff and the story amongst mm -hmm. other things involved an encounter that he had with a giant gelatinous spirit cube in his hallway and i was like this this is pod racing like now this this is for real like this is winning me over for real like i, I sometimes you gotta wonder right like i 
It's a mix of intrigue and concern, I feel. So I hope that we hear from both of these gentlemen tonight, uh, although I'm not was, with my breath. These, these guys seem to get like really brave giant. until they have an opportunity to talk. Right. That's what I'm worried about as well. We have like a giant gelatinous spirit cube. Was your yeah. hallway constructed by a Sarah rack, the lich that makes all the yeah. D&D dungeons? <laughs> like, that's what I like. Right. I was picturing tight. like, like, like a gelatinous cube, right? Like, like a, yeah. an enemy yeah. mob. I was like, oh my God. Gary like, Gygax no. taught me about Jesus. <laughs> roll initiative. Hurry. <laughs> roll initiative. <laughs> I need to roll a John 316. <laughs> Right. Uh, as always, uh, if you are a theist or a creationist or a, 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 a race realist or a, a, a binary gender type person or a, any of the things that have to do with like literally basic biology, uh, then please call in and talk to us. Uh, uh, the number will appear at the bottom of the screen at some time or another. Um, and the lines are always open for, for, for your types of conversations. Theists and, and people who are encouraging uh, like a serious conversation, a real debate, always get priority, always get precedent. Um, but with that, we've been rambling for like 10 minutes, so I'm going to move on to our first calls. Um, and we've got a few of them that are seem pretty interesting. Uh, I'm going to start with Cindy, pronoun she, her in New York. Let's talk about hormones changing skeletal structures. Cindy, you're on the line. How are you doing today? Hi. I'm doing Hi. good. <laughs> um, I really enjoy both you guys. Um, I think I'm especially calling for Erica. Um, uh, what does Screener put? Uh, yeah. The, the the screener said, due to hormones changing skeletal structure in the future, will it affect the ability to identify sex based on bones? Mm -hmm. That's what I've got over here. Yeah, and I think that's why I was kind of thinking of Erica because she's primatologist. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what it was saying, like right now, if you see a cemetery of, uh, let's say, a thousand years ago, um, you could say that's a man, that's a woman, that's a child, and you can tell that just by looking at, let's say, their skull or their bone structure. Um, let's say um, a thousand years in the future, and if you were to come across a cemetery, and you have trans people that have been undergoing the hormone therapy. I know the hormone, I believe, changes the soft tissue, uh, you know, softening the face, maybe curving the hips and so on and so forth. But does it make a change to the bone structure at all? So my understanding... <clears throat> My understanding is that the the influence that hormones can play when they're administered, um, especially if they're different from your sort of assigned sex at birth, assigned gender at birth, it depends on when they're when they're administered, right? So if it's pre-puberty, it's going to have an enormous influence on the kind of structures that you develop. So we have like general trends for like masculine and feminine trajectories for how the bones are going to grow and develop and indeed how muscle is going to grow and develop and then sort of impact muscle attachment sites and muscle scarring. Um, typically males tend to have more muscle mass than females, your average male versus your average female. So his muscle scarring is going to be like on the surfaces of bones, it's going to be more intense. But again, this is a generalization. Your average guy on the street versus like a, a female bodybuilder is going to be vastly different. You're you're going to see some <laughs> some very um, interesting trends there. I think that so to answer your question there, it depends on when the hormones are being administered as to how the how it's going to impact identification down the line. But we also have to appreciate that the identification also isn't perfect. So we can do decently well with regard to identifying um, bones on the basis of generalizations, but unless you're doing DNA testing, there is going to be a lot of room for error. And it's going to depend on what you're actually assessing. So for instance, uh, contours of the face, they're not gonna tell you with any kind of certainty whether you're looking at a quote unquote biological male or a quote unquote biological female. Um, and I use those terms just to, to be clear and kind of what we're, make sure we're on the same page here. 
um, things like the pelvis, especially like the the um, the sort of uh, anterior portion of the pelvis, are going to be better. But even that isn't going to be one hundred percent as far as assessing sex. You've got men with really wide hips, and you've got women with really narrow hips, and that's just part of natural human variation. A really big confounding factor these days is actually childbirth, right? So in the past, folks who were biologically or assigned female at birth. Um, they died in childbirth if they didn't have really wide pelvic openings. And so that was a nice, nice, you know, in a natural selection term, um, way to ensure that wider pelvis tended to be associated with assigned female at birth and narrower pelvis with assigned male at birth. But today, if you're a woman with a really narrow or quote unquote masculine pelvis, you can just have kids, like you can just have a C-section and you'll be perfectly fine. Uh, similarly, the association with males having very narrow hips is relaxed, right? That that pressure is going to be relaxed um, in, just because you've got kind of like a correlated response going on as far as how males are responding to the fetal pressures. And so what you end up with is you end up with a lot more, and here's the critical portion, the, the, the kind of punchline of it all, you end up with a lot more variation in the human population. There's just more humans of more, uh, assigned sexes at birth and, and um, identification via gender that are going to have different pelvis than in the past uh, where much stricter associations were kind of at play. And so what I would say as kind of a, a long story short answer to your question, for the hormone thing, it depends on when the hormones are administered as far as the, the extreme nature as to how it's going to impact the bone and how the bone changes. Um, but also modern medicine is just going to screw with our ability to identify um, the sexes, assigned sexes at birth of people moving forward because modern medicine makes it possible for narrow-hipped women to give birth and proliferate narrow-hipped genes in females. Uh, and, and I myself am, am the product of that. My mom uh, almost died in childbirth and I made it out, but I have super narrow hips. If I ever want to have kids, then I'm probably going to have to have a C-section and pass my devious narrow hipped <laughs> genes onto my offspring uh, just to confuse future conservatives and archaeologists. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Oh, yes. Thank yeah, you very If I much. could really quickly. Yeah, I, I would. I just want to parrot a couple of things that you said and and, and also add to it. It's just like, yeah, mm -hmm. I've, I've worked in a paleoanth lab for a little while now. And, and like this is something that I've had to become somewhat familiar with. And it's a common misconception when people talk about, you know, uh, uh, forensics. When we talk about, you know, ancient uh, uh, looking at ancient skeletons that we like, oh, yeah, this is very clearly a male and this is very clearly a female. Not really. It's more like almost certainly male, probably male, I don't know, maybe female, probably female, you know, it's, it's, it's more on like this kind of gradient. Um, and a, a shocking number of the skeletons we find are kind of up in the air because, you know, people talk about pelvises all the time, but that's not the only marker by a long shot. The, 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 you know, width of the pelvis, the width of the pubic angle, the nuchal crest, the brow ridge, like there's a million different things you can point to. And like, oftentimes you'll get one or two parts pointing one way and the other two parts pointing the other way. And it's just kind of all over. Um, and like Erica pointed out with the advent of modern medicine, we see all sorts of trends in human evolution. We're getting taller and taller because of the access to increased nutrition that puts lots of modern females well within the range of what males were a few hundred, maybe even a couple thousand years ago. Um, our heads are getting bigger and bigger because of those C-sections, because you no longer have to fit a baby the size of a watermelon out of a cervix the size of a quarter all the time anymore. We are now not having that selection pressure for our hips. And we're seeing that in the fossil record and in modern humans today. Um, so like it's, and, and also, you know, we see even in uh, trans people who are adults, we still see changes in things like bone density when it comes to, to uh, um, uh, taking hormones. That wouldn't change the structure so much, but it might be another thing that you might measure at some point or another, especially if you're trying to figure out like muscle mass or what, you know, uh, these things that you'd look at things like bone density quite a bit. Um, so like overall, it's been fuzzy and it's getting fuzzier and that's okay. Uh, uh, to answer your oh. question directly, yeah, it will probably have some small effect. But overall, when wow. we do things like this, uh, it, we're, we're that the bone markers aren't the only markers that we're looking at either. There's also cultural markers and and like things that they're put in tombs. So yeah, it's it's yeah, it's it's only going to get weirder, and that's a great thing. That's actually really interesting from an anthropological perspective. <laughs> so hormones do not affect DNA whatsoever. 
Uh, not really. No, it's 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 uh, DNA. The, the central dogma of 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 biology is that DNA codes for RNA, which goes for proteins uh, or you know hormones or or what have you. Uh, whatever other thing comes from this this system. Um, and so like, it's not. It, like things can sometimes go backwards in very specific special circumstances, but more often than not, no, you, you can't take a hormone and change your DNA. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I've been waiting weeks to talk to you guys. I love you guys. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I appreciate Please your patience and your persistence. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Forrest, you read, um, you read, uh, you read Sapolsky's behave as well. Did not you? Yeah, you have it. Yeah, we never finished it, but it's fucking dope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a portion in there, and then there's also a portion in um, Franz Duval's book, Different, which came out somewhat recently, that talks about the impact of hormone washes on, like, in utero, which I was absolutely yeah. blew my mind. Uh, so for those of you out there yeah. who, who might not know about this stuff but are interested in it, it turns out, like, the, the kind of wash that you get hormonally speaking from your mother when you're in utero has a massive impact on a lot of the secondary sex characteristics that you show later in life um, from things that like that are like digit ratios to levels of testosterone, whether you're um, you know, male or female or in between or whatever. Like um, there's there's a lot of of really interesting connections that can be drawn from from how you are kind of developed from single cell to ready to be born at nine months that can be predicted just based off of how your your mother interacts with you through through the um through the placenta which is crazy and i had no idea about um and i thought it was fascinating how it can impact secondary sex characteristics that otherwise perhaps yeah. might proceed along a certain trajectory that you know, let's say your 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 xx chromosomes and your mother happens to have high testosterone or just the genes coding for for a testosterone wash it's going to greatly impact yep. How you and not even right away, right? Like it just impacts how your cells develop, and then way down the line, you impact, you go through puberty, and it's going to change, you know, what happens. Which is, I don't know, nature's weird, and I don't know a lot of like endocrinology, yeah. so I was yeah. like, oh my god, this is crazy. I'm hoping seriously to get into. I've got I've got an opportunity to take some some graduate level endocrinology courses uh, uh, here oh, in the okay. next you know a few months, and I'm stoked as death to learn a little bit more because like everything that I've learned so far. Um, it, it consistently blows my freaking mind. Um, the way we talk about like, you know, estrogen, estrogen is this purely female feminizing thing when really, like when we talk about it from like a neuroendocological perspective in utero and estrogen is what causes virilization. It's, it's, it's masculinizing the brain and like female embryos have to like bind estrogen to stop it from influencing their brain to make them more masculine it's, it's, it's freaking wild dude like it's everything's backwards and different and what people don't seem to understand is that like your particular hormone levels are as unique as your fingerprint it, it, everybody's a little bit different and like it's it's an yet another part of sex that is a very bimodal situation with a big fuzzy variation continuation in the middle it's it's just ah it's not nearly as simple yeah. as people like to pretend well it's yeah it's it's fascinating stuff and like you know i i'm in primatology so to me what's fascinating about this is like how how does how do hormones influence non-human primates in their personalities? Mm -hmm. And the answer is a lot, which really is fascinating to me. Like I've got colleagues who study like vervet monkeys, or I've got a colleague who studies uh, who's out at Thai forest. And, and they'll talk about how you've got female chimpanzees or female vervets that take on masculine roles or whatever in the troop. And it's like, you know, we assign these, these very anthropomorphic kind of uh, labels to them, but I, I don't know. I, I think it's just like, primates being primates like we're we're social animals we're very yeah. weird and we want to just do what we want to do and i think that that's absolutely wonderful what gets me about the whole thing is that like this is becoming an increasingly politically charged topic nowadays because there's a you know current attempt at genocide against trans people going on and uh it, it's it's one of these things where now we're having to pretend like this is scientifically controversial uh, when it's not um it's just what I, I hope people remember is that like biology is the study of generalities and generalities are generally wrong. They're the, biology, unlike most other science, uh, sciences where it's like, you know, I can in chemistry, I can tell you the shape of this molecule. I understand Vesper theory. So I can tell you how it's shaped and what it's going to do and how it's going to react with this guy. I can draw out the rack reaction mechanism. I know everything. 
biology is fuzzy and weird and it makes all the rules and breaks all the rules that it makes all the time. Um, and, and so the best we have is like, th there's, there's, if, if you'll allow me to, to, you know, kind of go on a tangent no, just for so a second not. here, it's a, so there's, there's different kinds of thinking in biology. And I feel like people don't appreciate that. Um, just like how there's different ways of fighting. And so like one, one style of fighting won't win every war. Um, and similarly, there's different styles of thinking in biology. And one is like typological thinking. And this is what you get a lot of whenever you're taking biology courses in college. This is what a ribosome looks like. This is what a prokaryotic cell looks like. This is what a, a topoisomerase does. It does. It's exactly, this is the standard template of this thing. And that's really useful for learning how stuff works and how the pieces fit together. But it misses out on the variety and the variation. There's tree thinking which is thinking about where things evolved and how they fit on the evolutionary tree. What's the reason why we have five digits? What's the reason why these things have wings and these things don't? When did it evolve? What are the conditions in which it evolved under? What's it doing today? That's really important for understanding functionality, but you miss out on individual differences in population dynamics. And that's where another kind of thinking, which I really hope people take for granted, like start looking into now, population thinking looking at the whole spectrum of what the whole population is doing, all the variation within it. Population thinking is what you use in things like evolutionary biology. If you're looking at like cancer research, cancer is all about clonal evolution. And so if, if, if these cancer cells are fighting for resources and one of them is gonna metastasize in order to predict and understand when or if or how that'll happen, you need to be thinking in terms of populations, not in terms of typological cancer cells do X, Y, Z thing or tree thinking cancer evolved because of whatever, you know? Um, and like when we talk about things like sex and gender differences in populations, in, in, in the whole 8 billion human population, so often the conversation switches to typological thinking. We need two types of gametes and, 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 and this is what a man is and this is what a woman is or tree thinking sex evolved however many billion years ago and it's it's been doing it this way and if we have dysfunction or disorder it's not actually something useful for sex we shouldn't identify it and what we should be doing is population thinking here's the variation it doesn't mean anything it just is it's there and we can grapple with it and especially when we're talking about human rights and representation I feel like that's the proper way to do it. Otherwise, you end up with some really stupid and hateful beliefs. And I just, I'm, goddamn, man, I know it's a really important conversation we're having right now, and I'm not begrudging having it. I'm honored to be a part of it, but it really fucking sucks and gets really annoying when people, even especially, I should say, educated biologists come into it with this, like, really typological, you know, this is how it works and it, it has to be this way and anything else doesn't make sense. And there's, if, if it's such a small population of people, they don't matter. And like, it's just, it, God damn, it, it gets me real well, riled I, up. I mean, that's my whole soapbox. Yeah, I'm I mean, so sorry. <laughs> no, dude, I, I think that's great. I mean, I, so I study sexual dimorphism, right? Like I study the difference, I, of course, in Miocene apes. So, and in um, non-human mm. primates primarily, but like I study the very general differences between classically archetypal males and classically archetypal females in a species. And I know more than anybody because I spend so much time measuring teeth and finding out that, you know, this large canine that's supposed to be a male is actually a female and a large, small canine supposed to be a female is actually a male. And, you know, what, what I think needs to be appreciated is that you can make generalizations. And as you said, biology is chock full of them. It helps us understand like the general condition of a population so that we can then appreciate exceptions because that's what biology is yeah. as you said like there's a reason why there are so few laws in biology and why most of them have to do with inheritance which is relatively consistent except when it's not <laughs> um but yep. like that's, that's that's part of it and in social species anything goes right i mean we see this time and time again yeah. Um, and, and it's, it's almost disheartening because you can observe these or read anecdotes of these really cool population dynamics of, of individuals and populations that are behaving strangely for what is typical and we call it aberrant. And it's like, I don't know that it is though, right? Because maybe, maybe it's aberrant based off of what we're used to seeing, but that doesn't mean that it isn't the fact that it's present. It means it's part of the variation. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I tend to agree. Like I, I love the exceptions. I, I think the exceptions make 
the world a lot more interesting. And I think you can simultaneously appreciate or, or rather uh, consider generalizations while appreciating the exception and, and taking those in tandem yeah. is super important if we're going to go anywhere. Exactly. And it, it, it's, it's the same thing for at, at risk of, of, you know, queuing in the people who say, oh, well, if I can decide I'm a woman, then why can't I decide I'm a cat? It's kind of the same thing as species in that, like, there isn't that we have a way of, of labeling shit. We, 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 we put labels on nature. If we find something in nature that defies our labels, that's our problem, not nature's problem. And so, like, if we have, you know, in, in terms of either sex or gender, which I understand gender is, is sociological, it's, it's, it's a social construct, not a biological one, but it behaves similarly in terms of like distribution and people. Um, like, if we have a multivariate data set without a single independent controlling variable, and none of the variables have only two outcomes, and when you plot them, you come up with a bimodal distribution. Just because we've named two places on the blumps doesn't mean those are the only important parts of the lumps. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about this all freaking night if I'm allowed to. So I'm going to go ahead and throw in um, this article. I'm actually going to put two articles about the same guy. This is Augustin Fuentes. He's a, a professor of anthropology at, uh, I believe, Princeton. Um, and he wrote this article in Sapiens called Biological Science Rejects the Sex Binary and That's Good for Humanity. He recently republished the article in, in fewer words uh, here on Scientific American. Uh, fucking post, you bitch. There we go. Um, it's uh, about why, here's why human uh, sex is not binary. And it's, it's basically the same thing, just pointing at all the variation in different ways it'll work. I don't know why it's not letting me post this into the chat but I'm going to keep trying until it does. Um, and it, it just, it's, uh, by the way, the first article was published in Sapiens magazine, which is funded by the Wintergren Foundation, which is like the biggest anthropological, yeah. you know, grant funding uh, business in the world. There it goes. Um, so we all check want those out if you want some like, I, it, part of my uh, grad no, school, no. we had to make a Wintergren application as a final exam because they're fucking tough. <laughs> like, uh, but yeah, I mean, anyway, I, that's I, I saw this Fuentes article. I mean, he, he got a lot of heat for this. And I, I was very surprised because I, I read the, the comments, you know, that he was getting on this article. And I, I thought, well, what could possibly be in it to, to receive so much vitriol? And I read the article and he was decidedly non-controversial. And I was like, you know, because you're right for us. Like, this is unfortunately like, like politics are getting in the way of, of actual science and, and good work. And, and that makes me incredibly sad. Um, none of this stuff was controversial, I don't know, seven years ago. Like, I don't know why suddenly everybody's decided to to go all wishy-washy on it. I mean, I, I certainly thought this was settled and it certainly seemed settled in the literature, but the fact that people are still like, oh my God, you know, we need to, we, you, if you're, if you identify as something that isn't literally your gametes, then you can just, I guess, go mm -hmm. rot. And it's like, I yeah. just don't understand that line of thinking. I really don't. What I love is like you, you, you cannot define like it w unless you're willing to take a a, a very non-binary stance. There isn't a way to define male or female in a way that doesn't exclude somebody. Um, and I love watching people struggle with that. Well, it's all about gametes, okay? What if I don't produce gametes? Well, it's all about the ability to produce gametes, okay? What about people with ovo testes? Well, it's it's it, they're such a small percentage; it doesn't count. It's like it's, it, and it just goes down this list of things. And it's like, oh my god! And we have to have the same conversation over and over. Uh, I think it was Stephen no. Novello, an article in Science Based Medicine. He was like, no matter what people want you to believe, none of this is controversial science. We all learn this shit. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I I think it's interesting, like how you know, and I I mean, here here we are, like right to super cis people having a conversation about it, you know uh, the, the variety <laughs> and, and gender and sex, but. You know, for for what it's worth, right? Like I I found it really interesting how this conversation has evolved through time, right? Like first it's like yeah. okay, well, sex is gender, and then it's like, well, no one's ever said that, so it's weird that you're saying that now. And they're like, okay, fine, well, it isn't gender; it's secondary sex characteristics. And it's like, 
well, okay, what about all of these exceptions, even gynecomastia and males or you know, women who are, have PCOS or anything? Like, okay, well, maybe it's not secondary sex characteristics. Maybe it's it's chromosomes. And it's like, okay, well, we have intersex people. And it's like, okay, well, no, it's not chromosomes. Actually, it's, it's uh, gametes. And then as you said, some people don't produce them at all. So you have to fall back on one of the other examples that we already showed um, aren't strictly discriminatory. And I just don't understand, like, this is such, like, the hill to die on here for group A is like, we want to have rights. And the hill to die on here for group B is, hey, I, I want to be I want to be old school on this and, and start a fight. And it's like, these, these are kind of different right. things. Like, I don't know why this is so controversial. Like, as you said, and as I've said multiple times already, nothing has changed in the past seven years, right? Like this before, you know, and I'll just let my political side out a little bit, right? Like before conservatives decided they wanted to do a casual genocide, right? Like uh, before they decided mm -hmm. that, this was all fine. Seven years ago, this was all fine. Like the science hasn't changed in that amount of time. I don't know why all of a sudden we're deciding that this is controversial. And by when I say I don't know why, I do know why. <laughs> right, it's but, um, because we need another me. scapegoat detract us from the fact that capitalism is failing yet again and, and and the gop is trying to fascism some more so we need to direct that way yeah but I mean, like, they, don't, they don't have an economic policy do they they don't have a they don't have a, a policy against to handle climate change we've got nothing for health care we've got nothing for for really anything so let's just i don't know complain about social issues and i don't it's just like okay <laughs> we, like we haven't we haven't stopped school shootings. The roads and bridges are still falling apart. Climate change is an issue. Healthcare is an issue. You can still fucking go broke if you miss a single paycheck. Still have COVID, you know, running rampant throughout the world. But hey, trans people in sports, that's the problem. That's where we need to be focusing our attention. You know, I, I'll never forget the the thing that really like kind of perked my ears. And because I have the privilege that this is the thing that perked my ears because it, it's not affecting me directly. And that's just it, it sucks that this like something had to happen as ridiculous as this for me to finally go like, oh, my God, are you are you kidding? I think it was in Kansas, right? Like the it, the GOP comes up with this really big all encompassing bill and they're like, we need to keep the you know, trans people out of sports and blah, 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 blah. And then it turned out like the, the number of people that it actually impacted was one yeah. one person yeah. that much just effort and hate and vitriol to impact one person and i was like this is yeah. psychotic this is this is um it is a hate campaign and and nothing more than that and you will not convince me here's my here's my other political side you will not convince me under any circumstances that these people gave a shit about women's sports before they felt like they could politicize it like these are the same people oh my god growing up like, and i'm sure my my folks out there ladies who, who played sports in high school and in middle school growing up i'm sure you guys experienced the same things the jabs about how women playing sports who cares about women's sports wnba uh that's dumb they can't even dunk or whatever whatever just hating on on women's sports in general now all of a sudden it's the integrity of women's sports and it's like no i don't believe you i don't believe you for a second <laughs> And isn't it funny? It is always only women's sports. It's always only trans women that are the problem. The, how many problems do we have with trans men? How many bills are out here saying that trans men need to be in the women's bathroom and make sure that's happening? How many bills or how many people are here are screaming about how many trans men are going to go destroy men's sports? It's only when we get the opportunity to mix homophobia and sexism into the diarrhea cocktail of transphobia that we now have to have this big fucking political conversation. And, and like what gets well, me the most about it is when people talk about well, like, well, this is such a small percentage of the population. This is like less than 1% of something like it. If you listen to Ann Fausto Sterling, it's almost 2%. But if you listen to this other person, it's like less than 1%. Okay, let's find a middle ground. Let's say it's 1%. 1% of the whole population. That's still millions and millions of human beings who you don't get to say don't matter. And like I always love to draw attention to the fact that real scientific truth here, over 99% of all the atoms in the universe are either hydrogen or helium. Are we going to sit here and say that carbon and oxygen and nitrogen are so rare that they don't matter? Or are we going to accept the fact that there's a lot more interesting shit going on and chemistry exists? <laughs> like... It's the same thing with humans. Yeah, most of them can fall into these two categories. 
so it just the argument of like, well, you know, if someone has no legs, does that mean we have to say that humans don't all have two legs? Yeah, humans generally have two legs, mostly have two legs, typically have two legs. If you're being scientifically accurate, chances are you're being inclusive too. And so if we say most men are XY and most women are XX, we're being scientifically accurate and also inclusive. And that's how it's written in my fucking textbooks behind me for that reason. Well, well and I, I've never encountered anybody ever who has a problem with that. Like that's that's the part that's so yeah. crazy is that it's like I've never encountered somebody who's like, oh, hoo hoo, waggle my finger. You you can't say that. You can't make that generalization. And it's like, like this is just like a fake boogeyman. Like I, I just don't, it drives me crazy. Cause yeah. you know, you're right. Like this is, this is biology. I mean, biologists know more than anything that the the exceptions are, are like, they permeate the entire field. That's what makes it exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, with the to take it back to the sports stuff again, right? Like, trans folks have been uh, able to participate in in you know the sports that they the, the category of sports that they identify as for like the past several decades, and we haven't had a single a single issue. No one's raised hell about it once, and it's only been in the past yeah. five or six yeah. years that they've decided that this is a massive problem. And I, I'm kind of sitting here scratching my head, like, what what changed? <laughs> what changed? <laughs> Why are we suddenly <laughs> And you know the answer is because it's trying. It, the attempt is to is to weaponize it, and it's like, okay, all right, well, that's not very scientific, is it? Right. If anybody wants to call in about that, about about sex and gender, or whatnot, I have no joke. Just off the top of my head, actually five. I have five literal college textbooks within arm's reach that we can read from together, uh, and it'll be a ton of fun. I've been waiting to pull out a few of them. Um, uh, hey, well, before we move on really quick, because we've been, <laughs> like, like, that's why I love having you on, because if we're going to talk about it, this would be a podcast. Um, a bunch yeah, of pitching. We'll, go on, um, we'll go on forever. I'm, I'm actually, I, I actually check in on the chat every now and again, and some people are just, I'm yeah. just getting roasted for my hat. I've been told that I need to go to the Home Depot <laughs> break room. Like, how dare you be so correct? How dare you? <laughs> I'll have you know, I love Home Depot <laughs> and I love Lowe's. So come at me. Home improvement is a, a, a very fun pastime of mine. So deal with it. And if and also my and slim if you here, like, so I'll be eating nice. again on stream. <laughs> Hell yeah! <laughs> and if you in the audience like both home improvement and trans people, check out Mercury uh, Mercury Stardust on TikTok. She's the trans handy ma'am. She is a, 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 a I believe she's a, a handy person who works on like apartment complex and stuff like that. Uh, like, like a, and she is a, a, a trans woman who can fix anything and will teach you how to unclog your sink and, and hang nails. And shit. She's cool as fuck. And we're going to be at VidCon together this year. And I'm super excited. You know, I could use that Shout because the Mercury. other day I've been making the same mistake um a lot of times like i'm sure you you relate to this forest you know like you you have your area of expertise and like that's the area and you know a lot of things about that and then there are other areas where it's just like no thoughts head empty like i i made some mm -hmm. some pasta and i was like oh i have you know the pasta it'd been a couple it'd been like five or six days and so the noodles were the pasta was all like dry and i was like i'll just put this shit down the garbage disposal no problem. I start dumping it into the gar garbage disposal. It's like revving, whatever. This thing clogs and it fills with water, like, I don't know, four inches deep. And I'm standing there looking at it and I'm like, okay, I probably shouldn't have ground up all that pasta and put it directly into my pipes because it just formed a wet paste. And now I have a clog. And I was like, what the hell am I supposed to do? I'm just, I just know monkeys. What do I do here? Um, and so I, I found that, um, <laughs> I found that learning how to unclog your sink is actually a very valuable skill. So just learn how to do it. You just go out and learn how to do yeah. it because I had to figure it out uh, with a stinky, gross, clogged sink, uh, making my house smell bad. So learn it before it happens to you. <laughs> it's, take precautions, kid. Noodles take can affect anybody. <laughs> Listen closely, it, children. It can, it can and will come for you. And it is worse than you think, because as you all know, when the sink fills up, something's got to go in there and unclog it. And so then I had to take my hand, stick it in the gross pasta, butter, garlic, salt, old water and fish around until I could bore a hole. It was it was absolutely um, awful. It was a bad day. And then I was like, 
do I want to make pasta ever again? I don't know because the consequences are simply too great to, to take the risk for being so, for being so goofy, for being so dumb. So, um, you know, right. the, your, your lesson that you can take away from today is, uh, trans rights don't clog your <laughs> sink. <laughs> and I'm sure there will be more that we will learn as we continue on our journey. <laughs> The secretary will be taking notes and we will recap the major lessons of the day. Everybody in the audience, write this down. We will come back to it as we persist throughout the calls. These, these are the things you take away uh, and you're set. Like the rest of your life is good. Just those two things. Don't forget it. Take As for said, take notes. There will be a test at the end of the stream. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Join our Patreon for this kind of assetry. Support support trans uh, pasta uh, protection content by joining us on Patreon uh, and tuning in to other great shows like uh, the Transatlantic Call-In Show, where real people have significantly more intelligent conversations than what you've just heard. <laughs> and uh, I think that we got the the. Have a, we have we have two settings on this show. It's like overly gratuitous explanations of phenomena in biology and concerning evolutionary biology and other things uh and just straight up the dvd screensaver boinking around <laughs> hoping that it'll hit a corner and make one singular thought and that's what we do here on skep talk hosted by erica and forrest and arden so like comment and subscribe <laughs> you're just still eating as you say <laughs> This is the best show we've ever done. We've got lines full, uh, all full of atheists. So we're going to try to get through some atheist calls so we can open the lines back up for theist calls. We want to hear your arguments for why uh, Jeebus be a thing that we should care about and why uh, the, 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 the evolutions aren't real. Um, so call in and tell us about those things. But next, um, we're going to talk about uh let's go for uh amen Ra. uh pronouns he him calling from washington dc let's talk about indoctrination and racism uh as fueling rejection of uh, religion evolution and science amen Ra, the god of the sun welcome to skept talk how are you hello my uh fellow damn dirty apes Hey, <laughs> how are you guys doing? Oh, uh, good. I guess, I guess, I guess, since we're all atheists, we're damned dirty, great apes. I think that would be mm. more accurate, right? Mm -hmm. That's pretty tight. Yeah, <laughs> um, like that. So, yeah, a lot of times I I encounter like um, apologists and theists, and oftentimes I have a hard time talking to them about evolution and sometimes i encounter people who are very like racist about it because they don't want to accept the out of africa model like they just yep. they just can't seem to grasp that model and um uh, a lot of times they'll 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 say things you know of course their information is inaccurate but they'll say things like uh, humans evolved, Homo sapiens evolved in um, in Europe or Eurasia, anywhere but Africa. And sometimes they'll they'll say things like, um, you know, they believe in the um, uh, poly regional theory, multi regional mm -hmm. theory, yep. or hypothesis. So, so what do you guys uh, think I've about loved. that? Or what do you have to say about that? Race realists generally do love that multi-regional hypothesis. Um, the idea that, like, for it, it, it gets twisted and, and bent up out of shape as well. It's not actually what the actual hypothesis says. But generally speaking, when race realists bring it up, they say that, like, Denisovans colonized East Asia and Homo heidelbergensis went west into Asia and Homo erectus went into kind of like northern Eurasia. And as Homo sapiens or our an the ancestor of Homo sapiens bred with them, that's what produced the different races we see today. Never mind the fact that, you know, that's not all the options of what we call races. And also races have changed significantly over the past couple hundred years. And like, if you had asked somebody in the early 1900s, 
Judaism was a completely different race and Irish was a completely different race, but whatever, you know, just as we understand races today, all as a result of this, and uh, then you throw Cheddar Man at them. Cheddar Man was a, uh, an ancient Homo sapiens who lived in, in England, um, and he would have had dark brown, uh, black skin, and blue eyes. And then they uh, start making noises that sound a lot like science is influenced by politics, and, and, and then they go away. Uh, overall, uh, racists re- are necessarily scientifically ignorant. Um, because if you understand what race is and where it comes from, where racial characteristics come from, you understand that they are all caused by evolution within the population of Homo sapiens. Um, there is no such actual real thing as 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 a, a race, biologically speaking. There's no subspecies of Homo sapiens for black, white, Asian, whatever. Um, and uh, one thing that's really like easy to point to that is like there was an experiment done i think it was at stanford a little while ago where they put like the human genome sequences um i believe it was or it was that or phenotypes i don't remember they put a bunch of human characteristics into a computer and they asked the computer to categorize things based on 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 these and like try to make some races and after like four it was kind of similar to what we had going on and then once you got past that it was like okay so this is the race that comes from europe and this is the race that comes from Africa, and this is the race that comes from Asia. And then there's like this tiny little pocket in the middle of Polynesia, and that's a race too, because they're just different enough to count. And then another one is like, okay, Argentina is a different race than the rest of South America. And it's like, and like very quickly it became clear that like the computer was finding different arbitrary bullshit lines than we had found. Um, and and it just very clearly became completely nonsense so like if anybody wants i know it's not a good stream until we both recommend books you recommended one a minute ago i know i've recommended this one before but i'm going to do it again because it's one of my favorites race why are we so different uh second edition is one i've got by the american anthropological association um you can get this on amazon as dope and it explains the history of race as a concept um why the concept was invented to justify owning humans as farming equipment um and then also the actual biological underpinnings of what we call race that isn't a real thing. Um, I hope that helps answer your question directly. <clears throat> so I've, I've got a, a handful of things to kind of expound upon as well. Um, Chris is absolutely yeah. right, right? Like the, the, the enemy of racism and race realism is, is very simply, and as much as I love to prop up the, the fossil record, it's genetics. Genetics absolutely puts race realism over a barrel full stop. There is no way in this day and age to argue for multi-regionalism unless you're arguing for a very modern version of multi-regionalism that involves like homo sapiens evolving in Africa, right around modern day Addis Ababa actually, and then expanding outward in each of those groups, uh, adapting to their local areas, but they're already homo sapiens, right? Uh, and, and that version of, of multi-regionalism isn't really multi-regionalism anymore, is it? Uh, the best support is, is looking at a, a handful of characteristics, right? You can look at the differences between genetic diversity, right? So the genetic diversity that we find within Africa, specifically sub-Saharan Africa, is greater than the genetic diversity that you find in everywhere else combined, right? And the reason is because of the founder effect. Every time you have a population that splits off and founds a new area, their genetically, their genetic diversity, excuse me, is going to be lower than the parent population. So this is the reason this is the case that genetic diversity is higher in Africa than elsewhere is because populations kept bobbing off from Africa and heading up through the Levant and spreading out elsewhere into the rest of the world. This is confirmed as well by phylogeny. Everybody nests within, I believe it's the L0 group that you find in sub-Saharan Africa. That's where mitochondrial Eve comes from. And then you also have a uh, homozygosity, relative levels of homozygosity. It's, it's greater outside of Africa as compared to inside of Africa. You can look at linkage disequilibrium and this, that, and the other thing. Everything within genetics supports an African origin for homo sapiens, the species. Now, once homo sapiens leaves Africa, some 60-ish million, or thousand years ago, excuse me, not million years ago, thousand years ago, um, and spreads elsewhere, there's going to be some interbreeding going on with uh, hominin populations that have already established themselves in other places like Neanderthals in Europe or Denisovans out east in Asia, or perhaps even late surviving Homo erectus in some areas. Uh, and, and that's all fine and good, but none of that has anything to do with how the species itself actually originated, which all the genetic support lands us 
smack dab in, in East Africa, to be specific. And you know, might think, okay, well, that's all fine and dandy, uh, but is there anything to corroborate it? And the answer is yes, it's our old friend, the fossil record, because the oldest Homo sapiens that is anatomically clockable as Homo sapiens is the Jebel Irhud uh, Homo sapiens skulls, and they are found in Morocco, it's Africa, right smack dab there in the, the general region of, of, of North and Northeast Africa. So everything we look at has us landing there. And, and my response to race realists is, oh, okay, like you wanna, you wanna vie for the multiracialism idea? Cool, prove it to me. How do you explain genetic diversity being higher in Africa than everywhere else? How do you explain the differences in homo versus heterozygosity? How do you explain the linkage disequilibrium or the nesting phylogenetically of other populations into an L0 group in sub-Saharan Africa? What's your explanation for that? How do you get a European origin from that or an Asian origin or anywhere else other than Africa? Because they love to do that. Uh, and in fact, they've been doing that for so long that that's initially why the Piltdown hoax man managed to last as long as it did because Piltdown was artificially found in the UK. And people were so, especially Arthur Keith, everybody was like, that makes sense because we are white. It makes sense that the old mm -hmm. guy who we came from was also a white guy who was hanging out in Europe. And it's yep. like, um, no. And the guy who, who blew all of that to, to Hell in a Handbasket was Raymond Dart, who found the Tong child in South Africa, that's where it was, baby. Um, and all of this makes perfect sense with the rest of the fossil record, the expansion and then retraction of the Miocene apes, the, the perfect climate that would have been available for us in Africa. And when you get right down to it, the differences between humans, as I've said before, like humans are ridiculously, ridiculously similar to one another. We are so similar, genetically speaking, that it's actually kind of a problem for us genetic diversity wise. Any, like the two most disparate humans, on the planet that you could possibly find are still more similar than two random chimpanzees that you could pluck from anywhere on the planet. That's how closely related all of us are, genomically speaking, even taking structural variants into account. There is no getting around this. I hate race realists so much because they come and they try to pretend like they're like, all, oh, I'm like a big natural selection Darwin fan. And also I'm a race realist. It's like, no, not only are you wrong, but Darwin also disagreed with you because he was one of the first guys to be like, nope, humans originated in Africa. And also we all came from a common ancestor. So checkmate race realist losers because you don't have anything to support you anymore <laughs> and that's my it's a it's, hundred cents worth <laughs> one dollar worth i love it. it it's so important thank you for bringing that up because you're right on like the, the two main things that I'm, I'm so happy you brought it is that there is more diversity between within races than there is between them that's such a thing for people like have to fucking wrap their brains around and also goddamn piltdown man I, I talked about that in like a couple of my reactoria videos where it's like these fucking dudes seriously thought like, hey, no, okay, yeah, understand. Human evolution was African ape, African ape, African ape, white British person, and then humans. What? And like you get that a lot when you see like those those Zalinger projections of like the monkey leveling up into a human and like they slowly get whiter as well. And it's like there's no fucking reason to put that in there. There's no, like, if you're talking about, like, Denisovans or, like, Northern Homo erectus, something like that, maybe you can say, yeah, and they probably had lighter skin. That's fine. I'm super cool with that. But, like, when they always say, like, here's all these ancient eight uh, 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 reconstructions, and they're all dark-skinned, and then humans, and they look like me. And it's like, why? Why'd you do it that way? Why'd you make that the structure? It, do you not see the problem? It's, oh, it's so frustrating to me. I'm so happy you brought those things up. Uh, Sun God Amun-Ra, uh, have we answered your question or did you have something else that you wanted to throw out there? Uh, yeah, one of the weird stories that I've heard was that uh, Heidelbergensis or Homo or Gaster or something, that they went into Europe and that's when uh, humans uh, homo sapiens and neanderthals split and then the homo sapiens went back into africa so so they still follow the out of africa model after that but they right. had to still somehow you know uh jujitsu uh homo sapiens to evolve in europe so that's that's one of the crazier yeah. stories that i've heard recently so I mean, homer or gaster just you know you go you go you go for us 
I was I was just gonna clear up the details of the of the thing. Uh, Homo ergaster is like the label we slap on Homo erectus that didn't leave Africa. So like Homo erectus evolves in Africa 1.8 million years ago, immediately fucks off. The ones that stay behind oftentimes get the name Homo ergaster, and this is because Homo erectus is a super diverse species. Just in D uh, Demonisi, which is one of the first places we find them outside of Africa. Um, there's like so many different kinds of Homo erectus there. You could make five different species. And so like what people often will say, Homo ergaster sensu latu in the loose sense or Homo ergaster, or, uh, sorry, Homo erectus sensu latu or Homo erectus sensu strictu in the strict sense. And when they say Homo erectus sensu strictu, they're solely talking about this group that left Africa and like, and then you have to just delineate between that and Homo ergaster, which are the African ones and, and, uh, uh, Floresiensis turns out wasn't Homo erectus. It, it was a different thing they found. Am I right? I, I think I'm missing that up with something else. Or did? Or is that still up in the air? It's kind of no, dude. It, no, it's still up in the air. I mean, Tochiri, Tochiri yeah. has been on record as being like it's early hab or it's it's uh, late habilis that leaves. But you know, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, I like just, the idea. It makes sense. We'll see. We'll see. It's it's fucking cool. Uh, so ju yeah. just for for. Simplicity's sake, at this point, when I was uh, uh, but a wee young lad, uh, the 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 understanding was that Homo erectus went down into Indonesia and then became Homo floresiensis, and that's a different species. And then there's a different species here, and uh, Pekinensis, the ones in China, are totally different. And so, like when we talk about that, when they talk about Homo ergaster, generally speaking, race realists will say Homo ergaster are where black people come from because they're these ones that stayed in Africa. Um, as far as Heidelbergensis is concerned, that's another one that's a little bit up in the air because I've I, I, like the way I've it's either either Homo Heidelbergensis was a totally different guy that was contemporaneous with Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, and or maybe Homo, er, Homo Heidelbergensis is the common ancestor of both Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, and it's like the fount from but like we find them over here in Germany. And we're not sure why, and they're different enough to call a different species, but maybe they're not a different species. Maybe they're actually just more weird shit Neanderthals. So, like, it's kind of, it's one of those things where, like, the problem is, and I know it's going to be some creationist on the line banging their head against the wall for this, call in, um, is, like, that we just have too many goddamn fossils. And just like in human populations today, there's a lot of variety. And when we're looking at fossil records, we tend to use patterns in geomorphometrics, the, the shape and size and style of things along with where they're discovered to establish species. And when you're looking at variation of human fossils, especially over the last couple hundred thousand years, there's a fuckload of variation in a fuckload of distribution. And so we're like, is this 50 species or is it one very diverse one species? Because if you tried, if all humans died today and you tried to identify us just based on like skeletal markers and location on the world, you would probably pick like several different species out of humanity today, even though we're very clearly one of them. So the fossil species concept is tricky. It's, you can look at like Styracosaurus a little while ago and we thought there were like 50 of them and it turns out it's actually just one in several stages of their lives. Um, and so like, yeah, it, it's kind of tricky and race realists remain dumb because they don't understand the nuance in biology, especially in it's, paleoanthropology. It's, it's like the nuance is a problem for them, but it's not even that. Like they don't even get the basic concepts. Like there's nothing in genetics that supports anything other than an African origin. And there's nothing in the fossil record that supports anything other than an African origin. And when I get race realists on my channel, right? Like what I ask is like, okay, how do you deal with these things? Like, what is your response to them? And they answer much as you, which as you said, uh, Amon Ra, which is basically they're like, well, what if this insert just so story that creates a European origin or anything but an African origin, right? That is like hidden amongst the weeds and impossible to parse from what the data says. And to me, I hear that and I go, you sound like a creationist, right? That's that's just a, a, a young earth creationist trope. Maybe it happened the way I say that it happened and it just looks the way that you say it happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and at that point, you can just kind of shrug your shoulders and go, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, I, it is what it is. Like, you can yeah. either deal with the data itself or you can uh, go find someone else to, to waste their time, you know? Maybe the devil put the fossils in the ground to trick you. You can't say that isn't what happened. Right. You can't Teach prove the it. Controversy. Teach the controversy. Teach the controversy, right. <laughs> Fuck, man. Um, yeah, so, sometimes, uh, 
you know, I'll show them videos from like Spencer Wells, the project that he did years ago, or um, something from Aaron Ra, or even even um, Guts uh, Gutsick. Some of your videos, like they'll say that well, back when human early humans existed, Pan we were all in one continent, Pangaea. So there was no real Europe or Africa. Anything, mm -hmm. anything to get out no. of Africa, they'll come up with. And then I'll, I'll show them one no. of uh, one of Erica's videos on the heat problem, and you uh. know they say, "Well, I don't, I don't. There's no problem with the Noah's flood. It's it's an actual historical fact because it happened Man. everywhere, and everybody has a this, flood myth." Dude, the second uh -huh. this first of all, Pangea, you're off by not you. The people you're talking about are off by like a hundred years. So, yeah, yeah. Like they're, they're off a little <laughs> Huge bit. amount of time. But second of all, like um, with with regard to the heat problem stuff, because I I love so much more than anything popularizing the heat problem because it's such a knockdown drag out argument. Um, it doesn't matter if every place has a flood myth because every place also has a shapeshifter trickster god myth and a dragon myth and an elemental myth and a genie myth. And like humans Good are point. humans and we tell we tell similar stories and so this is like perfectly natural. Like some of us can, can be original. You can find some places that uh, have myths that show up nowhere else or stories that show up nowhere else or folklore or whatever. But we also share a lot. And I think it's really, really interesting that flood myths are so pervasive because people tend to settle near water, don't they? Um, yeah. That's, it's a classic move because boy, if we don't have water, uh, we die. So we settle near water and then we have these grand tales about what happens when it rains too much and then the water that we're living by eats our house. And then we write it down and we talk about how cool it was that we survived it. You know, similarly, we're sitting around the campfire, we hear something spooky in the woods and we talk about how it was a big, scary shapeshifter god that actually tricked us. And, and that's why we didn't come back with any meat this time and, and hope that that gets us out of trouble. Um, you know, we're, we're a creative bunch and we're pattern seekers, but the, the pervasiveness of flood myths is very, very bad as an argument because of the pervasiveness of many kinds of myths. And the heat problem still destroys mm -hmm. young earth creationism unless they have a solution that isn't miraculous for the equivalent of 93,000 hydrogen bombs worth of heat energy per square kilometer on the surface of the earth over the year of Noah's flood, which they don't. And I know because Answers in Genesis just released an article about how they don't have a solution to this problem last week. So I rest my case. <laughs> right. I, you, you know, I think overall, the fact that it's, it's the racism is so woven into the religion that it's just hard for people to wrap their heads around it because they feel like once you start talking about evolution or that, you know, hum, humans, humanity um, originated in Africa, they they feel personally attacked by it because they've been spoon fed for I don't know how long the idea that Adam and Eve you know were in the Garden of Eden in Mesopotamia and they were like two blonde people holding hands you know amongst all the dinosaurs mm -hmm. so <laughs> it's 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 hard for them to 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 get out of that sort of uh, indoctrination I guess yeah and it generally speaking it all falls down to like an ad hominem attack as well it's like evolution is racist because blah 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 and like actually no it goes against that and then i usually get confronted with well darwin was racist darwin believed right. all these other things and therefore it's always like first of all you're wrong and also that's not how thinking works like it's it, if, if you're saying you know pick, pick your favorite if, if, if you say ted cruz is a sniveling coward and a racist or, or because he's racist that's no you, you say he's a sniveling coward and he's also you know something like that you know, put a bigger thing that's i'm not saying that you're wrong because you're stupid i'm saying you're wrong and you're stupid you know what i mean uh like it's, it's there's a whole bunch there man but anyway we got a few other calls in the line we're gonna jump in uh to them but uh oh. please do call back any other time if you have any other things you want to talk about Thank you so much. You guys have such a great passion for science. We need more young people like that in the world. And and please continue to advocate for science. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Only, we'll do our best. Only wild horses can stop Forrest and I from talking people's ear off on topics that they probably don't care about. And then we'll just teach the wild horses some things. <laughs> um, lines are still open, and we still have... Uh, 
no theists this time. It's it's interesting when I started on uh, the line network, um, like we we had an abundance, and I know Jimmy Snow gets an abundance, and I know that that you know Matt gets an abundance, um, and I wonder if it's because they've made such a name for themselves as like that being their brand is arguing against those kinds of people. Um, we seem to have made it our brand to argue against creationists, and yet. Where are they? <laughs> What's going on? I think here's, here's, it's because we do... S huh? You. You go. I, I was just going to uh, continue to wave my dick around and say that I think it's because we do such an incredibly good job at what we do, and, and, and they don't want to you know, catch this heat, this fire. They don't want to contest with this pile of pasty flesh coming at them <laughs> with all sorts of cool knowledge about science. You know what I mean? They don't want to deal with that. We, we beat our chests and bear our canines and tell them about the advent of bipedalism and the potential pressures that may have led <laughs> to it. I mean, but no, I mean, I, I, I feel the same way, right? Like creationists are, are ready to talk a big game and they're ready to talk smack and complain about how no one will publish our articles in their journals. So we had to make our own answers research journal and, and you know, talk about safe spaces, right? Uh, but then they never come on and they never make their case. Mm -hmm. Right. It's they don't they're not brave enough to come and actually present yeah. their case live. And I'm sure you've experienced the same thing. Oh, I've offered people. I get creationists email me all the time and they're like, I think yeah. you're wrong about X, Y, Z. But I'm like, look, I could spend hours of my time writing up a, this response for the hundredth time. I get the hundredth person telling me Lucy was a knuckle walking chimp and I could sit down and spend hours writing up a, a response to that. Or you could just come on my channel and we could talk about it yeah. person to person, yeah. ape to ape and really hash it out. Uh, and the number of times that that has come to fruition is zero <laughs> because they always bail. It's, it's yeah, it sucks, man. I've got one dude on my, you know, on Twitter right now is, is still trying to tag me and everything to argue with me about uh, uh, gender. I've got a guy who's on uh, my TikToks right now saying that like all these other scientific theories are right, but evolution makes no sense. And someday in the next couple hundred years, people will understand that he was right all the time. And like, I, it, I've got, I told you about that, that dude, I've got a dude who gets in long fucking conversations about fucking like, now sex had to evolve over and over in every single species the fact that there's male and female bears proves that they had to evolve at the same it's, it's craziness and like i just i get so fucking bored of talk it takes me my i'm sorry my time is valuable and i i've got to i've got a lot of shit going on and, and even if i wasn't doing this for a living my time would be too valuable. If, if I had nothing else to do, my time would be too valuable to sit there and fucking explain this to you. I have neither the time nor the crayons to break this down to your level. But if you want to come onto this show and help us educate some people, we're into it. Like, ah. So the thing is too, is like, I know you've been doing this for a while and, and I'll speak for myself here. I have been too. And I have caught mm -hmm. wise over the years because I, I, you know, I've learned like a like a gentle and modern ape. I have soaked in my surroundings and actually committed this to memory. Not everybody is a good faith actor, and some people out oh, there yeah. will just waste your time, and that sucks so hard. Because when I started the you know the channel and when I was originally on Reddit and arguing with creationists there, I was under the impression that like, and I've said this to you before, if they could just see the evidence, they would come around. Because that's what I did. Right. You know, like when when I saw the evidence, I was like, damn, OK, like, I, I guess I was wrong. Time to change my mind. You know, I, I think that's a, a yeah. good attitude to have. Yeah. And um, but no, that's not what happens. Instead, you end up commenting back and forth and back and forth for days, long, stupid gish gallops that you have to respond to. And I feel obligated, or at least at the beginning, I felt obligated to be like, well, they took the time to write the post. I guess I should take the time to, to answer it point by point. Uh, and eventually right. I realized that they had no intention of ever hearing me out. It's all about, you know, just, just saying their piece and wasting my time. And so I started kind of like screaming and being like, I'll tell you what, watch this video, this video, this video, and this video that I've made. And if you still disagree, come back to me. Radio right. silence. Or they say, I'm not watching your video. Why don't you explain it to me? And it's like, well, because as you said, Forrest, I have neither the time nor the crayons to explain it to you. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's like that's and that's what's so difficult is like and that I understand that it like 
as as I've grown in this industry, that is a, a hard pill that I've had to swallow as well. Is like not everybody is actually trying to have a conversation. I I had to look. I knew what a troll was because I grew up on the internet, but I still had this weird like thing in my head telling me like, well, if you really try, like yeah. you can help people see the way you are. You're like no, and so like that's why I much prefer like I've been doing a lot less like uh, uh, responding to comments and arguing on Twitter or on 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 TikTok or whatever like that, try to just direct people here because one of three things is going to happen. Either nothing's going to happen. They're not going to call in. Fine. That conversation's done. We're good. Or they'll call in and be an asshole and we get to educate a bunch of people by making fun of that person and, and making them look as silly as they're acting. And then people like to, you know, learn from the channel and they participate more. Or third thing, rarity, but it happens. We actually have a legitimately good conversation. And then they actually learn something and the people watching learn something and that's the best possible outcome. And it happens sometimes, but, and it's so much more productive in the, like, I used to think these call in shows were just to get the clip of somebody hanging up on somebody, but now it's like that they, they do a lot of good if you can do them right. And here at the, the, the line network, we do them wrong as fuck, but you it's entertaining and you can tune in and you can watch us snack and talk about whatever random thing we want to talk about today. My wife just I'm texted me and said this, right? My wife I'm just texted snack. me and said, this seems like a long show. I put some snacks on a rolly cart outside the door to your study. I want to go get that real quick. No, and while Forrest is getting that, I've, I have, again, I'm demonstrating my ability to learn because ever since I did the first episode of this, I started talking to my husband and making sure that we ordered food in the middle so that it wasn't 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night and I was starving to death, wasting away here on my little, oh, my little wheelie yeah. So you learn, you know, yeah, no, you, you, you fire the neurons and you, you start getting the food ready so that you can last when I was, and not dude, When I was getting up off the couch to try to make it look like I had been a productive person all day long at like 5.30, <laughs> she was like, how long are you going to be going today? I was like, it's Erica and I, it's going to be a while. And she was like, what do you want to eat? And I was like, can you send me some pineapple around seven or so? And here it is. <laughs> she sent me some pineapple. <laughs> And some chewy bars, and some a uh, uh, collection of berries, and a motherfucking carrot cake. <laughs> this is this one. is the dichotomy. This is the dichotomy of man here because Forrest is eating like delicious, healthy foods, and I've got like fried chicken and ranch and soda, and I'm I'm drinking alcohol. I'm just I'm, I'm a mess. So you know, be, be like Forrest, be mess. like me. <laughs> <laughs> What do we oh, have? What's, what's on our agenda? It's, I'm what's trying on our to, agenda? Who are we the, with? The, all the berries and everything, they're a facade. My life is in shambles and I live like a slob. Um, we've got uh, Scott calling in from Florida, pronouns he, him, wants to talk about consequences of modern global society on human evolution. We touched on this a minute ago. I bet we can go deeper, though. Scott, you're on the line. How are you doing? Hey, I am fantastic, guys. It's great to talk to both of you. I, this is a, It's the perfect duo. Well, thank you. You don't know what you've done. You fool. You've called into a, a you've yeah. called into the wrong duo. You'll be here for hours. <laughs> Prepare to be yeah, silified. Exactly. What's yeah. going on, Sean? Yeah. Scott, what do you think? Um, yeah, so I uh, there's kind of two parts to this, the modern and global. Um, and obviously they're pretty intertwined. Um but, um, for example, for, for the modern side of things, and, and this is in regards to fitness, right? I, I think of things like nut allergies or, or anything similar, right? Where it's pretty objectively not a great thing for fitness that, you know, if you eat a certain food, you just, you know, could instantly die. And not too long ago, that's what would have happened. Obviously, with where we are, that's not what we want. We want to help these people. But, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what what... So, so, so that's one thing is, does that just keep passing down and passing down and eventually we'll all be allergic? You, you know what I mean? So, so that's, maybe let's tackle that first and then we could do the other half. Yeah. So like one thing to remember is that like, it's not just it, when you're talking about population genetics, 
it's not just as simple as this gene spreads throughout the population. Therefore, the population has it. Um, the gene has to become like fixed within the population as well. Um, and that takes a significant amount of effort and pressure. There's some math that you can do to like predict it. Uh, if you're really good at genetics, I am not. Um, but like it's it's I, I can tell you in in layman's terms because that's where I'm at with it because I uh, I'm a, a organismic biologist guy. I'm not a cell molecular guy. Um, that uh, uh, you know when we if we were to protect people with like say a peanut allergy or, or whatever like that. Um, number one, there's a lot more to having that allergy than just a gene. But even if it was just a purely genetic thing, um, even allowing that to proliferate throughout society isn't putting us at risk of having everyone guaranteed to have that or even like have a good like a uh, 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 um how do you say a good uh chance of having that um because there still isn't an, a selection pressure for it so it's gonna just kind of like go the way of 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 genetic drift it's just gonna kind of be there and it might get phased out anyway even without us trying to you know eradicate it through from fucked up eugenics um it just it, it takes a lot to fix a gene into a population. Um, in terms of other things, that's one of the cool things about like, you know, what we talked a minute ago about modern medicine, how it's have, affecting some trends in human evolution, things like getting taller and getting bigger heads. Um, yeah, we'll see more stuff like that. Uh, but overall, those are net positives because we still get the best part of humanity, in my opinion, is our brains. Um, and so by protecting people with whatever disability, whatever allergy, whatever that would have effectively killed them in the wild, we are gaining their minds, um, which is worth that trade-off if that was something that we were worried about. You know what I mean? Um, and and even to the point where if we have to eradicate the peanut plant to protect human civilization, but we can go to the fucking moon and live there and you know, they radical. You know what I mean? I might. I think I understood yeah. your question. I hope I'm speaking to it. I, you were cutting out a little bit, but I'm pretty sure that's what you're getting at, right? Yeah, yeah, no, that that covers definitely that side of it. Um, the, the other half is then the, um, the the global society part of it, right? Um, and this is um, so. So, you, okay, when when you guys had that call a few weeks ago, um, the the eugenics conversation came up, and you know you mentioned the, okay, there's the things we all know about melanin, Europeans being able to digest you know, milk, lactose, um, or, you know, uh, North Asians having ears and noses, you know, close to their heads so that they don't freeze off and long thin bodies in Africa to wick heat, things like that. How, uh, what would we expect to see as these groups are mixing more and more? Is everyone going to be dark skinned with the ability to uh, you know, digest lactose. I mean, it, does everything come together? Do these groups, uh, what, what would we expect to see? Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting question, right? Like, if I had to guess, like, what's actually going to happen, um, either human technology is going to get to the point where we can do gene therapy and things like that to effectively alleviate things like allergies or whatever, and you can live wherever you want, and you can be perfectly happy living there. Or alternatively, we're going to go extinct. That's another potential option. And option three is that some cataclysm happens that ends up isolating people from one another and, and preventing them from blending, in which case natural selection will again select for what is ideal within that environment. And people living in equatorial regions will have the darker skin and people living in northerly regions where there's not so much UV radiation will have lighter skin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the blending might happen, but again, like, I feel like if you want, if you were going to have like a, a singular sort of morpholo morphology, excuse me, or, or morphotype for humanity in general, it would have to happen, it would have to happen like in a, over a long enough period for generations to, to kind of stabilize out that morphology for everybody before technology caught up to the point where people were traveling to even more places like interplanetary or things like that which would again throw a monkey wrench into things because people would start adapting to new environments. Um, part of the problem is just that there's so many people and like when you have this many organisms with a lifespan like we have, which is indeed very long and you incorporate things like medicine and sexual preference and um, all sorts of things like that, it, it becomes very difficult to sort of homogenize the population. 
Um, so like Forrest said, I don't know. It could happen. My guess would be either we're going to, technology is going to outpace it and we're going to sort of um, fine tune people to, to where they live and, and, you know, while they're alive, like without including eugenics or anything like that, like using gene therapy and things like that. Uh, eliminate certain kinds of like negative quality of life things, uh, or we're going to go extinct. <laughs> that that would be my guess. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those things where like you you could theoretically completely make like a, a totally homogenous, like a racially homogenous uh, population with all of these traits. But it could happen, um, but it would take a long time of like really, really coordinated and dedicated effort to do so. Like you would have to have more globalization than we have now where like actually there's equal opportunity for any person from any part of the planet to go to any other part of the planet and meet any other person from any other part of the planet and 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 produce offspring with those people and we're all deliberately doing that all the time for like several hundred generations or like just i, I don't think it's reasonable to expect that precisely um and and I think Eric hit the nail on the head with like the fact that there's a million confounding factors, travel and technology and and cultural preferences among them um, that are going to fuck that up. So like, we would probably still to expect to see a lot of of like a uh, um uh, uh you know uh heterogeneity. That's the word I was like I could not come up with that word for a second. Uh, a lot of, of of variation um and a lot of like you know isolated pockets of different types of traits we, we would still expect to see it for a long time um unless we were trying very hard to hit like an a harvey weinberg equilibrium type situation mm -hmm. where we have like truly random interbreeding with like everybody connected to everybody <laughs> for a long time it would be tough to get there but yeah no they're definitely blending and that's pretty tight <laughs> Was it not uh, Snow the Product who once said, uh, everybody should have mixed babies, black, white, brown, Asian, let's get racy. <laughs> Mix it up a little in the name of future blurred color lines to define what's inside everybody's skin's praline. What a good song. Sage words. Sage words. Yeah, excellent. Absolutely excellent. <laughs> Uh, anyway, thank you so much for calling in, Scott. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks, thanks, guys. It was great to talk to you. Good to talk to you, Take too. care. Bye-bye. On average, we've taken about one call every 30 minutes. That's not bad. And y'all, we we're still on. got lines open. We're on fire. Uh, we still this got is, lines open. A, um, this is the fastest sorry. we've ever gotten through calls. This is the fastest we've ever gotten through calls. I'm beginning to think the problem is actually Jimmy. That's why we take so long. Yes, it's it's, 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 it's definitely it's, all as, Jimmy. Jimmy is the problem. <laughs> as like everything, it is all his fault. Um, so I tell you what, then let's 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 think about this. We've got three callers left right now. Um, however, the lines are still open. Um, and all three callers are atheists, and all the callers we've had are atheists, and we're we're just talking science, which I have no problem with. Um, but as it stands at this moment, we only have three other atheist callers left to talk about other cool things in science. Um, we can get through those three, and then we'll move right on the super chats. We'll end the show doing what we usually do. However, lines are still open, and if there's a theist out there or a creationist, or a race realist, or a gender critical person, or a capitalist to fuck, man, anything. Like, if, if there's anybody out there that wants to have a serious conversation uh, like you normally would on this channel, uh, then please give us a call. Uh, the number is somewhere, um, and, and, and we'll, we're here for you. And you get priority. You'll get on first. So uh, you don't have to wait for us to get through the other calls. If we see one pop up, we'll take it immediately. Um, but here I am I just so much. We want to fight with you guys. So call in we, and let's I'm, argue. <laughs> just kidding. Exactly. Uh, so call I'm, in, let's have a conversation. I'm, I'm, we're on our hands and knees begging. Please, creationists, call in. Like you guys are all so yeah. you guys are all so talkative on Twitter and in my comments section. I just want to chat with you for real. For real this time. Call in. Right. Come on. Let's talk. But with that, we'll move on to the next three calls, and and that'll give us the time that we need, hopefully, 
Uh, if, if, if I can, I would love to hear from, from Wesley. Um, we've got, uh, I believe we talked to this person before once, a uh, rogue show from South Carolina wants to talk about queen butterflies rogue show. I don't know if I can answer this question, but we're here for you. You're on the line. How are you today? Um, man, let me tell you, uh, I spent, I made like 10,000 attempts to beat this race on a video game. Hmm. But hey, hey, uh, I was on, I was on, I was on the line and it got me, the conversation got me through it. <laughs> <laughs> what we're here for. Um, what's, what's the question about Queen Butterflies? So, these, I guess these beautiful, Queen Butterflies are some beautiful bitches that, um, People on the evolution side don't talk about that often. Uh, thing. I guess my question. I mean, sorry. Uh, so, uh, before back then, I'm back then. Birds were e eating the. For eating them like I would with spaghetti, um, but so, but they, however, they couldn't eat. <laughs> most of them couldn't. Most of the birds couldn't eat the monarchs because they were poisonous. So mm -hmm. the queen, so the queen butterflies, some uh, asked the monarchs, "Where'd you get, where'd you get that uh, style?" And they eventually, as I understand it, they eventually became the imposter among us. And I just, I'm just a uh, little, I'm just amazed. I just don't know how they're able mm -hmm. to, they're able to mimic our, mimic the monarchs. Yeah. So this is an example of what we call Batesian mimicry. So when, so you're right, monarch butterflies are poisonous. Um, and they do this because they get this way because um, monarch butterflies lay their eggs on milkweed plants. And so when the caterpillars emerge, they eat these milkweeds. Milkweed plants are packed with these chemicals called cardiac glycosides. And what those do when you ingest them is they cause arrhythmia in your heart. They make your heart beat super fast. Um, and they're so good at this that we actually harvest them to make medicines, to make heart medicines. Uh, I think like uh, beta blockers, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, hmm. And so these caterpillars are eating these plants that are toxic to everything else. They have this, this niche that they live in that nobody else can eat these plants but them. And then when they morph, metamorphize into body, uh, butterflies, they maintain these cardiac glycosides in their bodies. So if a bird eats them, it's going to cause heart palpitations. They usually puke. They get really sick. Um, so these butterflies are brightly colored to let everybody know, Hey, I'm toxic. When an animal is brightly colored to show that it's poisonous or dangerous, we call that aposmatism. When a non aposmatic species, so a non dangerous poisonous thing imitates an aposmatic species by taking on bright coloration to make itself look poisonous, like, uh, corn, uh, uh the king snakes that look like coral snakes or like, uh, blue tongue st mm -hmm. uh, skinks in Australia or something like this. We call that Batesian mimicry. Um, and this is what we see in a lot of butterfly species, like you know, queen butterflies and things that, that uh, look like monarchs. Um, although sometimes there's also Mullerian mimicry. And Mullerian mimicry is what happens in like viceroy butterflies. Viceroy butterflies look a lot like monarchs. We thought that was a Batesian mimic. Turns out viceroy butterflies are also poisonous for totally different but similar reasons. Um, and so hmm. they are an, another aposmatic species imitating another aposmatic species. They're just finding a similar uh, uh, pattern that, that works really well. So that's called malaria mimicry. And all of these are in a category of, of, of not quite camouflage that we call self mimicry. They're looking like something in order to have an effect on the predators around them. Um, and those are two of my favorite kinds uh, of mimicry. So um, if it's a, a bright orange and black and white speckled butterfly that isn't poisonous, that would be a Batesian mimic. Um, if they are poisonous, that would be a Mullerian mimic. Um, and that's the whole gimmick there. That's that's just a really cool thing that can happen in evolution. I see. Yeah, man. Uh, so does it as far I know you're not I know 
I know you're a layman as far as genetics goes, but does it really boil down to alleles on, when yeah. it comes to I, them, if you look at like to, if, if you look at like for example people who breed ball pythons, um, like they've got mm -hmm. pythons like fucking smiley faces on them. Like the, 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 the colors and the patterns in which those colors arise all come down to just like Mendel's laws. And so like when you have something like coloration or like even something as far down as like the snake's head caterpillars that, that look like a fucking yeah. snake in the tree, something really complicated like that. Um, yeah, it all comes down to, and it sounds crazy. It sounds like a, a, a just this wild blind process that's producing complexity, but really if you have something a that looks a tale. little bit more this way, yeah, yeah. If you have something that looks a little bit more shocking, a little bit more striking, then that's what's going to ward off a predator. And then you have a population that's a little bit more shocking, and the most shocking among them will ward off predators. And then you have a population that is more shocking, and then the most shocking among them, and so on and so on. And you can see this even in the opposite direction. Um, things like orchid flowers that have a big uh, 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 anther that looks like a female wasp. So male wasps will come over and try to fuck the flower and in doing so pollinate it. <laughs> um, and like, it just, if it has the right stripes, then a wasp will be confused and turned on and go fuck the flower. And if it has the wrong stripes, no wasp will reproduce with it. And it's not going to have, it's not going to pollinate itself. So just like the right colors and the right patterns. Yeah. It all comes down to alleles. You might you might uh, think too, not, like in an interesting turn of events, right? Like, why don't all arthropods like let's take a look? You can consider the um, the lepidopterans rather the I guess they are arthropods too, but consider like the the monarchs, gosh, right? Now I wonder I'm, how uh, mosquitoes jerk off. Yeah, they really. Well, you might wonder, like, okay, well, why doesn't everything take on the, the form of the monarch, right? Like, why doesn't everything enjoy that benefit? But as Forrest kind of alluded to there, if everything looks that way, it ceases to be shocking, doesn't it? And it loses its its sort of convincing power. And so you end up with this sort of ebb and flow of how organisms appear in their given environment, at least if it's for the purposes of, like, warding things off with bright colors or things of that nature. Yeah, and and it also yeah. like it's important to remember that like things like bright pigmentation and whatnot, it's expensive, and so there's this whole thing it's the the expensive tissue hypothesis, which leans on the idea that like it, it, to to produce certain coloration, certain patterns, certain tissues, certain organs, whatever, it costs energy and it puts you at risk, and so it better give you a benefit that's more valuable than the risk or the energy you're putting into it. Um, two examples of that. Peacocks, male peacocks, those big, bright, beautiful tail feathers certainly aren't going yeah. to help them escape a predator, and it takes a ton of energy to produce them. And so they're providing yeah. the benefit of giving them reproductive success. Um, similarly, looking mm -hmm. at humans, we have a relatively short and, and reduced gut compared to other primates, especially compared to other mammals at large, uh, other omnivorous mammals at least. Um, carnivores tend to have a really, really simple uh, digestive tract, but herbivores and omnivores and have a more and more complex one well ours is pretty reduced why one this has the, the expensive uh, the expensive tissue hypothesis points to this saying that like the energy that would have gone to developing a more complex gut instead went to developing a brain because the that takes a lot of energy to do and we don't have the energy for both and so we pick this one because this one's yeah. giving us a better selection pressure or giving us a better advantage than this one um so yeah, mm -hmm. not only would it be, it's like the syndrome, if everybody's super, nobody's super. If everybody's brightly colored, it doesn't matter if you're toxic or not, nobody would know. And also, the species yeah. that aren't toxic and are brightly colored and aren't being, are, are still being eaten at the same rate are now wasting energy on those pigments that cost a lot of energy to produce. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I guess I'll, um, I guess before I take my leave, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, jeez, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of tired. You're okay. I, I was sweaty game, I was sweaty gaming. Uh, okay. Time. I'll. 
I shall now commence in plugging your channels in really dumb ways. Uh, if you want to see the nicest biology teacher who also can't raise his eyes less than two millimeters, uh, go check out Forrest Falkai on his YouTube channel, and he has a tech talk called Renegade Science Teacher. And if you want to see the world's tallest and the world's most gut-sick given face off against um, the world's scrawniest Superman impersonator, go check out Guts at Gibbons channel. And right on. Well, thanks for the shout out, man. Thank you, Rogue Show. That's very kind. Uh, look. Oh, you take care of yourself, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate you calling in. Later. Uh, thanks Bye. for having Very kind of them. So we've got uh, a few other callers in line. We've got the two left that we, we had before. We actually got one more atheist caller that I'm going to to allow to come in anyway because uh, uh, they, they had a really important question. But as promised, we actually got a theist. And I'm going to give them precedent because we said we would. Um, we have, and it's not only is it a theist caller, but it's a theist caller who is calling about gender. And so like we get both. Um, so we've got David, <laughs> pronouns he, him, uh, is a theist who says that there are only two genders, and we're happy to talk to you, David. I promise we'll be nice until we aren't. Uh, David, you're on the line. How are you doing today? Damn right, I better get president. Uh, <laughs> what's up, man? <laughs> we did uh, promise. Uh, okay, cool. So, look, I'm not, like, I'm, I'm very accepting of things, right? But the thing is, yeah. I'm wondering the question... I, I'm wondering why, okay, so we know that, there, okay, so in my opinion, there are two genders because one mm -hmm. has a period and one doesn't, one gives birth and one can't. Now, what's the whole thing? Why are there multiple genders? Can you explain that? So, yeah, so I, I can explain it, but like, I think it would be better to just focus on what you just said, because I think that'll get us there. Um, so you said sure. uh, one gender has a period and gives birth and the other doesn't. So when right. my mom had a hysterectomy did she stop being a woman no of course not okay but she doesn't have a period and she can't give birth so what gender is she she's a female you know right but like if your criteria is giving birth and having a period are there other criteria upon which you can rely um i mean when you're when you're uh, born, aren't you assigned a gender by your genetics? No, you're assigned a gender by or a sex by your genitalia, but ambiguous right. genitalia, genitalia that can't easily be determined, are more common than like IQs over 140. They they happen all the time. So like, if an intersex person has you know super ambiguous genitalia and we can't really tell what it is. Do they not have a gender, or or what's going on with that? No, you're right. You're right. So there there are those rare cases where people do have both, or like you said, it's un uh, definable. But they get to a certain point where they either can give birth or they can't. I mean, there might be the cases where they can do both, I guess. But I mean, that would make it up there. So so you know, give give birth or you can't. What if you're born without a uterus, but you do have a vagina? Are you a boy? No, you're still a female. It's okay, but just, you can't give birth. Right. I mean, that's just a, uh, wouldn't that be a, um, what's that called? A, uh, there's a, there's a word that when the, the, the cell comes, is not, dang, what, sorry, I don't, I'm not prepared for this, but what's, there's a word for it. Uh, Mutated. It's, 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 that's like a mutation, right? A mutation. Like, just, just, just an anomaly. Right. But the yeah, thing but is, like we talked about earlier, even if it's only like 1% of the population, that's millions and millions and millions of people. So, like, right. why wouldn't you count them and, and ask them, you know, what we should address them as? Right. The, the, mm, the well, key here that exactly. I'm trying to get to is that. Even if even if we go to genetics, there are men with XX allosomes 
We call it De La Chapelle syndrome. Some or all of the SRY gene can translocate over to the, y uh, to the X chromosome. And so you have XX males. You can also have types of De La Chapelle syndrome where you don't have X, uh, an SRY gene at all. SRY gene is generally what we talk about as the on-off switch for, for male development, but it isn't always. Because there are, here's a fun fact, other genes that produce testes and ovaries and everybody has them. And so like you have, you know, an epistatic event up, upstream where you still have, you know, a, a, a male development, you have XX chromosomes. And similarly, we have Sawyer syndrome. You have a woman with XY chromosomes. There are case studies of women with XY chromosomes who have gotten pregnant and given birth to healthy children. Are they actually men? Um, we talk about the ability to give birth. Again, women can lose the ability to give birth or they can never have it at all. They could be born infertile. They could be born without a uterus. They could be born you know, with, with, with a, a tilted uterus. They could have all sorts of issues. Um, you talk about penises and vaginas. Well, there's a lot of in-between on those. We talk about hormone washes earlier on. Erica did an amazing discussion on, on, on hormone washes in utero. Those go all sorts of different ways and there isn't two options on those either. And also what's really most important is that we're talking about how every single determining factor in sex has a lot of variation. Sex and gender are also different things. And gender is a social presentation. It's, it's, it's something that we, we build off of the, the culturally expected behaviors based around roughly someone's sex. But the honest truth is, if you study gender across cultural lines, excuse me, you cannot boil gender down, nor can you predict gender from sex. Um, and there are a bunch of cultures. I'm going to go ahead and link this in the chat here. Here's a map that you can explore. This is in the chat now. Mm. There are cultures all over the world that have more than two genders, that have three or four or five different genders that they recognize um, because of the different presentations that people express. And so, so, like, the key here is that sex and gender are different things, and neither one of them is a strict binary. So, hmm. kind of just yeah, to I mean, add on to what David is saying, or to add on to what Force is saying here, David, right? Like, so Force just gave you a couple of examples of sort of exceptions to this generalization of you know you're you're born and let's talk about sex because it sounds to me like what you're talking about is is sex sex and gender are distinct things but let's talk about sex right so force is talking about how there are exceptions to the general binary that we tend to, or have traditionally considered male and female so you know take it to like a different example right like if i took you to a meadow of flowers and we're walking down the path and i say hey we're about to come up on this meadow of flowers um the two kinds of flowers that are here are purple and red and then we roll up and you see that like one out of every hundred flowers or 10 out of every hundred flowers are actually purple. They're not blue or red. Would it be accurate then to say that the field of flowers contains only two colors of flower? Um, Cause to me, it wouldn't, it doesn't really matter how few the examples are, whether they're 1% or 5% of the flowers in the field. And similarly, folks who are intersex do represent exceptions to this general binary amongst other kinds of exceptions to the binary of, of uh, male and female that we've traditionally assigned. So I think it's it's fair to say that at least with regard to sex, right, force is correct, as we talked about earlier, it's it's not necessarily binary. It's it's more accurate to say that it is bimodal. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, thanks for bringing that up. It makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I look, I'm a theist, but I mean, heavily towards science you know i don't like dumb things like it convince me right of course uh, yeah. wouldn't, cool. these, wouldn't these anomalies be necessary for there to be um like a equilibrium in the genders if it's just male and female that would be dangerous i think wouldn't there have to be like little in-betweens here and there to help us you know continue our um I guess our, our, our normal uh, gene pool instead of like just male, female all the time. Cause I, I feel like that would be bad if it were like that without the anomalies or mutations, right? Um, are, are you, are, so is what you're asking, why don't we see more people who represent sort of an in-between condition that that would provide more variation to the population and, and would be overall good? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I feel like, I feel like, Having that, those different, the, the differences is, is, I mean, I'm not a bi biologist. I'm not, I don't know any of this stuff. I, I've just watched a lot of documentaries. I've taken uh, some classes, but 
Uh, I lean more towards the like astronomy side, but anyways, uh, that's why I don't know about this stuff too much. But <laughs> but what I've seen, it's it's more of like wouldn't it be necessary to have these mutations for our species to continue in a healthy way? If you didn't have them, wouldn't they, wouldn't it be like dangerous? So it, it, it kind of depends because, like, yes, genetic diversity is necessary. Um, a lot of times with intersex conditions, which is, you know, if we're talking about, like, differences in sex determination, things like that, you know, there, there are a lot of those that are going to cause infertility. And so, like, that wouldn't matter really. Um, but really what it, it, what's more important about it is that when we're talking about this, we're talking about human beings. Um, and so, like, humans are unique in the animal kingdom and that we are the only ones that can express gender. Um, like I said a minute ago, gender is a purely social thing. It's something that is very much deals with your internal sense of who you are. Um, and so you can't go ask a chimpanzee, what does it feel like to be a boy? You know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really work. And I guarantee, you know, you and I both use he, him pronouns. I promise you, there are a lot of differences between what you consider male, masculine, boy feelings and behaviors and things like that, and then what I have, um, because just that's just how it is, man. Um, not e even yeah. if we grew up in the same culture. Like here I am with my weird shit, and here you are with your weird shit. We're gonna feel different, and so like oh, yeah. what what we have here, rather than looking at it purely from a, a biological perspective and trying to get into this like Martin Bailey argument of like. It's biologically possible, therefore, human rights. <laughs> like, cause that shouldn't be the conversation. Instead, it's right. it's more interesting, I think, in, in my opinion, to just be asking questions and like talking to people who have different opinions and different expressions of gender and like feeling like what are they feeling right now? How does it work for me to exist in their world and them in my world? Does it bother me or matter to me at all? If so, why? If not, why? Maybe it should a little bit. Maybe it's something interesting that we can talk about. Basically, like, I think it's really, and this is me on my soapbox, forgive me, but like, I think it's important that we do away with all the parts of gender that suck and keep the parts that are fun. Um, and, and in that way, you know, do away with the, 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 you know, systemic oppression and do away with the judgment and do away with the expectation and keep the expression and the, and the excitement and the, the joy of discovery and the personal development. Um, and so like, yeah, you could point to some weird biological thing out of it that it has this or that benefit. I don't know if you'd find one. I don't know if you'd find a detriment either, but I think it's more important to just point to the sociological aspect of it or the anthropological aspect of it and say like, hey, this is something cool that humans do. Let's learn more about it. And let's talk to people who have different experiences than me. And you should call into the Transatlantic Call-In Show and talk to some trans folk and ask about their ideas of what gender is all about for them. I think that would be beneficial as well. Yeah, I mean, look, what I believe it's, is, um, okay, well, I feel like, a lot of this stuff has been politicized and mainly because mm -hmm. of the pushback from religious people. Right. But I also feel that yeah. religious people have been very toxic to the point where it's, it's happened, you know, you know, when eventually you corner something to a point where it fights back. Right. So that, that part I understand, but the fact that it's been politicized to a point where it's now become a toxic, uh, not, not, to say that the people themselves are toxic, the, the, the leaders of these people have been pushing, I guess, because they make money off of this stuff. So for them, it's, it's, you know, it's a piggy bank or whatever. But then again, I do respect the people that do really feel this way or are actually uh, the, the anomalies, right? But again, I, I feel like the, the people, the, the reason why our species continues is because there are male and female. And if there are in-betweens, then I would say those are, mutations or anomalies that without us they would die out not to be offensive against anyone just saying you right. know it's that's how it would work so, um so they would you so know just mutations or anomalies. yeah right so just to be clear when when i i want to be clear with you i don't think that you're trying to be offensive to anybody i think you're asking these questions in earnest and that's why we're having this conversation in the first place um when you refer to people as anomalies, though, it you you have to understand. Oh, it's 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 dehumanizing in, in a bit of a way. No, no, so no. I, again, I don't I'm not trying to way. call you out. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't I think you do. I'm not trying to call you out here. Yeah. Um, no, no. yeah. But it's I think I'm it's all about to remember, right? like, yeah. If you remember, I, I don't know if you were listening a little while ago after the first call. I went on a whole rant about different types of thinking in biology. Did you hear that at all? 
I mean, I've been listening for like over an hour or almost two, so maybe I I listened to okay. a lot of Okay, it was a long yeah. time ago and it was a, a, yeah. But one thing that I brought up was that we have different types of thinking in biology. The same way that we have different ways of fighting to win different types of fights. There's different martial arts styles. There's different ways of thinking in biology to attack different problems. Um, and mm. what I think you're putting on here is, is you know, uh, the, there's, there's typological thinking where you like, this is this type of thing. This is, you know, this is what a primate looks like. This is what a cell looks like. This is what a, a, a mitochondria looks like, whatever it is. Um, there's tree thinking, which is all thinking about like, how does this represent the evolutionary chain? What benefit does this provide? When did this come up and why? What was the context for this kind of thing? And then there's population thinking, which is, you know, let's look at the actual distribution of the entire population, all the variation within it, and see how that plays out statistically and what that looks like in a real set in like real time. And what I'm what I'm hearing from you is a lot of typological thinking. This is what a male and a female is. Even though, you know, as we've demonstrated a minute ago, you don't have a way of ex actually defining male and female without excluding somebody um, that would actually right. should should fit in that group. And you're coming at it with tree thinking. Humans need to survive through sex. And so these these, you know, anomalous people, the, these 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 rarities, these people that are you know coming up so rarely with with the differences, they're actually, you know, not the norm. And therefore, do they really, are they something we should pay attention to or, or, or they should be representative of a society? And what I'm asking you to try is this population thinking saying like, here's the actual total distribution of humans. Most men are XY and most women are XX and most men have a penis and most women have a vagina and most men produce sperm and most women do that and like go on and on and on. But as long as you're just really, really remembering to put that word most in there and remember the people who don't fall into that most that there's a varium of continuation a, a, con a continuum of variation between them um and that there th th that doesn't mean that you have to say okay well now i'm going to define ten thousand new sexes it just means yeah we can still say here's these two groups these two major groups and then there's a lot of other people too and that's okay and 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 just kind of let that be a thing that's allowed in the way. You know what I mean? That's that's kind of what I would advocate yeah. for. And again, you can't stress this enough. Uh -huh. We are but, still only talking about sex. We still haven't even covered gender yet. <laughs> right. No. You know what? Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It. Uh, you know what? It's what sucks mostly is that everything that's been politicized and and there's these groups that are extremists that are I guess they're outliers. Uh, because I've seen, you know, normal things come out of regular people who say, oh, I'm trans, you know, and I don't accept these things, and I don't accept certain things, and that's cool, you know, and, but then again, you have morons on the religious side who are not only insulting them, everybody's going, everybody's damned to hell, apparently, right? I, I don't believe in hell, I'm not a Christian, I'm just saying, I believe in God, just so you guys know, but I, <clears throat> I feel like this whole toxic pushback from both sides is making it worse for, I guess, society as a whole. If I, I, so I guess, I guess that's what we're trying to say here, right? That we should just accept people for who they are without the toxic part of it, right? Yeah. Right, that's, that's the long and short of it. And, and again, you know, the, when, it, when it comes to gender, understanding that gender is a social construct means that it is necessarily non-binary. It, it can't possibly, because it is something that we made up, whether or not it's something innate within us is irrelevant because it's something that varies from culture to culture, to generation to generation, person to person, day to day, it can't possibly have only two categories. It can't possibly do. Even if we oh, name God. two categories, that doesn't mean they're the only ones. And as we say over and over, as, or at least I do, you know, nature does whatever nature wants to do. Our jobs as yeah. biologists is to try to take that and put it into boxes. And that doesn't always work. It, it's like, you know, if you look at a map, a map from the 1800s is better than no map, but Google Earth is better than an 1800s map. But the Earth is what the Earth looks like, and Google Earth is still wrong. Every map is wrong, but some of them are useful. And in science, every model, every theory is wrong, but some of them are useful. Because all we're doing is trying to define and put labels on reality, but reality is what reality is. And if reality defies our definitions, that's our problem, 
not realities. So if we see people who express themselves and have internal feelings outside of the binary that we've labeled, that's not their problem. That's the problem of the model. That's our issue to solve as a society. If we see intersex people and we're like, well, I only know of this male and this female group, that's not the intersex person's problem. That's the model's problem. And, and you know, as I said a minute ago, biology is the study of generalities and generalities are generally wrong. So it's okay that we say, you know, here's male and female. And it's okay if we say here's man and woman, that's totally fine. We're allowed to do that. But we don't get to take away the humanity of people who fall outside those, those norms, those binaries. Hope that makes sense. Right. right. That, yeah, that, that makes total sense. I, I, I'm about that. So I'm just because I'm a fetus doesn't mean that I'm here to like, you know, bash people. No, every, every human deserves to live happily. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm just here to learn, I guess what you just said made, made sense and that that's good, you know, cause I'm, I'm also into science or whatever and I'm studying. So, um, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, I guess that's pretty much it. Um, also I have a yeah. quick, quick question. Uh, yeah. what kills, like what kills mites? Cause I have a cat that I found and now, now I'm infested with mites. <laughs> mites? If, I can, if, if I can ask right here, if I can ask that, ask that here, if not, I'll just Google it. You say mice, the rodent or mites, the little so creepy crawlies? Like, mites, mites, like ear mites, little tiny ones. How do I get? Oh, Flynn. Um, I don't I know. Have the have work ass, mice? maybe. Uh, uh, Damn it. Okay. So you don't Sorry. know. Oh, uh, I would do. Well, <laughs> if if you have pets and you want to be safe, uh, diatomaceous earth is is great. Diatomaceous earth is just ground up silica. There are these tiny little microorganisms called diatoms, which make their cell walls yeah. out of silica. They're literally like bacteria covered in glass, basically. Um, oh. And. Uh, you grind those up and you make this really insanely soft powder. Uh, and any arthropod that gets into it, it's going to clog up all their spiracles, their breathing holes, and they're going to die weirdly. But it won't hurt like your cats and dogs. And so, like, that might be a good investment. Again, I am not in pest control. <laughs> I, am, I am a dumbass no, on the uh, internet I, I, who argues science for fun. <laughs> no, yeah, I know about the diet. Everything you said, I know, luckily. But I guess people that are out there might need that information. But anyways, that's, yeah, so I, I guess that's it. So thanks for the call. Yeah, uh, really quick before I let you go, Erica, I just talked for this entire call. Do you have anything you wanted to add? No, dude, you were on a roll. I was listening to you talk and I was like, this is like, you. this is, I know you, this is like your topic. I was like, you got this, man. Like you, you're, you're on this. The only thing I would have to add is that if I found out I had a bunch of mites in my house, my solution would be to either set it on fire or move. <laughs> 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 oh believe me it sucks it sucks um i mean they're a little annoying you know i just want to get rid of them uh but anyways yeah uh thanks guys for the information it's uh it's a um, mind thank you so much thank you thank you david All right, take care, i appreciate it take care david and if you ever want to call in and talk about why you believe in god we'd love to do that too i mean i i i yeah sure uh but i you know you guys don't uh get put together often uh but yeah so it's science. I, mean, I think we spoke about it before, uh, Forrest. It's uh, science related. But uh, I guess I don't want to take more time. Really? Of your, uh, more of your time. That's fine. Cool. Well, yeah, no, call, call back in next time Erica and I are on and, 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 and present your argument for God because I'd love to talk about it with you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I take care, guys. Have a good one. Thank you. See you later, dude. Bye bye. -bye. Uh, as always, by the way, even though I know we we had a great call with David, uh, I feel always compelled to just break out uh, at least one of them. This, this is the one that I usually go to, my college genetics textbook, where it says in chapter four, I've got a bookmark because I do this so often, 4.1, sex is determined by a number of different mechanisms. And here on this first page right there, gender is not the same as sex. Biological sex refers to the anatomical and physiological phenotype of an individual. Gender is a category assigned by the individual or others based on behavior and cultural practices. One's gender need not coincide with one's biological sex. And you can also look at, um, this is a cool one, actually. Let me really quickly, um, let me put this down and let me open this up. Um, so this is, okay, 
I'm gonna move this here. Um, yo, Arden, can you can you make my screen the whole business for a second? Can you blow me up on the yes. thing? Remove me from the feed, Ooh. Arden. Take me away. Get out of here, Erica. Oh shit! Oh, no, I'm the wrong one. I, there we go. Other <laughs> way. I, okay. I just want to show you something. I'm going to switch to display capture here. So you should be seeing now uh, my computer screen like this. There it is. Uh, and then these are like biology textbooks here. This is So this is Campbell Biology. This is like the tome of knowledge that like if you're an undergrad, you need to memorize half of this book and then you get a bachelor's degree is basically what this is. Um, and we can look in here for things like gender and see if we can find one got a few of them i'll flip uh so here trying to this is the whole book. chapter yeah uh biological sex gender identity sexual orientation human sexuality let me see if i can find uh this is value of diverse viewpoints in science it's not exactly what i'm going for cell cycle uh, chromosomal basis of sex, term gender, previous use as a synonym for sex, is more often used to refer to an individual's own experience, identifying as male, female, or otherwise. Um, this this book goes into, if I look up, uh, transgender, like it explains what these are going. Like this is not ideology. This is science. You know what I mean? Like it's I, it's so frustrating when I hear people talk about you know like oh this is all you know just just, just your politics. This one. This is the uh, Campbell Biology Concepts and Connections. This is the level, whereas this is the book for like college students. This is like freshman, college, maybe even high school, right? And we can look for words like binary in here. And it's going to give us a bunch of binary fission, of course. <laughs> if I can. <laughs> uh, here we go. We'll just take a quick detour and, and talk about binary fission for a little while. That'll end. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know yeah. if it is, but everyone oh. stay very engaged. <laughs> Here's, again, sex chromosomes and sex-linked genes. The term sex has traditionally been used to divide chromosomes and binary types. Coming to understand, sex classification may be less distinct. Um, we're, uh, 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 we now know that sex is not a binary state with two defined outcomes. And again, it goes into, here's intersex people. Here's transgender people. Like, this is literally basic biology. And so, like, for so many people out there, like we, when we talk about this stuff, you can bring Erica back in, please get my ugly face off of here on the main screen. But like when we talk about these things all too often, the conversation shifts and people are like talking about, oh, well, this is, you know, you're, you're letting your politics get into your science or things like that. And it's like, I, I, I encourage you to think outside the box a little bit more and like actually pick up one of these books because usually when we have these calls, I like to bring out this genetics book or I'll bring out this anthropology. Here's a, a human biology book, um, which is all about here. It's got this whole chapter. I'm going to cover this picture up because it's a, a naked person, but it talks about Ooh, like no, a, a, a ambiguous genitalia. And it talks about um, this individual has a female appearance, but XY chromosomes. Uh, uh, this is literally from the top of this paragraph right here. It's not correct to say that all XY individuals develop into males. And it, it's not also not correct to say it. In, in individuals with XX male syndrome, the SRY gene is moving translocation. It goes on and talks about that. Here's another one. Well, this is an anthropology course, textbook. This is, correct, yeah. me, correct me if I'm wrong, though. Like, this, is, this has been in the textbooks, right? Like, this has been in textbooks. Yeah, this is not new. None of this time. is yeah, new. It's, it's, These are just one. Yeah. Yeah, these are textbooks that I happen to be teaching out of at this moment, so I have them on hand. And some of these were my textbooks in college. Um, yeah, like I mean, this, this one is I'm an anthropology textbook. Is, like, I'm just shutting down like the notion that it's like, oh, you know, because people out there might be like, oh, well, you're showing textbooks, but those are new textbooks. Like, they just put that in, and it's like, uh -huh. no, I, I don't. That's not the case, right? Like, this has, yeah. you know, we wrap back around to the same concept. Why did this suddenly become an issue now? <laughs> like. That's where yes. lies the problem because this has been non controversial, as, at least as far as I know, for quite some time. And now all of a sudden it's like, because you and you're being forced to pull out all of these textbooks to show that it says the same thing that it has said forever. <laughs> like, I mean, maybe, maybe not forever, but at least the past couple of decades, maybe 
handful of decades, something right. like that. I mean, I'm not and an that, expert. That's on, that's on exactly that. what I'm trying to. Right. But that, that is exactly what I'm driving at. It's like I, by pulling these textbooks out, I'm not trying to show like, oh, I'm so much smarter. I know all these things. I'm just trying to show like this. Not a bit of this is news. The The only thing that's new about it is that a bunch of, of politicians and unfortunately a bunch of biologists have found a platform and found a niche in in telling people that, you know, their uh, the, the narrow heuristics that define their worldview are scientifically correct. Um, and that's just not reasonable. It just isn't. And then you get the I same know. arguments, the same tired, worn out arguments that you and I've gone over in this call, where it's or in, in this whole it. show, where it's like, well, where's the third gamete? It doesn't matter. That's not the argument. Well, like, I mean, I just, I don't, I don't get it, right? Because like, I don't understand how how a lot of these, you know, folks. Because I've I've seen, like I said, you know, I saw I saw the Fuentes article, and I saw so much fighting and just vitriol coming his way. And I was like, I just, this is so strange because I know that a lot of these folks who are esteemed biologists and even anthropologists and, and, you know, folks who really ecologists who've been doing this stuff for a while, like why suddenly should know better. have they go over? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying, right? Cause like, I know they've seen these textbooks. So like, I wonder if the situation isn't that they're being like fed thing like they're 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 observing media and the media is like the left is saying this the liberals are saying that and then they're like oh if they think that mm -hmm. that's true and it's some like clear it's something no one is saying and then they turn around and they feel right. like they need to like overcorrect or something because like i i can't imagine mm -hmm. that all of these biologists are, are like malicious you know like, i wonder what's going on like what do you think is and i'm curious to to your opinion because like I just expressed mine. Like, I think they're being misinformed and overcorrecting. But what do you think? Like, why do you think all of these biologists are suddenly, you know, and I say all of these, it's really not that many. It's mostly yeah. just ones that feel like getting riled up on Twitter. Um, and right. I, I don't know. Like, right. I, I don't understand it personally, but. I, I think it's the same reason why we used to have people who, you know, the, the same reason why we used to say left handedness is, is, was sinister. The same reason we used to say sex and gender is the same thing. The same reason why we used to say anything is that it's just an outdated way of thinking that you don't realize has kind of worked its way into your brain. Um, that we live in a society that teaches you this. And even though you go to school and learn it this different way, you still operate in the society every day. Um, and so, or maybe you find some other reason, like maybe you're a turf and you're like you brought up earlier, you know, the biology, but you're concerned about the ramifications of the biology. Well, if people believe this, then they're going to come into my bathroom and poop near oh, me. Right. And that's going to take away my rights to do something. I don't know. Like that's whatever It's like, that's maybe you make some issue and, and like it, what, what? I, I love the idea of like like science has a a, a left leaning slant. <laughs> it, it just kind of like it tends to get you that way. Um, and uh, especially anthropology, there's a reason why so many anthropologists are anarchists and shit. Because when you study human culture and civilization, you know these fairy tales that we tell ourselves about meritocracy kind of fall apart. And so like we we you know when you really dig down into it and when you focus yourself on compassion and, and knowledge more than, you know, whatever political motivation you may have, if it, I, I'll be honest with you, man, I, I've, I, I'll be the first to defend LGBT rights because I think that equality is important. If the science showed a strict binary of genders, I would be out here with the whole mental health awareness crowd saying, Oh, these people need to be, taken care of now i would still be advocating for your rights to be a human and do whatever you want but if the data showed something different that's the side i would be on but it just so happens that like that's not where we're at in in, in terms of reality and in terms of our knowledge the more we learn the more we understand that these people aren't crazy they're trying to express themselves and they're valid and we need to take them seriously it's such a myopic view of like the scope of of human variation and human behavior too and not just human behavior but like even primate or mammal behavior right like we in from a primatological perspective right like we have these bins that it's like oh you know males behave this way and females behave this way and like anybody who's ever spent any amount of time watching animals primates especially do anything know that that's 
it's you can't box them in right they're they're individuals right. and they're going to behave and express themselves in the way that they want to behave and express themselves and you can create the generalities as we talked about earlier but like humans are that tight like on hyper super mega mode where it's like we're just behaving in in such a myriad of, of fantastic and wonderful ways and horrible awful ways unfortunately too um but but like right. the idea that there are, are these sort of strict bins especially for gender that that blows my mind especially because just like looking at history you know i study more of like the bio and stuff from a perspective of like before we really reach humanity so this is much less my field but my understanding of human culture and history is that humans, if there is a way to behave, there is a culture out there that behaves that way, right? And sometimes, yeah. you know, there, there are two bins and sometimes there's more bins than that. And sometimes the bins are inverted and it's it's just all over the place. And so they, like, I, I don't know how someone can look at that that wide range of human behavior and experience and then turn around and say, not not only we need to do this thing this way with these two bins, but also pretend that that's how we've always done it. And it's kind of like, yeah. I just don't, like, that doesn't bear out at all. Like, any, spend yeah. any amount of time yeah. at all researching humans or non human primates or in the history of society is how we've expressed ourselves through space and time. And it just doesn't pan out. Um, and like, you know, it's it really bugs me too. It's like the, the party of small government is, is the ones leading the charge on this. You can't behave <laughs> that way. Right. I say you can't. It's just kind of like, Right. I don't know. Like, I, I want to say it's goofy, but it, it, calling it goofy downplays the sinister and widespread reach that this kind of thinking has, and that sucks a lot. That sucks. Yep. It it really does. Um, we've got so we've got five calls left on the line, um, uh, and a few of them I really actually want to get. We were talking about so so I've been looking down at my phone because I'm texting Arden. I'm trying to figure out like what she wants to do. Um, and, and she's telling me like, maybe she, she's an authoritarian dictator and she's, she's very strict on like how she wants me to run these things. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, but, uh, basically what we're looking at is we've got five calls left. Um, I think we can burn through them. Um, if we go real okay. fast, cause like all these are, are pretty you capable cool. of going um, real fast. <laughs> Love you both. I no. think so. But <laughs> Well, because you, I, no. you and I were texting and I was no. like, I'll take one more atheist call and then we'll drop the rest. But then I looked back at the thing and I was like, you know, line number 29, I really want to take line number 13. I can take in 13 seconds. Um, line number 26, we can take in two seconds as well. So like everybody who's been waiting on the line for, for you know, a long time now, um, be prepared to have your two hours of wait time be reduced down to five minutes okay. we're gonna crank through these yeah. if you promise that you can actually make those calls last like 13 seconds i i permit you to do them all but if they take longer than that i will intervene <laughs> with you with the, the she's hammer so of mean. justice she's, Just she's insane she rules with an iron fist you can you can um, bust us on this get us get our ass <laughs> So we'll do like we'll we'll try to limit them to like a couple of minutes max per call, and then the the very last line, uh, David actually called back and said he's down to talk about creationism to spice up the show. So maybe we'll get a little bit of that in there. Oh um, so we're gonna go with uh, I don't know if it's it's pronounced as or a z, but we're gonna go with as or Arizona maybe is her name. Pronoun she her calling from Washington wants to talk about speciation. Arizona, how are you doing today? Um, it's pronounced as. Hmm. It is as. Okay, cool. I didn't know. <laughs> We're just going with it. Um, uh, so quickly, uh, what I've got here is that it says, can you provide examples of macro evolution? Is that right? Um, well, yes, that. But, like, I remember them trying to ex say that, like, I... I say that like microevolution is a thing and macroevolution is not and like i recall you saying something along the lines that there are uh we have examples of speciation but i don't ever remember you saying any specific ones that i could point to and say like look this is a thing that's happened in our lifetimes and like is there one you could say or like give an example of uh you go oh, first yeah. erica i'm pulling up a thing Oh yeah. Um, okay. So it, it depends on what you mean by speciation. Typically when we're talking about animals today, we utilize the biological species concept, which I hate, 
but I will utilize it for today's purposes because I think most people like it and I'm cool with that. My favorite example of speciation um, actually isn't like the finches or, or the fruit flies or anything like that. I like the ring species of salamanders out in California. So you have a, a group of salamanders that are all very closely related to one another um, because they descend from a parent population that's actually traceable and uh, they form a ring species. So salamanders that are salamander populations that are directly adjacent to one another can still interbreed, but salamanders that are more than one adjacent population away from one another no longer can. And so what you're looking at is an, a species that is in the process of speciating into, into numerous different subpopulations that will and are currently in, in some of the relationships already separate species from one another. Uh, of course, the ones that can still interbreed probably aren't. Um, and this is where the, the or probably, yeah, probably aren't speciating and probably are the same species, um, which kind of throws a monkey wrench into the biological species concept a bit, just because, um, you know, <laughs> they can interbreed and yet they're, uh, they can't interbreed with more than one adjacent population away from one another. So who's a different species from whom and how do you define what a species is amongst these groups? But still, this is reproductive isolation in, in action. And this is in the wild, right? So reproductive isolation occurring in media res that we can see out in California now. Um, you can see this with the numerous different kinds of cichlids that exist in different um, lakes across the world. I believe there was a study that covered the ones in, I think it's Lake Victoria, but I'm not sure. Um, the finches are a decent example, but I think most of those are still interfertile. So I think I don't like to use those because they're not a great example of like solid um, reproductive isolation right now. Um, and then there's innumerable examples of in the lab, right? There was a 1989 study, I think it's Drea et al., but I'm, I'm not positive, um, that, that displayed reproductive isolation evolving in just a handful of generations in fruit flies. And the way that they did that is they, they basically separated them, parsed them out and bred sort of two different colors into the two of them. And when they reproduced that, or when they uh, rejoined the two groups together, they no longer recognized one another um, as viable mates. Even though they physically could still interbreed, there was reproductive isolation socially. The mate recognition concept uh, would, didn't work with them. So there's just a handful of examples that I, that I like to use as far as speciation goes. Um, you'll notice they're all in organisms that have really short lifespans. And this is exactly what we would expect. You cannot like over, you know, it takes several generations for speciation to occur. And we have been observing species for like a handful of human generations. So there's no chance that we're going to be able to see since we started observing like around Darwin, around Linnaeus to now, something like an elephant speciate out. That's going to be very difficult because they have longer gestation uh, periods than us. They reproduce super slowly. Um, but what you can do is you can take the, the macro evolution that we see in the salamanders and in the finches and in the fruit flies and in the cichlids. And you can say, what would happen if you took that exact process, what's occurring with those animals and you gave it a ton of time and you went from now backwards, you wound back the clock. Well, what you would see is even larger changes amongst groups of populations as we move deeper and deeper into time as they kind of like nest back into one another. So all macroevolution is, all speciation is, is microevolution across time, right? It's speciation occurring and organisms changing um, into to distinct populations, however we might define distinct. Was that helpful? Um, yeah, but could you also explain your issue with like speciation or like why you have like a problem with the term or something? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't like spe I don't like species as a concept. I do because it's very helpful and it's necessary and I, I don't not use it or advocate against it or anything like that. The problem that I have with species is that it, it isn't a biological reality. Like but species aren't biological units that are uh, standardizable across space and time. So for example, like Reproductive isolation is typically what we utilize for the biological species concept. We cannot take the biological species concept and apply it to extinct organisms because we have no idea what was capable of interbreeding and what wasn't. How do you know if Oreopithecus and Pierolopithecus could produce offspring with one another? They're both fossils, you can't tell. Um, likewise, the evolutionary species concept, which tracks organisms with um, like distinct fates, as it were, it's, it's like, I think it's Tattersall who proposed it. It's nice. But how do you apply that to extant organisms who are still evolving in the present, right? Their, their fate, as it were, has not yet been determined. You can't 
clock their change because they're still changing. So the biological species concept can't work back in time. The evolutionary species concept can't really work in present time. Species recognition can't work back in time or mate recognition can't work back in time. And the phylogenetic species concept can't work forward in time. So there's no standardizable definition for species that works unilaterally across the, the tree of life. And you might say, okay, well, why not just use the biological species concept for extant species and the evolutionary species concept for extinct species? And I'd say that that's what we try to do. <laughs> we try to do that, but we recognize in doing so that species can be a little bit arbitrary, right? So like, for instance, you can have those, those, um, those salamanders that I talked about, right? The, the ring species of salamanders. And it's not been that many generations, less than a hundred for sure. And they've already speciated out. And, and some of those groups are reproductively isolated from one another. And then you have the American paddlefish and the Russian sturgeon, two animals that are continent apart from one another. They separated 230 million years ago, and they can reproduce viable offspring with one another today. They look nothing alike, and yet they can still reproduce. So like, what do you do with that? that with the biological species concept in that sense right it, it's not unilaterally applicable and because of that i hate it because i i want things to be i want things to make sense but in another the last thing i'll say on that is and this is the beautiful part this is exactly what we would expect if evolution works as we think it works a color gradient where all the colors blend and smudge and mess into each other and you can't draw distinct clear lines between where one species ends and another species begins and i think that's epic so that's my uh, statement yeah so I, it's kind of I, like I the concept of the finding sexes oh, it, yeah, exactly exactly like that in exactly. fact someone has someone said that to me before they were like that's don't you think these two things are kind of similar to one another? And I was like, oh my God, they kind of are, aren't they? <laughs> yup. Uh, I actually remembered the assignment. And so I am going to very quickly summarize a thing and then give you two links and then I'm going to go away. I have, we have to be quick. Sorry. Um, so no, it's fine. I, I'm, I had the time while you were talking to get my links together. We'll switch next time. <laughs> so, so, um, you call in in the call screen. It specifically mentioned macroevolution, which is you know these big phenotypic changes throughout the fossil record, where we see massive changes in trends, changes in kinds, as the creationists like to say. Um, so here is a couple of them. Uh, this one is a paper. I'm 99 percent sure this is the, the right one. This is De Novo Evolution of Macroscopic Mi uh, Multicellularity uh, by Bo Bozdag et al. Um, and this was a paper published actually in may of this year and this is not, you know, not the first time this type of thing has happened it's really cool where they took multicellular algae i believe it was and they became a, a single cellular pardon me single cellular species evolved into a multicellular species in a matter of a couple of years um and it was totally based on predation and this has happened a few times and it's always comes down to predation and so this is one of the major hurdles of evolutionary biology, people are like, oh, well, you can't prove multicellular, blah, 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 just big changes. Here it is in a laboratory setting with stats and all. And so I, it's a huge ass link. And so I put a, a URL or a tiny URL there. Um, so that's posted in chat there. And then here's another one um, showing similar things that I think is really important. Again, these are just showing just how easy it is Oh, motherfucker why can't Forrest, i post two things within like five seconds yes uh, can you post like a normal comment in the chat because if you're not modded i think that's maybe why you're i'm not seeing your links come up so i think maybe you're not a mod and maybe if you post a normal chat i can mod you and then you can post links i think that'll solve the problem this is a normal comment is what i'm i just posted it there i'm i'm gonna try Am to modded? post my salamander paper too i don't know if Sorry, it will work but i'm also try. Why am I not modded? God damn you. Oh, um, chat's moving too fast. Ah, stop. I, I was wondering if, like, I I tried to explain. I don't know how the topic came up, but we were talking about our favorite birds, and I mentioned how there's, like, blue fairy you penguins modded. or <clears throat> something. They called something like that, and they're, like, really tiny, and they're kind of, like, bluish. And then I was trying to explain how it's, like, different from, like, the standard penguins they imagine, like, um, emperor penguins in Antarctica. And I tried to say that, like, they probably were like the the darker ones were probably eaten as they moved to like uh like brighter and clearer waters like because from viewed from above like it would be like a dark patch against like uh clearer waters and then like 
my mother took that to mean that I was convinced that evolution was the water turns penguins blue. And I'm not even sure if I explained how evolution works for penguins correctly then. But like, could you like explain that for me? Like I was not yeah, prepared so, to defend that at all. And I don't remember how it came up. Yeah. So, so what you're talking about is, is how organisms kind of through time experience adaptations to a substrate that they live on. So a substrate is just like the ground or the grass or the water or whatever. And organisms that tend to be prey animals are, are particularly notable for taking on colors and coloration and patterns uh, that make them blend in with their environment. And this isn't an intentional choice. What, what happens is you have organisms, let's say we're looking at green beetles and they live in, in green grass, or let's say, we're, let's say we're looking at black beetles that live in green grass. And all of a sudden there's a mutation in the population that introduces the color green into the beetles. There's just maybe one in a hundred beetles are now green when they're born. Um, with that gene is introduced, right? And that variation is now present in the population. Now the birds come to eat the beetles because they like to eat the beetles and they see the black beetles easier than they see the green beetles. And they start picking off the black ones with um, with a greater ferocity than they might the green beetles. And then eventually over time, the green beetles start to increase in number compared to the black beetles. And maybe eventually the, the gene becomes fixed. And now all of the beetles, the descendant of the very original ones are all green, right? So it's not that the grass turned the black beetles green, it's that there was a mutation that just so happened out of, out of pure chance to introduce the green allele into the population and then the environment selected for it because those were the ones that survived better. So that's all that's happening when you have coloration selected for within you know, a population of critters in a given environment. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, so my explanation of like, the darker the darker feathers standing out more in like bluer waters wasn't like a complete butchering no it was actually like pretty correct right if you have darker feathers and you're living in you know bright clear waters you're going to be easy to spot this is why a lot of uh predatory fish that live out the open ocean are like deep dark blue colors and the, it's only the reef fish that live or it's typically reef fish that live in these colorful reefs that have those beautiful colors um you're absolutely right I mean, I don't know the specifics of the population you're talking about, but like conceptually, yeah, that's that's dead on. Okay, thank you so um, much. For I your went time. ahead and linked. And thank you so much for calling in. I went ahead and linked. If you want to uh, look at it, I linked in the chat um, the papers that I was talking about. Um, I also linked a the map of gender diverse cultures from earlier on in the show because apparently that didn't go through, and I linked a. Quick, easy little video from John Perry was stated clearly about natural selection that actually utilizes some of the examples that, that uh, Erica just talked about. And here's also my playlist of my Light of Evolution series, which is a four-part series breaking down the basis of evolutionary biology in a language that anybody can understand. I encourage you to check them all out. I've already seen the, the Light of Evolution series. So Hell yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for watching. The blue... Like I was guessing about like the blue penguin, just because from what I learned, I assume that's basically how it worked. Right, yeah, right, right. Much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for watching. All right, AZ, okay, if that answers your questions, we're gonna rock it on to the next as. one. As. Oh, as, 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 sorry. It's not um, a civil dick. Thank you, as. <laughs> Got it. Sorry about that, as. Thank you so much for calling in. We're gonna move along. I just want to point out that was supposed to be thirteen seconds, and it was like. 13 minutes, I think. So, okay. what's what's course, minutes versus need, seconds between friends? Of course, we just need to reduce it by 100%, and we'll be fine. <laughs> Got it. I, I was going to try to get a timer in, but I don't know how to do that without ruining the whole show. So, no, Arden, you have to curb, you have to curb stop us. Like, you, you have to be like, hey, shut up. Because Jimmy will do that. He's like, da 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 da, stop it. I know, I know, I know he is. It, I'll, I'll be more in, strict going in this, forward. Uh, it, yeah. This is the only instance when the tra when when the advice of be more like Jimmy might actually be helpful. Sure, <laughs> true. Okay, so let's power through these genuinely, like under a minute, please. Thank you. Okay, okay. We got Paul who wants to know why humans haven't speciated. Paul, you're on the line. How are you doing today? Hey, Forrest. How you doing? Hey, Erica. I'm awesome. Hello. Uh, Paul, the reason why spe humans haven't speciated is because we haven't been reproductively isolated for long enough. Um, Erica just went through a series of different ways in which isolation, uh, reproductive isolation can happen. It can either be pre-zygotic or post-zygotic. So there can be behavioral isolation, temporal isolation, meaning you don't behave in the same way, you don't attract the same mates. Temporal isolation, you don't breed at the same time. 
humans are continuous breeders. So it doesn't really matter. Mechanical isolation, meaning things don't fit properly. Um, there can be a, a chromosomal differentiation. You don't make the right, you can't produce a, ver, a fertile, viable offspring um, or an offspring that can reproduce by itself. Um, in order for any of that to happen, we would need to be completely geographically isolated for like several hundred thousands, maybe even to close to a million years in order to get to that point. And that's just not something that's happened. Um, if you listen to somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, he said that, uh, you know, the uh, humans in the Americas were isolated for a very long time. And that's why Christopher Columbus coming over and, and, and building that bridge to America actually was a great thing because it it, it, it preserved human ge genetic variation and, and stopped us from speciating. And that's fucking dumb. <laughs> it was a dumb thing to say. And that's not, it would have taken way longer and we would have possibly found less genocide means of doing so. Um, that's my answer. Erica, do you have an additional answer? Yeah, dude, it's just what you said. It's gene flow, right? Um, and that's effectively impossible yeah. now that we're, we're a global species. We exchange too many alleles all the time. And gene flow is like the classic preventer of speciation because we're constantly swapping genes back and forth and keeping ourselves reproductively um, interfertile. And this only happened, this sort of globalization of, of humanity only happened like roughly 60,000 years ago. Um, and species, especially in long-lived animals like hominins, it tends to take them a long time to speciate anyway. So really the odds were stacked against us uh, as far as, as speciating out. But ultimately that's kind of a good thing, I think. Yay, thank right. you. That's exactly okay. right. Paul, does that answer uh, your question? Uh, Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I've been wanting to talk to you guys for a long time about this exact thing. Um, because Erica, I love your videos. I've seen all of your debates on Modern Day Debates. Hopefully you'll go back on there soon. <laughs> Um, for oh, I, no to the, the creationists won't debate me anymore. I they they don't even um, reach I out. It's so sad. Um, yeah, I'm They're really looking forward to your new video, the Thompson video you've been uh, teasing at least the last couple of videos. It's done. It's ready to go. I finally <laughs> finished it. I hopefully I'm going to release it on Friday. Um, I got to give a couple days for patrons to have early access. But yeah, we're we're coming for you, Jeffrey. Um, hopefully right. he's a uh, and then Forrest, I reached out to you on Instagram, but I'm sure you can't check all of your messages, but I'm looking for someone to do a video for my mother, who is is not uh, a, you know, a bigot, to say the least, I guess. She's a bigot. And I'm trying to, um, she said she would watch something if I sent it to her, but it would have to be like 20 minutes at the most. And it would have to be like, it's about, it has to be like about trans stuff. And I, I don't know if you're the best person to do that, or if there's a better person that I should reach out to that would do a custom video. Yeah, I think I'm too long winded, but like I am trying to remake my sex and sensibility video at some point and make it a little bit more cohesive and a little bit more modern and tie my language up together a little bit better. And so like maybe someday when that comes out, you can send that to her. But until then, I don't know. Uh, have her call into the Transatlantic Call-In Show and talk to, to, to Arden and Katie and Ben. And 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 uh, we got uh, Naomi on there now too. Yeah, talk to them. <laughs> It'll be better at it than I. Or I recall in this, I, and I'll I'll be I very polite worried. until she says something really shitty, and then I'll pull out my pile of textbooks again. <laughs> I just don't want to do to her what Matt hates, and that's you know like setting up your mom to like get schooled on air. Like I, that's not what I'm trying to do. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. No no no. Don't we're not don't don't try to embarrass her by any means. Like let her know this is a call in show where people call to debate you know, people with, with, with expertise in certain fields about certain things. And these people here happen to talk about this a lot and have some education in it, ask them questions. I promise they'll almost always be polite. And, and I'll, especially if she reminds me who she is, I'll be very sweet. Um, cause like, you know, that, that is true. When people set up like, like, I bet you won't call this show and they make their, they embarrass somebody that fucking sucks. So yeah, yeah, no, it's just, we're, 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 we're sweet. We're good peoples. Anyway, we got to move on, Paul. Thank okay. you so much for calling yeah. in. Thanks, Bye. Paul. Moving on next, well, we got Jenny, pronouns she, her, calling in from uh, Virginia. Um, says the fear of death uh, is, is upon yeah. her after losing religion. Wants to know how to deal with it. Jenny, how are you today? I'm doing all right. Jenny, Hello? how uh, terrible. Yeah. Hey, Jenny. Uh, real quick. Um, what was it like before you were born? Uh, I, I don't remember. 
And that's how it'll be after you die, Jenny. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's just more non-existence, which isn't that bad. You won't even know you're dead because you'll be fucking dead. Uh, and and what's crazy to think about, it, there is a, a really happy, uh, if you read the Apology by, uh, by Plato, where Socrates mm -hmm. is being judged for corrupting the youth and he's sentenced to death, um, he says that uh, if there is an afterlife, then he has nothing to fear because he's going to spend his whole rest of eternity asking questions of great heroes who he's always wanted to interview. And if there is no afterlife, then he has nothing to fear because it'll just be an eternity of nothing. He won't even know he's in it. And quite frankly, he could use a nap. And so like, it, honestly, mm -hmm. dying sounds scary. It can have an effect on you and your family. When you're gone, what will happen to your family? That's something you can worry about. And that's something you can help prevent bad effects now of setting your ducks in a row and having honest conversations about it. But uh, death itself, uh, I don't think is anything to fear. Erica, do you have something to add? Yeah, I so so I'm our I'm our resident uh, agnostic fence sitter. So I I don't know. You know, I find a lot of comfort in in Penrose's cyclic cosmology. I really like the idea, and and you know he's he does have a a, a decent idea. I think he's moved a little bit onto like brain uh, b r a n e brain membrane cosmology. But I think there's a shot that that things kind of kick back into gear and restart. In which case, I get a great amount of comfort knowing that life in some form may perhaps be uh, inevitable and continue onward over and over again, time in memoriam. And perhaps the dynamic pattern that makes you up may find itself repeating in the infinite uh, recreation and collapse of the universe, if it is in fact cyclical. And if it's not, then you got nothing to worry about, baby, because you'll be dead. <laughs> But yeah. if that's the case, then we would have to live in a closed universe, and you got to take that shit up with Lawrence Krauss. Jenny, did we answer your question, or did you have something else you wanted to, to probe us about? That, that, nothing else. Oh, I just no, did the no, answer there's question. something else I wanted to um, tell you. Um, I didn't introduce my um, daughter into the concept of God until she was already a teenager. And um, uh, Jenny, Jenny, call her, call her. She's been an atheist Jenny, her whole hey, Jenny. Life. I really appreciate that you've waited on the line so long to talk to our wonderful just, host. I really she, appreciate she it. Um, I told her about Jenny, it. it just, Jenny, it just, like, Jenny, well, Jenny. Okay, Jenny, I'm going to mute you. I, I really appreciate I'm so sorry. I really appreciate you waited on the line to talk to our wonderful host. And I really appreciate that you want to talk to them about this personal thing in your life. But we are so short on time. So unfortunately, we are not going to be able to go into a whole tangent story. I'm really sorry, but that's just not possible tonight. So. Thank you so Call much. Call back for again in. and ask us. Yes. Bye, Jenny. Tell Later. us the thing. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I hope we were able to be somewhat helpful uh, about a very serious topic that we covered in two minutes. <laughs> I do love uh, we got a uh, uh, sweet treat. One, two, three, one, one commented. Can confirm dead don't hurt, die and do. <laughs> love that. And we got <laughs> Matt pronouns he, him from the UK. Uh, instead of Whoa. Homo sapiens, uh, we could be. Pan Narens, the storytelling ape. Matt, you're on the line. How are you doing today? Hello there. I'm very pleased to be speaking with you. Hello, 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 hello. Uh, have you ever heard of uh, books called The Science of Discworld? Uh, Cohen, um, Stewart, and Pratchett. Yes, that one. I've heard uh, of them. I've never, I, I'd have no idea. And yeah, I've heard of them. I have no idea what they are or like to, to dig into them. I wouldn't have an intelligent conversation they, uh, about them. Yeah, Pratchett himself, of course, was a big proponent of uh, orangutans. Um, he went mm. over to Borneo mm. to uh, to help fund their study. <clears throat> yeah, so um, they're awesome. Uh, in thinking about how we classify, um, you can't do it by tool use because Corvids and Pan do that as well. You can't do it by language again, Corvids and. Um, Many other uh, songs lots of other primates too, so on and so on. It, it's um, Diana monkeys. What what narrows down uh, humanity, so far as I can see, is telling stories. It is. Um, there was a guy who said, "Oh, um, you can only lie once you've got language." And then he went to the zoo, and he saw some chimps lying about. Oh, if I hide this bit of food and pretend mm. I haven't seen it. I can come back to it later when the big chimps don't know that I've got this bit of food hidden. But whether that counts as a story or not, as we're thinking about, um, as, as, a, 
uh, proponent of nomenclature, how do you feel about Pan Narans instead of Wise Man? I wouldn't like Pan I mean, as the genus, but I would be cool with like Naran Pithecus, which would be story ape, and then pick a species name. I'd be cool with that. I'd have some truck with it. Yeah, I mean, humans, it's a bit, Force and I have discussed this many times, but Sapolsky's differentiation of humans, the thing that we do that makes us like starkly unique is our ability to like empathize across space and time, which is something like storytelling. It's a consideration of something that isn't presently in front of us, right? When we weave a story we're talking about, we're creating a, a, a reality that isn't right before our eyes. So yeah, I mean, I think that that is much more um, capable of differentiating Homo sapiens from other living apes, non-human hominids, as far as uh, as far as that goes, than tool use does. Because tool use doesn't do it at all, right? Um, lying won't work. Politics doesn't work. Um, you could say perhaps religion, but is that not also a bit of, of, of storytelling, perhaps? Um, creating a yeah. reality that, that makes more sense to you. So, I mean, I, I like the concept. I think the concept certainly works. Maybe if we if we were to stick with caring instead of Naran Pithecus story ape, we could be a, a Frondita Pithecus caring ape. And that'd be pretty cool. Anyway, uh, Matt, does that answer your question? Matt, are you still there? Yeah. Did we lose you? Okay, Matt, we're going away. I don't know if you can hear us, but thank you so much for calling. We're dropping the call. Goodbye! Uh, and with that, we have one call left, and it's... Sorry? Oh, I said thank you, Matt. <laughs> it wasn't for you, yeah. Forrest. We, we appreciate it. No, I thought you were saying something else. Uh, and with that, we got the last call of the show. As we were trying to, we were trying to be done with calls by 8.30, we failed. Uh, we got uh, wow. David uh, calling back to talk about creationism. Fuck you, David. That's We're starting the fight Ooh. early. It's, it's, how dare you? Uh, it's, 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 welcome to the thing that you're on again. Hey, tell us why you believe in God, quickly. <laughs> oh, man. Um... Am I, can you guys hear me fine or? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. Okay, cool. So, yeah, so the reason why I called back is because um, I had some people that were saying that I was, uh, well, somebody said I was, there was cog cognitive dissonance because I can, I accept what you say. But that's just pure ignorance to say that because science is fact and you can't use it for your arguments. But anyways, um, let's see. So about God and creation. Mm -hmm. I believe he exists. Uh, the science points to it. You know, it, it all makes What's sense. Some, which science in particular? Pick pick the most <laughs> compelling bit of science that points to God and tell us that. The creation story, Genesis. It's 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 correct. It's actually correct. Which one? Which creation story? Because there's a bunch. There's only one. Um, and Genesis I understand one, one if, uh, Genesis, Genesis one or Genesis two, because those are different creation stories. I read them. They're the same things, uh, just that they're told uh, in a different manner. But they're the same things. Um, but yeah, they're correct. Genesis one: the universe was created with the earth and the the stars or whatever. And well, the universe and the stars. Then came the earth and the sun, well, together in a way. And I mean, uh, as far as correct. I hear, as far as I understand, the hermeneutics of Genesis one versus Genesis two. In Genesis one, when God initially creates. Uh, humans he creates a dom but it's a no, it's not the proper noun so it just means he creates humanity versus the second yeah. genesis story where he refers to adam by his first name as uh, the proper noun adam um meaning a person so as far as i know those are two distinct uh creation stories and i believe that's what like nathaniel wright holds as well um also i don't think this is the same david from earlier for us this is a different david this is david from arizona not david from arkansas so this is, is it? This oh is my one. god! <laughs> what? Is this, this is the same one? Is this the same? Oh, oh, sorry, I'm David. Yeah. It could be our yeah. call screener might have gotten the um, the thing wrong. So From David's. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, that's fine. All right, so this is the same David then that just called about gender a minute okay, ago, right? Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's me. Okay, sorry, David. Sorry, David. No, you're good. Um. Yeah, so, yeah, so what do you what what makes you find that compelling? How do you think you find it compelling enough to be um a, a, a sort of literal truth, a true story? Because okay, well, man was created, man existed before Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve existed after man came. 
and then they procreated with each other, which, and then eventually with the rest of mankind, which created the rest of the people. It, I mean, it makes sense. Scientifically, it makes total sense with the whole beginning of the universe and the stars and the sun and whatever. It, I mean, I understand that you guys might have a little bias, and that's the problem. No offense, but it's a little bit of a problem that people have a bias, and they tend to not look at everything with a clear head. They look at it with an anger, which is fine, because Christians have made it hard for people to look at religion in a, in a, in a good way, I guess you could say. Uh, so the here's here's the thing, Earth and Heaven are created together in the beginning, at the at the first one, which doesn't make so it, it is in Genesis one. Earth and Heaven are created together in the beginning, which doesn't make any sense. The universe is you know thirteen point eight billion years old. The Earth is only four point six billion years old. So those are two different events that happened at different times. The Big Bang was billions of years before the formation of the earth so genesis 1 1 the creation of the heavens and the earth together doesn't really track mm -hmm. unless you want to say they were two different events and it just says he made him it doesn't say when okay but then later on it says that he made light before he made sun and stars and all these other things so where was the light coming from without those things it sounds like this is a sequential business he also makes plants before he makes the sun so how do these plants live without photosynthesis so like to say that these things follow the flow of the actual scientific understanding of of, of the creation of the of the development of the earth that just doesn't track and even if it did because there are creation stories out there that sound great you know the 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 lakota creation story about how Ea, which was the being that encompasses all things squeezed a bit of himself to make the earth that sounds a lot like planetary formation and he squeezed it uh, this earth so hard that the blue blood ran out and that's the oceans yeah if they had carbonaceous chondrites there and and you know the, the everything's going to sink to the bottom sure that kind of tracks and 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 things like those you can kind of paint a picture but i bet you don't believe in those and so like with this one you're accusing us of being you know uh obstinate and saying that like here's the evidence right in front of us and we're not buying it because we have some bias in our heads i would accuse you of doing the same thing this story very clearly does not comport with reality and when it does it's circumstantial as opposed to the other way that we have it which is you know evidence-based and has nothing to do with a god as laplace said we have no need for that hypothesis of a god I'm I'm glad I called uh, because looking at the comments, I'm looking at everyone here, and I unfortunately I, that's the thing. I feel like intelligence is a very rare, very rare trait, and I I can see it in you, Forrest. It's just that you you've been clouded by, uh, I guess I'm intelligent. The the way that you were raised and people you were around, um, it kind of. Oh no, I was raised around people. a lot of religions actually. No, that's fine. I know, I know. But you went to school and you understood more than other people do. The people in the comments, though, these people are, the majority are like just, they're, they're le leeching information off of you guys, the actual people who do research. Now, hold on now. Don't, don't insult our comment section. You've been nice so far. Don't be mean to our commenters. They're insulting me. <laughs> they're insulting me. Come on. <laughs> Am I not? Can I, okay, I want to know. I'm, I'm really, I'm really intrigued by something you said, David. I've been mulling it over. I've been puzzling and puzzling the, the sure. since you've been talking since then. So, so you, you, you're saying that the creation story, God, what, like creates humans, or do humans evolve, and then Adam and Eve are created, and then they, like, what's going on there? Do you, do you accept an ancient age for the Earth and evolution, and do you just believe God uh, spurs yeah, evolution and interferes with it? What, I, what do you suppose I, goes I, on there? I accept all of science. Why? Because it makes sense. I've studied it myself, you know, so I'm not just some person that's talking out of not knowing. It's unfortunate because I've seen lots of debates with Christians who've actually studied science as well, and their, their arguments are horrible. But yeah, I do accept evolution because it's, it, it makes sense. There can't be something in this. You, you cannot, God could not have made things not make sense in the universe that is supposed to make sense. And that in itself is why you have so many people asking questions oh how how did uh things come to be because if you could tell that god existed then there would be no point in us bettering ourselves to reach a higher level so i mean so far uh, you know reading the comments it's kind of unfortunate seeing how people are can be arrogant and biased 
And that's unfortunate because you all, all you have to do is clear it, clear your head, and you'll understand more. So do you suppose, David, when you say you're, you know, you're a theist, right? Are you taking the a, a general theist perspective or like a Christian perspective or a Muslim perspective or, or just like where, where are you at? Jewish perspective. The only one that okay. should be taken correctly. Right. I mean, it's clear as day that Islam and Christianity are plagiarized uh, versions of Judaism. And that's the fact that people don't see that, and I mean, unfortunately, you guys attack Christianity, which is fine, but then again, you're you're attacking something that doesn't make sense in the first place. So it makes the argument kind of null, and people are learning incorrectly what to argue about, and they're insulting. They feel morally superior. They feel they feel in, more intelligent when in reality, it's it's neither. They're just spewing a bunch of hatred towards another group who spew who is spewing hatred at them. So it just becomes this really toxic culture that we have now where everybody's fighting because of beliefs, for example. So, so quick question. You, you talked about, you know, uh, uh, you, you used the word spewing and that reminded me, uh, the, the, in, I believe it's the Congo, uh, there's, they have a creation uh, story of Mbombo Mbombo yeah, was I'm, I'm the right. creator of, of everything. He vomited up the scars in the sky and then vomited the earth as well and and the the water from his vomit dried up and that's where we get land and the rest of the seas is just you know the wetness left why don't you believe that bumbo vom and this is not a joke this is actually the this religion why do you not believe that bumbo vomited up the earth why do you believe that god created it in the way that it says in the bible because in the bible if people actually read instead of insulting me or my intelligence not you exactly, but the majority of the comments in here who don't think for themselves, unfortunately, the Bible says that God went to different peoples before he went to Abraham, and they all rejected him. So he must have taught him these things, taught them these things, and then eventually they just in, ended up worshiping and creating their own gods, which is the problem that Israel had as well. And But the good thing is that Israel, they actually followed through with a lot of things, and he taught them more, and whatever happened, and, you know, and we got the whole creation story, blah, 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 and it makes total sense. These other places, though, where God went to beforehand, they, you know, they ended up changing everything on their own, making their own gods, and whatever, you know? So, that's, that's uh, in the Bible. So, is the rest of the Bible correct, or just, just Genesis? Just the, whole, just, just the Tanakh. Tanakh is correct. The, the the rest of the New Testament that doesn't exist. That's all all just Roman created. Okay. Uh, okay. So hold on just one second. Let me find Kings is in the uh, the Old Testament, right? Yes. So is everything in Kings correct? I mean, if there's a lineage there, then it should be. What would you say that's wrong cool. about it? Um. Uh, so here in Kings, we're talking about the creation of, or the building of King Solomon's temple. Um, and we are making a pool. It's called a molten sea, 10 cubits from one brim to the other round all about, uh, height was five cubits. That's not necessary. Um, and a line of 30 cubits composite round about. So that means that the, let's kind of draw this out here. So in Kings, we have a circular pool. The circumference is equal to 30, right? Uh, and the diameter, let me see here. Yep, so 10 cubits from one brim to the other. Diameter is 10. Circumference over diameter equals pi. And in this case, pi equals 3. So that's wrong, and that's in your Bible. So why do you believe well, the rest I mean, of it if it doesn't do math right? Well, I mean, honestly... I'm not even looking at the stuff right now. I'm talking about the creation story, which is correct. And there's a thing. There's a person right, but you said the Old wrote, Testament is correct, and that's in the Old Testament. That doesn't make it incorrect. I mean, just because some of the numbers might be wrong, or maybe they was translated incorrectly, or or maybe you did the math incorrectly, but it should have worked. I, 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 mean, I can do with, thirty over ten pretty easily in my head. That's like that's what. You, but here's what what I hope we understand, David is. You're accusing us of being biased based on our upbringing. You're saying that because I went to school and I learned a bunch of biology that I've been trained to reject the Bible. But when I just showed you really, really basic math, your response verbatim was, 
just because the math is incorrect doesn't mean it's incorrect. And that you no, can't say wrong. that one breath oh. after saying everything in this is correct. So everything in is correct except for this math, but that doesn't mean that it's wrong. There's some other reason. And I'm sitting here saying, I have no evidence for this God. Therefore, I don't believe it's well, real. And you're saying okay, so the lack of evidence I have is a result of some weird bias and some additional whatever. And I, I don't think I'm the one with the bias problem here. Can we agree that there were buildings that existed back then that were large and huge and they exist until today, a lot of them? So uh, the math the math that these people had, I mean, it was correct. So either you did something wrong or something was not done correctly, but these buildings existed. So I don't know how to answer that question beyond that. I mean, right, but what I'm saying, is like the pyramids are older than the Bible, right? The pyramids are significantly older than the Bible, and the math was great for them. So whoever wrote this in the Bible and then translated it a million times, somewhere along the line, whether it was at the beginning or where it was written or translated, whoever, somehow or another, pi calculates to three. So like, let's say it's a translation problem. Let's say that they got it perfectly right in the original text. It actually calculated the 3.14159, blah, 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 and it was perfect. How do you know that the rest of it wasn't mistranslated? Something else in there got translated wrong. Because if 2,000 years before the Bible was written, we had enough math to build pyramids, which fantastic mathematical feats, and then we have this, apparently, this perfect math in the Bible, and now 2,000 years later, we have it wrong, how do you know the rest of the story didn't get fucked up somehow? I mean, you're asking questions here without going back to the whole creation story. I mean, buildings exist, and they existed back then, and they, the people that read this Bible or the book at that time, they were making these buildings during that time. So either something messed up, but the buildings did exist, and they do exist till today, some of them. So I don't know what's the point. All right, but you don't need to calculate pi to build a building, do you? Forrest, Forrest, rip, Forrest. To your, uh, rip to your pyramids, but the temple's built different. Literally built different. Right. Okay, well, I, I, I guess like what, what's, what I'm struggling with, David, is like it because it seems it seems a bit just so to me. Like it, it seems like you're saying, you know, the uh, the Genesis story, it, the the Genesis story in the Pentateuch is 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 quite compelling to me. Um, none of the other creation stories are correct because they're all pulling from Genesis. But to that, I, I would kind of say, well, you know, some of those other stories came first. Right, some of the Assyrian and other Mesopotamian cultures that that they, you know they had stories of creation that came before the version in Genesis. Um, right. you, you know, you, you're talking about how like there's there's bits and pieces of Genesis that seem to map to reality, but as Forrest said, like the the order of creation is all incorrect. And and I understand as I understand the the way that a lot of religious folks, uh, Abrahamic followers, kind of get around this is saying like, okay, well Genesis might be allegorical, and if that's the stance you want to take, then I, I don't really have a problem with that. But it sounds to me like you're saying that Genesis itself is compelling literal. when taken literally. It's literal. Uh, I mean, the, I, I just by hearing the answers that I received from Forrest and looking at the comments, I can see that you're not thinking clear-headed. You know, like you're thinking with a bias against religion, which is understandable. But then again, I mean... I'm being. I'm, I'm reading the comments. text critically, and I'm giving you the exactly what it says. I, I don't have a bias. Look, I'm I, reading the text literally and telling you this thing is different than that thing. The two, the chapter one and chapter two are different stories, and neither of them comport wrong. to reality. I'm gonna go grab my Bible. Reading, I'll be right back. You, you're reading it incorrectly. That's the problem. If you read it with an actual mind to see the truth then you'll understand but if you're reading just trying to be just to be mad at religion and try to like aha me then that's wrong i mean you have to, i understand that this show they want to counter the theists but in reality it's just all they're doing is just uh i mean one look soon I, I have my own channel i'm not gonna shout it out or anything uh but one day the truth will come out and science will support it and then people here will feel not good about the things that they said unfortunately i mean i have people in the comments reading things i, I saw one that said that oh the creation story is not about Ubunga or whatever it's about some cre uh giraffe pooping the earth into existence it's like the people like that 
exist on both sides. People just like that are they're 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 the problem. They exist on both sides. They exist on the theistic side and they exist on the atheistic side. And that's the problem that we have. People like that. They, that's the problem. I mean, when so David, so Forrest, Forrest has his Forrest has his Bible out. If if how about we just go through Genesis? Are you going through Genesis or Kings, Forrest? Yeah, let's just let's just well, let's go through one part of Genesis. Oh, so I promise you, <laughs> I've I've read this thing. Like you can see, I've got, I don't know if it's going to be functional because I've got my Bible no, is full of highlighter and notes. Like I've I've been through this guy, right? I'm not like just pulling up whatever atheist meme here, right? I've read this critically, and it's not so here. Here at the beginning, it in in Genesis one is right. Is the book of Job? Let me ask you another question really quickly before I move on. Is the book of Job accurate? Do you think that's true? That's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, looks like a poetic kind of thing going on there. It's not. It's okay, but be- but is it real? Did, in, in the book of Job, it has a long quote from God. Did God actually say the things that the Bible says God said in the book of Job? I mean, again, it's po- it's poetic. That book is poetic. So if if he said it, it, it has to have been in a. I don't know if the word euphemism is correct in that one. I'm not sure. Uh, but or I don't know the correct word for it. But he. Okay. Well, let's let's just see. Let's just see what you think. Okay. Um. Let's see here. So in in the book of Job here. In the book of Job here. It says that stars came before the earth. This is Job 38, 4 through 7. So let me find that really quick. 38, 4. Uh, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? When the, uh, uh, the stretch the line upon it, the foundations were fastened. When the morning stars sang together. So the stars were singing before he laid the foundations of the earth. That's what it says in Job. Then over here in Genesis, he makes the sun and the moon and the stars, but like after he makes the earth. It says he makes the heaven and the earth first and then makes the stars later. So in Genesis, it says earth first, then stars. In Job, it says star first, then earth. Which one's right? That's, uh, that's, I'm sorry, but that's a lack of uh, critical thought right there, unfortunately. And I, I, I don't blame you. It's the majority of people that are this way. Um, if you read Genesis correctly, in the beginning, of God's creation of the heavens and the earth, the heavens is the universe. The earth is a part of that. It's it's not going to tell you like every little detail, but the universe was created and the earth. Um, okay, the universe can be there, and stars are a different thing from the universe as well, right? No, it, it's it's a it's a broad thing. Uh, the stars were a part of the universe. Um, it's uh, the earth was created af- during the unit the the. the it came after the universe's creation, but before the, I mean, after the sun's creation as well. So the sun formed around the same time as the earth. And that's why you have the earth being empty and like, you know, and then afterward, the light, afterwards, the light came into being with the sun's, the sun reaching the main sequence. I mean, that's how the, the solar system came about, you know, from the creation of the sun as well. I mean, it's accurate, you know, you're looking at it in a different way. So can I can I ask something? How how do you square the order that things are created in Genesis one one with plants being created before light, things of that nature? Plants are not plants are not created before light. Yeah, plants plants were created before. before the stars, before the sun. Yeah. Light right, was created I mean. before the sun. Yeah, yeah. light was that's created great. before the stars and the sun, and then plants were created after that or, or no sorry plants were before then so it was light then plants then the sun so how does that yeah, track you said light then plants then sun no that's, that's what not, it says not, i mean it, it, that's not what it says you're looking at it in a different manner and i understand because the majority of no uh, it, it it says it, right here it please for, david for for both of our sakes no. please quit telling me that i'm i'm in if it's reading this wrong and just answer the question. So here it says, God created light. That's Genesis 1 3. Then in Genesis 1 11, he brings forth grass and herbs and plants. 
Then in Genesis 1.16, he makes the two great lights, one to rule the day and one to rule the night. So he makes light, then he makes plants, then he makes the sun and the moon. Like, so what, how does that order work for you that light happened before there was light, before there were the sources of light, and that plants came before the sun? Um, I mean, that's not how, that's not how you're, you're, you're looking at it the wrong way. Uh, the universe is created first, and in the universe, the earth was created. The earth was empty, but the, the sun was forming during that time, and then it formed, and then God said, let there be light as the sun reached the main sequence, and that's how the planets and the luminaries, which are the, star, the, the planets and the moon, came into being as well around the same time. Um, which is, it all makes sense. I mean, if you look at it from a different Wait, perspective. In the I mean, David, I, I, huh? also, I don't understand. Like, let's, like, if we say all of what you're saying is true, that still doesn't fix the problem right. of what the Bible says is that you've got light, and so you're saying that's the universe, the heavens, and the earth, and then you have plants, and then the, the sun and the moon, the, the greater light and the lesser light, after those first two things. So where, where in light. your sort of understanding do plants come about? where do uh so let me explain so the universe came to being with stars forming you know black holes stars galaxies forming all that stuff the earth is just a part of a galaxy that exists in one of the universes that came to being and in what about the sun in that yeah. solar, that's what i'm saying in the solar system that, the in that galaxy the the sun was forming and then from its accretion disk the earth and the other uh, planet, planets were forming and then the moon came to being in either by a, a comet or, or or a part of the earth or whatever but in during that time water was introduced into the earth so now we have a an empty earth forming and the sun is not has not that's a different order of operations than what this says what you what you no, just not. said no, is different than what this says <laughs> No, it's not. It's not. It's exactly what it's saying. It's exactly what it's saying. And then when what God it's says, saying is different uh, than what is actually written. It's not. It's right here, in my, right in front of me. I'm reading the, the 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 well. I guess you would call it the Old Testament, but I'm reading the Tanakh or the Torah, the Genesis. And so, so, okay, that, okay. you know, so David, uh, my understanding of what you're saying here is like you're you're down with the science. You 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 just it described. You know the a general idea of how the solar system is thought to have formed including the sun and the formation of you know the moon due to the collision with the planet Theia and all of that good stuff but but the problem with that is as far as i can tell is like all of that is is step one and then according to genesis what comes next is plants but in conventional science we understand that the plants evolve like roughly during the solarian and the devonian right so no, By the Silurian no, no, no. and the Devonian, we already have the sun and the moon, though. And and what the, what Genesis yeah. is saying is that you have the light, then the plants, then the sun and the moon. But by conventional means, we have the the lights, so the stars, then the sun and the moon, and then way later plants. You see what I'm saying? No, because um, I see what you're saying, but it it says that let there be luminaries. It doesn't mean that he created again. No, it means that these planets and these the moon and the stars are now signs for seasons as it says for season which we have today we, we even have this thing called astrology right that people look for for their personalities or whatever that's what okay so what you're it's, saying you're saying signs. is that they're 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 named you're saying that they existed before but on three that's, that's when they're named well at that point that's when everything is like basically said okay well now now that all this comes to being these the moon the the stars and the planets will now be signs for seasons and and days or and years so yes well, and let me correct. ask you a more a more direct question let me ask you a more direct sure. question uh animals <laughs> all the animals did god make them out of the water or out of the ground well they came to being from stardust I and mean, we're all stardust it came out from from, from right, but uh, like where? Version. Where did that happen? Huh? It came from the ocean. where and it how did that where? happen? Okay, so then you would oh, agree oh. if it came from the ocean, then you would agree with chap Genesis one twenty. Let the water. God said, "Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that have life 
and the fowl that may fly above the earth. God created great whales and every living creature that moved when the water brought forth abundantly. All life started in the ocean and evolved out of the ocean right. into land okay. animals, right? Yeah, correct, right? Here's okay, excellent. So then you would disagree then with Genesis chapter 2, where on 2.19 it says, and from the ground God made the beast of the field and the fowl of the air and brought them to Adam. So in chapter 1, it says he made them out of the water, which sounds a lot like evolution. And then in chapter 2, he made them out of the ground the same way that he made Adam. He made them out of mud. Well, aren't we... So, okay, where does it say that? What verse is that? Because I'm looking chapter at right 2, now, right? verse 19. Out of the ground, the Lord God may, formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. So you see, beasts of the field, where were the, the, where's the field that is it underwater or is it on land? That's the question right there, right? Because Right, but it says, point, out of the ground, God formed them. I mean, that doesn't change anything from the actual creation. This is, this is now telling you in a poetic sense, we have been formed from the ground. We've been formed from the ground. What do you mean? Yeah, we're made of dust. Are you when you die, do you go into the ground or do you go back into the ocean and, and, and decompose there? Where do you, where do you decompose that? So Depends on where you die, literal. I guess. Sometimes it's literal, but oh, sometimes oh, it's oh. allegorical. That it depends, I think, is what David is saying. So he's saying like when, are, when it when it matches when it matches what we see in, in science, then it's literal, but when it doesn't, that's when it's allegorical. No, it's no, 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 no. Wrong. Because we, where do we have babies at? Or do we form babies in the oceans, or do we form them on land? So, there, there are cultures that have babies in the water. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, but still, like that's see now that's a little bit of bias right there, unfortunately. But I'm, I'm being up front here. How is that bias? The order, the order of the creation is correct. I mean, why do I, why do we have to run around? So, the okay, creation? okay. So, David, how about, how about? You know, I, I feel like I'm being pedantic here, but let's, it, it, this seems to be the direction that we're going down. So let's go down it. So my understanding, of course, you've got the, you've got the book, right? You get the good book right in front of you, right? So birds and fish. Reading, reading it directly from the text. Yeah. So birds and fish come before beasts of the field, right? And beasts of the land and slithering things and such. Is that correct? Uh, well, it, that, that depends. So here it says in, in Genesis chapter one, no. it says the water brings forth everything that has life. It starts with fowls and then it mentions whales. I don't know if it's in order. It's just, we're just listing things. Um, and then in chapter two, it says the beasts and the, 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 the birds, and it doesn't mention fish at all. Okay. Well, I mean, again, so... it's life came from it. Life is all life. You know, it just mentions the, uh, do you think fowl? It, are just the birds of today or, or, or are fowl not also the dinosaurs and are they not? Well, no, I, they I certainly would agree wouldn't be. No, they, they were, were reptiles, reptiles, but well, but I would, but I like, would agree. Would, like, I would include, you could, you can have that. Like we can say that, that the birds would include like theropods and, and non avian dinosaurs. That's fine with me, but that still doesn't make sense because the, we, we see the emergence of mammals in the Cretaceous as well. And what if the synapsids and, Lycosaurs, actually, the lycosaurs are synapses. The synapses and sauropsids and the things that come before, and the temnus bundles and all sorts of stuff like that. Like where where do those fall in? You see what I mean? Like I. But which which one? It, it, the, it, one the last part? Oh, temnus bundles. They're like amphibians. They don't come from the sea, but they are. They're not mammals. You see what I mean? They're like they're I mean, amphibians, of, effectively. That's all. How that's nature is supposed to make sense. If things do not make sense then we would easily know, oh, there, there is no God, He's, or there is a God, I'm sorry, because now we would not have, we would have things that don't make sense, and we would be saying, oh, there, something must have created it then at this point, because it doesn't make sense. Right. But it had to make right. sense. Right, so, but, but to me, what it seems like you're doing, David, is, is I feel like what you're saying is like, I feel like you're, you're quite reasonable with regard to the science stuff. I mean, we talked quite a bit about all of this, right. and you seem very reasonable and all that stuff. I think that's awesome. Uh, but it, it kind of seems a little bit to me and, you know, maybe I'm misunderstanding some things here, but it seems like you're taking what, what we know to be true because you, you're taking the perspective that the Bible isn't going to, to claim anything that doesn't make sense. So therefore, whatever we see, if it makes sense, then it's got to be copacetic with the Bible. And so you're basically kind of tuning your interpretation of the Bible so that it is copacetic no. around us. Is that, that's that's no. what it feels like to me. Maybe I'm incorrect. No, but okay, but then again, 
while we're talking about other things, you, you, we're ignoring the whole creation story, which is accurate to how science sees it. And you're trying to, or Forrest was trying to pick a different verse and try to take it out of context. When in reality, it's, what happened to the first part, the, 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 the part where the universe came to being, I mean, why is it so accurate? Um, why okay, did, do, do, do you mind if uh, I... Really if quickly. I, okay, no, go ahead, Forrest. Uh, oh, yeah, get, can I ask one more question really quick? Uh, David, uh, did were animals created before or after humans? Animals before. Animals came before. Everything, uh, humans came way after. Okay, so then you would agree with Genesis chapter 1, 25 through 27. God made the beasts of the earth after his own kind, cattle after their kind, each thing a cry, a cry, creepeth upon the earth after their kind, and God saw it was good. And then God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness, and male and female he created them. You would agree with that? Yeah, I mean, you said the beast came first and then, the, then man, right? Yep. Yeah, and so that would mean you would disagree with chapter 218, which says God made the, the beasts out of the dirt and then brought them to Adam, who already existed, so that Adam could name them. I mean, That's 18 and 19, point. chapter 2. Wait, chapter 2, 18 and 19? It's the exact same one that we were talking about earlier. Uh, God, the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make help for him. And so out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what Adam would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave name to all the cattle and the fowl and the beasts of the field and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then Adam, he, ta he calls, uh, causes Adam to fall asleep and takes one of his ribs and makes a woman which is different than chapter 127, where it says God made man in his own image, male and female, he created them together. So in chapter one, he makes animals first, then makes man and woman together. In chapter two, he makes man, then he makes animals, then he makes women. So which no, one of those is true, chapter one or chapter two? That would, be, that would be such a sharp contrast. Like it would be so extreme that, so what you just said doesn't make sense. It would, it would have to, it would mean I agree. That, the, that right, exactly. So it would mean that man. Then God said, "Hey, I'm gonna. I formed all of these animals for you to name, and He gave us dominion over the animals, right? Which is what we do have today. No, you're close. He God. makes man, and then He says that man shouldn't be alone. So after He made man, He then made the animals, and then after that, He made women. So the creation story in chapter two is that ma hum male humans came first, then the rest of the animals came, women. then women came. Nope, that's wrong because he, a helpmate, that's the key word right there. He made a, a, someone for him, but men and women already existed as you can see in the earlier, where it was said earlier that God created man. So that's wrong right there. So the Bible is accurate here. He created- a, a So the, the fact that it's written so what you're saying is, because I'm not reading this out of order, that is chapter 2, verse 19 through 22, Forrest. in order. And what you're saying is that because it's written in that order, doesn't actually mean anything. Because in a different chapter, it's written in a different oh, yeah. order, and that means the one that uh -huh. makes sense to you is correct. No, they're both correct. It's, you're just yeah, not looking at it correctly, I unfortunately. I I, okay, David, tell me, tell me if I'm grasping this. It, it, I'm, I feel like I might have it. I feel like I might have grasped it. Are you saying that mm -hmm. Genesis chapter one is accurate, and then Genesis chapter two is like a zoom in on chapter one, so it's just like it's like tweaking things? It's not tweaking things, but it's more like explaining things, you know, for that little narrative, for example. So in the first chapter it tells you how everything was made in order and it's accurate if you guys actually look at it from a scientific perspective not from a biased perspective you will see that it's accurate okay I, i'm and gonna then, i'm gonna hop in here i'm gonna so <laughs> there's been like 18 times there's been a point developed and presented to david and then david just kind of responded with shrugging it off and say you didn't understand well i would love to sit on this merry-go-round until uh midnight <laughs> i am unwilling so we're gonna put a cap on this everyone can go can i, can I ask david one more question can I ask just one, one more question of one david? more question 
Okay, David, is chapter 2, verse 17, and chapter 3, verse 4, are those both true? Chapter 2, 17? You shouldn't... You shouldn't need to read them to know if they're true because you believe the Bible's true entirely, or at least just, Genesis is. Because, so, just because I don't know the Bible by heart, I, even though I've reading, Gen I've read Genesis multiple times over the past few uh, weeks. That doesn't mean I don't know the Bible, you know. So, seventeen. Right. Well, I'm saying if you believe that all of Genesis is true, then you should just flatly answer yes. But I'm asking you the question specifically about those two verses. Do you believe that they're both true? Chapter seventeen. Two, uh, seventeen. Were the two seventeen and three four? Yep, and then three four. Read it one second. I'm gonna get some water. I'll be uh, right back. I, I oh, you're I going? No, you don't want to miss this. No, I see what's going on here. Um, yes. I okay, mean, okay, I came back. You're right. I didn't want to miss it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so you I believe mean, those are true? Cool. So for those in the audience paying attention, um. Chapter 217, God says to Adam, uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. The day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then chapter 3, 4, the serpent says to Eve, if you eat of this tree, you will not die. And guess what happens in the story? Spoiler alert, they eat of the tree and they don't die. So that means that in chapter 217, God told the very first lie in all of history. And the serpent corrected God and told the truth and said, you will not die if you eat this fruit. So why did God lie? I'm going to say something. Look, I'm going to leave it there. I like you, Forrest, and I'll still continue to like you. Um, I'm not, this has nothing uh, against you, but I, I see what's going on here and how, the, how different people's minds work. I understand that I'm going to be attacked by the comments because obviously that's how how it works on on any uh biased not you guys but i'm just saying any people who have a bias that's how they work i would love appreciate an but, answer rather than more of the same but no no, no. Um, i am gonna get water i'm just, I'm just not gonna answer <laughs> see you later Erica. okay so look i'm gonna do this on my own i'm gonna make a i'm gonna make a reaction video or whatever to this can i send it to sure you? go and for it i just want an answer though why God told the very first lie. God invented lying, did he not? Okay, I'll, 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 I'll explain it for you. In that, it does not mean that they're going to die immediately. It means that now because... It says, they, uh, in the day that you eat it, you will die. Yes. So yes. On the, within that, 24 that, hours, they will die. Humans were already dying at that time. but they themselves There were only were one immortal. existence. There was only one human in existence at this time. He only made it Adam. Man made it. He had only made Adam. Man already existed. In chapter one, it tells you that man already existed. But then and in then, chapter two, then, it says he made Adam at a different time. And if you're saying this is a retelling of the same story, which is what you've said several times, right. then chapter one shouldn't be relevant. Here he's made Adam, and he Adam is the only human in the world. He has not made women yet. And he tells Adam, if you eat the fruit of this tree, you will die on the same day. So did God not just invent lying in that moment? Ch chapter 127, it says, God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. Again, yep. if you cannot see Wait. the differences in a correct, non-biased manner, then I cannot explain it to you. It's it's just it's hard to get into somebody's head when they're just, they're, when there's like a, 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 a it's like a bystander effect like when nobody nobody wants to be the first one to say oh yeah you're right because that's how it works that's how society works and if you if people step away from that for a second then they can see things from a different light you know but it's fine in this so in chapter years, one verse twenty seven. In chapter 1, verse 27, God created male and female together. You're right. It says that. Yeah. He made men and women together. Then in 2, verse 7, he makes man from the dust of the ground. Then in 17, he tells man, don't eat from the tree. Then in 19, he makes animals. Then in 21 and 22, he makes women. So it's a completely different sequence. If you're saying that they're both true wow. and that number verse number uh, uh, sorry 127 is just a summary of everything that happened in chapter 2, fine. We'll grant that. 
that doesn't answer the question. The pro point here is that he says that if you eat from this tree, you will die the same day. Later in the book, they eat from the tree and they do not die at all. So he lied. That's what I'm driving at. He died later. But they, he did not lie. They do die later. See, that's the thing. Okay, when no, 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 We're done. We're done. We're done. Okay, we're looping again. We're done. I'm not, oh. I'm not willing to loop again, all right? And that was more than one verse that you guys went back and forth on. We're done. Thank you. Okay. Right. It's true. Make your little reaction right, video. Right, well, Goodbye. Here. We look forward to I not watching the reaction video, video, David. I, I'm sorry. I didn't want to take control that much, but... Um, <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> I literally had to ask call. Matt to bring the vape because I was like, I I've heard the same loop, I think, seven <laughs> times now. And I literally do not have the capacity to go through it again sober. So this, here we go. This right here, this right here is different than this over here. See, see, see they're different. You see, is the, the whole thing. <laughs> but they're not because you're biased and you don't have the capacity to understand right. it. And it's not your fault, but it is you're wrong. And it's your correct. Is cloudy, yeah, no. Your mind yeah. is clouded. Okay. I forgot. Well, I forgot how cloudy my mind was. Go to, you fool. Oh, oh, hey, it's that look at that. Here. It's fucking this live yeah. chat. <laughs> okay, Woo! sorry. That's not actually a super chat. That's the one I used to test before the show started. Where? True, though. I love that that was the prediction that was made. <laughs> I know. I know, really. We're being, we're being reined in All right, today, will though. you That's read them off so we don't have to? No. Yeah, will you? No. Aw. That's your job. Oh, it is your job, Forrest. That is true, though. Damn. Twenty dollars from too young to feel this old. Whoever is in charge of the line is genius for having Forrest and Gutsit given all at the same time. Uh, but they've got to do something. To get rid of that Jimmy guy. Love the Pokemon hat. Need more book recommendations. Go fuck yourself. I'm gonna say go fuck yourself, Arden. Today, yeah, we're gonna give that Aww. to her. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's good. that's sweet. Okay, Forrest. Annual book recommendations. What do you got? Oh, flip, dude. Um, I uh, read um, uh, Noam Chomsky on miseducation, anarchist take on the American education system. Cool little, cool little, 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 little flip through there. A tome. Have I recommended that one before? I don't think so. I don't remember. I'm looking at my bookshelf to see if I have anything to recommend. Um, I haven't really had a lot of time to read. Uh, read them. Um... Mm. The War on Science, I guess, by Otto. Yeah, I, I have read that. that one. That's a good one. That's a good uh, one. Read, read Fires in the Bathroom, uh, Advice for Teachers from High School Students. And these are from uh, 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 troubled youths uh, reminding uh, teachers to uh, not treat them like fucking kids, even though they are literally kids. Give them respect and dignity. Read Shubin's Some Assembly Required. Read Once Upon a Time When We Were Colored by Clifton Talbert. Uh, uh, a really shocking tale of uh, growing up in a racist society. Um, it's a beautiful, he really gorgeous the way he talks about his mm -hmm. home. It's this beautiful, picturesque, amazing uh, uh, place growing up in, 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 in the country. Um, and then you'll notice these little little things woven in there were like and there was this we went to the bakery with the beautiful smell of freshly baked bread and the sun shining and the white baker was very careful not to touch my father's hands while handing him the loaf and then oh. and that's just thrown in there and it's it hits you weird when it's like contrasted to everything else he's saying great book hell Going yeah for that different shelves today yeah no you're you're doing way better uh, than me i don't um have I recommended Bitch before? I feel like I recommended that last time by Lucy Cook. Recommend it again. It's called Bitch on the Female of the Species. It's about um, female mm. choice in um, sexual selection, uh, mammals and other animals that have female dominance hierarchies and female coalition formations. Uh, basically, it's, it's by a zoologist who notices that uh, females have been downplayed traditionally in having agency as far as evolution within populations goes and uh, it's pretty interesting and cool read uh read on tyranny by timothy snyder it's a tiny little mm. pocket book you can fit and you can hang out with this one uh it's a great little little guy uh, i love chapter one do not obey in advance 
Love that. Do not give away your freedom. Most of the power of authoritarianism is freely given. In times like these, individuals think ahead about what a more repressive government will want, and then they offer themselves without being asked. A citizen who adapts in this way is teaching power what it can do. Love that. Testing Sorry, the boundary. Wait, what's happening right now? We just stopped doing super chats and I started no doing idea. book recommendations. I have no idea. I'm no like, idea. what the fuck is happening? Uh, Pardon, they asked for the book recommendations. It, oh. This is on. This is above board. Okay. This is above board. Okay, but how many book deep are we going? What? I mean, I was just going to keep going until Forrest ran out. <laughs> I think I think we're just kind like of like getting a bunch of them out of the way now. We're getting a bunch <laughs> out of the way now so that we don't have to worry about it later. Uh, five pounds yeah, sure. from Sean Isherwood. <laughs> yeah, next time a book recommendation comes up, we'll just like scroll back to, you know, However, the two sure. and a half, three, I guess, three and a half hours into the stream and watch that. Um, Why do I feel like you? I just know you don't have that kind of discretion for it. I know you're you're not going to be uh, able to stop yourself and I'll egg you on. I will. I like to pretend. See, that's <laughs> like exactly to why I'm I had cool. to intervene. No problem. Bye. <laughs> uh, Five dollars from Sean Isherwood. Last time, Forrest claimed uh, any number of natu natural number appears in expansion of pi. This uh, property is believed to be true, but so far is only conjecture. Well, I mean, fuck, dude. Like it, it, it is an infinitely repeating number. I guess it, it wouldn't be accurate to say two point seven appears anywhere in pi. It, it would have to be a string of numbers of rational numbers without a decimal between them, and then. You could say that, but like it because it is infinite, um, it is kind of and, and infinite and non-repeating. It's kind of necessary, you know. It's 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 it's, it's so you can argue, oh, well, we haven't found this one yet. We will, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's kind Sean of the nature of the thing in its existence. So just what? test it. Just I said, Sean can just test it. Just keep going until you don't find the one you're looking for. <laughs> Yeah. Just keep going. Uh, It'll be fine. $20 from a margin. Two of my favorite people love your content and love seeing you here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. $10 from Barbara Mitchell. She didn't say anything, um, so I'm going to say something I'm for her. Forrest's hair looks great today. Thank you so much, Barbara. I appreciate that. I, I thought this said $10 from Barbara, and it was just like Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara like, sent ten dollars to say Mitchell. Shout out Mitchell! <laughs> thank you, thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Five dollars from Melissa Wynn. Um, my uh, the discussion on skeletons had me wondering about distinguishing between human and Vulcan skeletons. Ears are soft mm -hmm. tissue. Klingons, on the other hand, right, right. I wonder what the physiological differences are between humans and Vulcans, besides the it's, ears it's and brains. It's weird that all the all of the species in the galaxy keep evolving the exact human body plan, complete with five fingers, two eyes. It's mm -hmm. it's fascinating. Isn't it? And just uh, weird prosthetics. It's very all of these creatures <laughs> keep evolving strange face shapes that can easily be plastered onto a human. Um, Arden Hart, uh, what? So, oh, someone tagged sorry, Arden. Sorry, What's no, this was a um, like membership super chat. And our system oh. doesn't detect it, so I had them send it again Ooh. so I could get it in. So thank you, you can Arden. Ignore well, I'm, the still Arden going to, I'm still not going to answer this question. I'm directing it to you, Arden. What is the best evidence for evolution? I used to think the fossil record was uh, the best, but it is not. I found if you guys can make up uh, top five or ten of best evidence, Arden, floor is yours. So I can't because um, this is not an area where I'm educated at all, but there's this really cool uh, YouTuber, Forrest Valkai. Oh, and Guts of Gibbon. No, well, yeah, you guys should check bullshit. them out. Bullshit. I bet you they can give you, you the info you need. We, we've been friends for months, and you haven't, like, absorbed any of the g g genetics? I, uh, uh, convergent evolution? No. <laughs> well, fuck, no. man. I feel, I feel ignored now. The next up gonna be in your town i'm not gonna say exactly when but i'm visiting you guys soonly and i'm gonna bring you a present i don't know i'll bring you some llama bones or something so you can look at them and think about evolution and 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 and, and whatnot okay. the, the next I'll time you have the question will be like llama bones those are the best evidence for <laughs> yeah there you go 
You need a thing. You need a thing to lock the knowledge into your brain. Uh, yeah, there I'd say uh, uh, best evidence. Um, the best evidence, in my opinion, is observed evolution in the lab and in the field. Look up the lizards of Padmakaru and look up uh, the, 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 the Harvard experiment where they showed bacterial evolution across that giant fucking antibiotic plate. Um, look up the the cell uh, the multicellular evolution that we just posted here in the chat. Those are all all great. Things. I'll go ahead and post some. Oh my god, I'm so burpish right now. I'll post some links really quick while you're if you're doing one too. No, yeah, I mean, I'm gonna try to use some restraint here. Um, the best evidence for evolution. I mean, you say you don't like the fossil record. I think the fossil record is quite nice, but the the fossil record what makes it so good in my opinion is that it's usually preceded by some kind of prediction of what we will find and then it's the predictions that come to fruition so in that way the fossil record is quite nice uh, but the best support in my opinion is the fact that we see nested hierarchies in functional and non-functional dna dna excuse me within genetics so all organisms create nested hierarchies with their genomes in um su successively you know more distant relationships as you move away from closer organisms so like humans are most closely related to chimpanzees and chimpanzees to humans and then the pair of us is most closely related to gorillas and then this trio to orangutans then the group of us to gibbons then that group to old world monkeys and so on and so forth until eventually you've backed all the way up into all eukaryotes as as a you know, domain of life and the cool thing about this is that this nested hierarchy exists not only in functional regions of the dna but also non-functional regions of the dna so the the heritability that goes down this lineage all the way to a last universal common ancestor exists in the dna that does things in the dna that does nothing at all and uh that that is unnecessary like that that's just like a, a classic calling card for evolution um you could talk about <clears throat> excuse me you could talk about specifics in the fossil record that um, were predictions that came to fruition, like I mentioned earlier, with things like Tiktaalik, with Neil Shubin and the work that he did there. You could talk about geology and how the fossil record spans it and how you can create predictions about that that then also come to fruition, like things about paleo environments or mass extinctions, et cetera, et cetera. You could use homology, you could use convergent evolution, you could talk about, as Forrest said, evolution in real time, in the lab, or in nature. Um, just I think a better question might be like, what, what, what's possibly standing against it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my two cents. I'm going to go ahead and post a few links. Here's some cool stuff uh, that you can click on and learn some stuff about evolution. This is the, I put the lizards in here. I put the big mega plate experiment in here. I, I relinked the, 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 the link for the, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, Multicellular uh, uh, evolution, um, and I, yeah, that's, that's all in there. I, put, I just put like four different things in there. So look all those and and, and check those out. It kind of reminds me what you were describing. It reminds me of um, when it Tobler's or Tobler's uh, first law of geography. Everything is related to everything. More close things are more closely related, or something something like that. Yeah. Um, well, everything yeah, I mean is related to everything. When things are closer, they're more related, or something. I forgot how exactly you phrased it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it might be like a superposition thing, but like, you know, it in, in genetics, it, you're basically creating a family tree, but instead of looking at members of your family, like you and your sister being more closely related than you and your cousin being more closely related than, you know, you, your cousin and your great, great third uncle or something like that, uh, you're looking at species. Right. And progressively, as you move up that family tree, um, things converge on one another until at last you have a last universal common ancestor. And there is no breaking point. There is no line that you can draw, genetically speaking, and say evolution cannot cross this. So, you know, it's I find that to be ridiculously compelling. Yeah. As someone in the chat, I don't know if they were serious or not, but they put Dr. Eric uh, or Dr. Kent Hovind would disagree. I would disagree that <laughs> Dr. Kent Hovind has a doctorate. Um, uh, $20 from Larry Fishman. What? Do you really believe that a dog could grow to be the size of Texas? <laughs> what are you talking about, Kent? <laughs> Kent, Patriot oh, the mighty Patriot University. The prestigious Patriot University, home of the $20 doctorate. Uh, uh, twenty dollars from from Larry Fishman. Uh, I'm early in uh, male to female transition. Congratulations! Uh, I can guarantee my skeleton will confuse future archaeologists, mostly because I'm having my body fed through a wood chipper and me mulch used to grow marijuana and other psychoactive plants. You got a dream, and I can't fault you for it. I love that. 
ten dollars yeah, from Woodwinds stars. Rock, right? Reach for the stars or the mulch dirt, as it were. Um, I can't give as much as I'm uh, saving to leave Oklahoma for somewhere better. Congratulations <laughs> on getting the fuck out of. We have a saying here in Oklahoma: "It's I got to get the fuck out of Oklahoma." We all learn in school. Um, Forrest gets it, I'm sure. Yes, I do. Just want to say, I heart you both. Never stop sharing your passion for science. Don't worry. I we literally can't. It's a compulsion that Try burns inside our skulls. <laughs> Twenty dollars from Freddie Four Fingers. I have a friend that told me he questions evolution because he has Rh negative blood, and that means he can't be descendant of a rhesus monkey. Have you ever heard this before? I think uh, uh, me thinks he bought into some BS. Yeah, um, it rhesus factor doesn't literally mean you came from a rhesus monkey. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it it definitely does not. But like, have you noticed how often we get asked the, the RH negative blood question? This shows up all the time. I think the that's time. the next. I think that's the next big creationist talking point. I think that's one that maybe is circling the rounds right now, and uh, it, it people think it's hard hitting. It's weird because it it comes from the ancient alien circles. Like, I, I don't. It's really? a weird one for creationists to co opt, but. Um, yeah, no, there's there's actually a ton of work on the evolution of RH negative blood. I mentioned this last time, but you can just hop on Google Scholar and put in evolution of RH negative blood and you're going to get uh, plenty of papers. And I would put them in the chat, but all I would be doing is exactly that. So I, I would yeah. recommend that your friend yeah. check that out and also remind them that, no, you you don't descend from any <laughs> any circopith that is alive today. Not, not, um, not anything anybody is saying. Uh, ten dollars in James call. The change makes it great. I learned a sliding filament hypothesis for muscles, and the silver fox experiment uh, results was due to linked genes. Those are both cool fucking things, dude. Heck yeah, dude. That's um, oh. the fox thing is fascinating. Like how domestic traits that we like in domestic animals seem to be like linked together in such a way that if you select for one, you necessarily select for the others. So cute. So you end up with floppy ears and little wagging tails and all the canids. I love it. Five pounds from Mystic Mind Analysis. Apparently, there's a new nonsense conspiracy theory that the scientific consensus is bought out to support transgenderism for money. Who's making money? <laughs> or have, you, have you received your check from transgenderism yet? Because I've not gotten my big transgenderism <laughs> check. Transgenderism, <Yeah>. transgenderism <laughs> Incorporated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, you're right. Less than 1% of the population, they invented a whole new kind of science and a whole new kind of medicine to appeal They're to them. Uh, and that's why, you know, because it's so small... That's why we have to put the, the transes into the children's cartoon to make the kids gay by eating rainbow yeah. marshmallows and Lucky Charms and watching and you know, SpongeBob, I guess. A, a notoriously wealthy and overprivileged group, the, 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 the transgender folks. The transgender. Well, actually, <laughs> interestingly Wait. enough, this conspiracy theory is actually like pretty well established in the gender critical community. And it's pretty much anti-Semitic in its roots. Like they suggest like transgenderism is basically invented by these few billionaires who also all happen to be Jewish, but it's not anti-Semitic at all. Or totally not neo-Nazis, but also what? it's because of the two. Yeah. What, it's what always the same thing, thing whenever why, there's, whenever it's a global conspiracy it? thing, whenever it's a global conspiracy yeah. thing, a group of billionaires, control of the media, lizard people, it always links back to Nazis. It always does. <laughs> and what's like what kills me about all of this is it's the same thing with like the crazy ancient aliens, you know, ideas, flat earthers, creationists, where it's like, what's the end game here? What's the evil plot? Why are Jewish people trying to infect the, the globe with their, their transgenderism ideology or whatever the hell they well, call right. it? What's the end game? Oh, well, the end game is transhumanism to end the human race and, and supplant them with, you know, modified humans, which. Robots? They, they don't even really make it make sense why that's bad. Like, they basically are like, ah, it's because transhumanism, that's why. But then you're like, but wait, what's actually wrong with transhumanism? Like, if people want to, like, you know, have autonomy to do whatever their bodies that medical science allows them to do, like, why should that be stopped? And they don't have a reason, so. Well, wait, My wait, favorite wait. is when the libertarians come out on it. And 
Wait, they want to bring it in human race but they are human are they or is that are they lizard people that I, are trying to do the humanism what's the i mean they're trying to bring out an evil cabal of of transgender folks to end themselves with transhuman like we're, we're i don't understand this is so it's so that's so the problem. Once you get to that level, it doesn't go any deeper, and then you're just left wondering why, and and just confused at how it all. Yeah, I, it's awful. They're like, you ha- they're like you have a biased perspective. You're not considering. You're not reading it <laughs> right. The right. <laughs> a biased perspective. Oh my god! Uh, Twenty dollars from Strawberry Vein. Christine Jorgensen did a radio interview in 1953. Blonde bombshell. It was like a military person from like the like late 50s early 60s who was trans and got okay. surgery in like sweden or something and then yeah oh. she was like a media personality for a short time wild i, I mean uh, did you ever just, see we were, we were talking about this earlier right like how are things your things are getting worse not better like yes that's correct <laughs> yes yeah. it's not going well right now i'm gonna put a link do a TikTok in the chat. This is from a, a show called The Love Boat. This was in uh, 1982. I, uh, fucking cool ass uh, 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 trans uh, 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 representation in 1982. And it's this fucking just chill ass. Dude. It's, it's, it's a guy who works on a boat. I guess the series was about a boat and uh, like a, a cruise ship. People worked on. I don't know. I've never seen the I show. Know, but this no dude is a. It's called- it's called the Love Boat, and it's about a boat. That's insane, Forrest! Wow, what, Ooh, did, right? what incredible, it's, what destructive <laughs> power do you have? I'm, it's big brain time. I this, <laughs> but this bro's on a boat, and 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 a trans lady's on the boat, and he's like, "Oh, you have the same last name as my roommate Sam," and she's like, it "Comes out, she's like, I actually used to be Sam, and now I'm Janine. I don't know what the names are." Uh, and and he's like, and and she's like, "You're gonna judge me and hate me," and he's like, "Now hold on a minute, you were my friend. I knew you as Sam, and I'm excited to know you as Janine, and I want to get to know you better, and that sounds great." And then the captain of the boat's like, "Oh, these people and their strange weirdness, and we can't provide that," and. And the uh, guy's like, do you have any idea what she had to go through to get to where she is? Not only the medical side of it, but the cultural side of it, everything she's been through to become who she really is. Why well, I'm proud of how brave she is. And this shit's in 1982. And it's like Gilligan's Island looking shit. And I can't wow. wait until the boomers find out that their childhood was woke as fuck. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, it's great. Oh. Yeah, we you know we we hadn't even considered the woke side of things. Clearly, this is the ultimate agenda to bring about uh, like woke Mageddon, and finally, <laughs> finally, everyone right? will be cat, everybody will be cat boys <laughs> at long last. Everybody will be cat boys. That is actually my <laughs> ideal future. Yeah, that's the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, ten dollars from Spaviv Gold. Oh my God! I'm eating all these berries and I'm getting real burpish because I'm talking too loud. Uh, ten dollars oh, from Spaviv Gold and Calf. I almost did. I'm chugging this fucking glass of berries and talking and gulping air a whole bunch. I'm gonna puke on camera. How much would the discovery of lizard people change biology? Uh, significantly. But again, if you, I, I promise you. If you hear people talking about lizard people, even if they don't know it, they are buying into Nazi ideology. Because <laughs> that's what it all I mean, boils like, down to. Like, let's let's take it at face value, right? Like when we say lizard people, because I think I love Spec Evo, I think that's fun. Are we talking about lizard people like Silurian hypothesis lizard people, where like they ev- secretly evolved, you know, during the Cretaceous, and you know they've got these cool big underground cities, and they're like actually just like li- little guys, like little dudes, lizard guys doing their thing? Or are we talking lizard people like evil UFO cabal lizard people joining forces with Jewish people to rule the earth? Lizard people, because one of those is fun and interesting, and one of those is not. <laughs> <laughs> right it reminds me so much whenever these things come up do you know how fucking racist henry ford was did i ever talk to you about no, how racist henry ford is it doesn't surprise me i'll be honest with you for he I, i'll i'll be brief do you did you learn you went to school here in the states yeah yes did you have to learn square dancing in school 
you know, they did they did a line dancing thing and uh, I got out yeah. of it. So they taught it, but I didn't have to learn it because I was clever and smart. The yeah, I, I had to learn square dancing in, in elementary school and, and clearly they had it presented for you. Um, do you ever wonder why you had to everybody has to learn square dancing in, in elementary school? No. It's because it Henry Ford was racist. It's because Henry <laughs> Ford was racist. Henry Ford, the guy who made square dancing. The, so Henry Ford, the guy who made the Model T, was so racist, he believed that jazz music was a Jewish conspiracy to use black people to corrupt white youth. Um, and so he hired Henry Ford, using his wealth, hired songwriters and choreographers to invent square dancing as like the traditional white cultural dance and then lobbied politicians to, with his immense money to make it the official dance of their state. And to this day, over half of the United States, the official state dance is the square dance and you're required to learn it in school in order to protect you from learning how to dance to jazz music and falling to the Jewish conspiracy. To this day, Henry Ford's impressive racism affects our American education system. Um, and also, fun fact, Literally actual Hitler had an actual portrait of Henry Ford on his desk. He was so racist, Hitler idolized him. So, Forrest, this is horrifying. Next, you're going to tell me that that Big Recorder is actually funneling little plastic flutes into our school because actually they're super, they're also super rich. Is, is it just, true? I'm just... Is, 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 is there also a dark past to learning hot cross buns? I am I'm I'm looking it up right now. I've just typed in recorder instrument racist. Weirdest shit I've Googled all day. <laughs> Let's see if, if I can was, find that one. That would be insane. That would absolutely be nuts. Look up uh, on okay. TikTok. There's a guy named Leverett the Baseman, and he has like this whole series about like everything's racist, and he like ties in the fucked up racist history of literally everything. That's where you, I learned about gotta, uh, this shit. Use use your prominent uh, TikTok prowess to reach out to him and and request a recorder episode. Right, right. I asked. I actually offered to get him on this show, but he is a he is a Christian, and I didn't think it would be a good fit for him. But like, his, oh, like he yeah, he yeah. he's hilarious. We are mutuals. He's a great guy. He's got a great channel. We disagree religiously, but like everything else, he I, he's yet to say anything serious that I like seriously disagree. He's a great dude. So look up. It's a uh, lever the bass man. I think I've got his Instagram here. Tell him that I sent you. Go watch his shit. Here's here's his Instagram. And let me see if I can find his TikTok. There we go. I'll put it in the chat. Go, go say hi to Levert and tell him, tell him that I, oh fucking goddamn piece of shit, cunt fuck. Give I gotta fucking make it. I gotta shorten the URL. Hold on, I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll, we'll be right back, folks. Hack the mainframe. There we go. Hack the mainframe. There we go. There's the there's the tiny URL for TikTok. There's that. Go go say hello to Levert and 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 tell him that I, I love him. Let's see here. What's this? Okay. So we've got now uh ten dollars uh from Pit Viper 64. Um there we go. Here's this as well. Click on uh click on that. Uh, $10 from Pit Viper 64. Found out this week that Bible stories make more sense if you rephrase them as Florida Man articles. Uh, I would love to see read the line pod the line podcasts of these kinds of ranty days. Absolutely, we should make a podcast series. What's, the, great. what's the um? What's the one? It's like uh, what would it be if it was Florida Man? It would be like Florida Man uh, bullied by middle schoolers, six privately owned bears on them, killing them instantly. <laughs> Like, isn't that the guy in the Bible? He like he's bald, and they like call him bald, and then a bunch of bears kill the kids. Like, I think someone in Enoch, chat, if um, I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, someone in chat, tell us and make me feel better about yeah. butchering that. Yeah, no, it was, it, I, I'm ninety percent sure it was Enoch and a group of kids made fun of him from being bald. They were like, "Go up, ye bald head!" And he uh, <laughs> he prayed to God, and God sent to uh, a bunch of she bears to murder them. Um, oh, she bears. Oh. Nine ninety nine. Okay. She bears. 
Uh, 999 from Michael Garcia. Is it possible for other life to evolve conscious intelligence like us? Is it possible for life to emerge in the presence of already conscious organisms? Will not, uh, will one not make another possible? Uh, other possible. Uh, yeah, it's possible for consciousness to, or uh, higher intelligence to evolve in other things if there's selection pressure for it. Um, as far as new life beginning, the whole issue with that is that, um, uh, oh, it's, oh, sorry, I thought it was, I, I misread. Is it possible for it to evolve in the presence of other already existing conscious organisms? Eh, maybe. Um, there'd be heavy competition because that, that is a, uh, resource partitioning problem. Um, but like, maybe, big fat maybe. I mean, maybe here, probably knowing humans here, probably not. Like if we saw a chimpanzee, like start to fashion a sharpened rock to a stick, we would probably firebomb the forest. Like it would probably not be very good. But um, perhaps if you had some kind of intelligent life elsewhere evolved that was slightly more passive than humans, I, I don't see why not. Um, as far as is it possible for other life to evolve conscious intelligence like us, I would propose that other life here does have conscious intelligence. It just depends. It's a matter mm -hmm. of degree, not kind. You know, it's not um, right. It's not that humans are categorically different in our intelligence. We've just kind of dialed it up to 11, if that makes sense. The chat is saying it was Elijah, not Enoch, that was, uh, yeah. was being mocked oh. for his baldness. Oh. Yeah. Also, I love this one. <laughs> she bear hashtag feminism. Love that. Um, <laughs> Girl boss. Ten dollars from game. Gatekeep. Girl boss. Mall children. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ten dollars from Game Master Flash. Eric and Forrest forever show. Let's go. Love you both. You beautiful apes. Thank you so much. You. Five dollars from James me. Call for more crayons. You know, I think that's calling back to that um, throwaway line. I read, the, I read the other day, and just as we're we're talking about things that are already kind of racist, evidently, and I don't know when this change occurred. I don't remember it happening, but it's also possible I just had good crayons. Apparently, the uh, the peach colored crayon used to be called flesh color, <laughs> which is just, yeah. Ugh. Ugh, not good. <laughs> I mean, like, rose art. It, what are you doing? And all, if if you remove the skin and you flesh is just like meat that's been like drained yeah. and like half cadaver, inner cadaver. Uh, sure, yeah, you know what I mean. Let's let's normalize renaming crayon colors. Just really disgusting, grotesque, macabre names. Like, I want a red that's just called viscera. <laughs> <laughs> Shit brown. Hell yeah. Uh, oh, God. Sepsis. It's like a green. <laughs> Sepsis. <laughs> Tooth decay. Is <laughs> it like this oh, yellow oh, one? Oh, God. Plaque. Plaque oh, color. Black. Oh, that is vile. Uh, that would be nauseous. And uh, Crayola. Crayola, partner with us. Make disgusting crayons Crayola. for Come biology. On, let's do a I'm looking for sponsors. Just kidding. I'm not. I've got enough VPNs up my ass already. <laughs> I actually, you know what, though? I, I, as far as problematic companies go, I don't think Crayola's on the list. I would be happy. So everybody in the chat, go to Crayola's website, go to the contact section, and tell, send them, Erica and my channel, and say, here's two biologists, and they want to make a gross crayon line. Of gross, gross, gross biology gross. crayons, right? Mm -hmm. Biology, so like, and it'll Tell be all the colors it. of the rainbow. It educational, educational. yes. Educational. Grossology, love kids that. like gross stuff. Grossology. Kids like they gross things. We, we remember grossology. We had grossology. I remember it. Yeah, it was awesome. I did a whole. I used to work at a science museum, and we had this whole where there's a traveling exhibit called grossology, and like there was like yeah. this giant animatronic faucet with snot hanging out and he was like had a cold and he just gave facts about snot and there were like these things you could smell stinky feet and armpits and stuff and learn oh, about bacteria he just loved that shit so crayola if you're watching partner with us and we will work on you get two biologists on your team and 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 we're uh d-list internet celebrities and we will oh, sell maybe crayons you, maybe you. i'm at least i'm at least like a like a like a Q list. I'm a Q lister. I'm almost, I'm almost like a K and maybe I'll rise a little bit. 
<laughs> I'll become right? a P-lister. And we'll make... <laughs> <laughs> and we'll make all the every color of the rainbow into something nasty and you can even put a little thing like on the, a little pamphlet of like biofacts you can put a qr code on there some some augmented reality game that you can download the app and you can mine all of their data and and and, and sell it we all sorts of reasons you can do this it's a great opportunity it'd be, it'd be perfect and you know everybody what, writes what about Crayola. What about like those scent master markets like they have bad stinky smells like the, the yes. scratching yes It'll just yeah. be really gross. It'll be gross. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just the nastiest crayons in the world. And you can freak out all your friends and gross out your parents. It'd be awesome. That's, parents yes, will love that. that's what we should do. Parents will love that. <laughs> uh, you skipped that one. Ten, Go uh, back. We skipped one. one. God damn you. We, yes. $10 Sorry. from Zach. Favorite Pokemon and why? Also, the two of you inspired so much passion for knowledge in me. I'd like to thank you both for that. Thank you for listening and learning. Oh, I appreciate yeah. that. Erica, what's Who's your favorite your Pokemon? Favorite? I was going to ask you. Um, I mean, it's it's tough for me, right? Because like my first my first games were gold and silver. I'm 27, so those were my first games, and so I do have a soft spot for Gen 2. So my favorite in Gen 2 would probably be I don't know Typhlosion. My favorite Gen 3 would be Swampert. I love Swampert, and my favorite Gen 4 is obvious. I like Infernape. I like nice. starter Pokemon. Uh, <laughs> I like starters. Yeah, why not? That's great. Uh, I'm 30, and so I'm all about that Gen 1 life. Um, my favorite oh, yeah. Pokemon is Diglett. Uh, Diglett's the best. Yeah. He's just the best Pokemon, period. Um, I I do love Doduo, uh, and I Doduo. do love Blastoise. Doduo's great. Blastoise is great. Uh, uh, Rhyhorn is pretty cool. Um, I do but like, like Diglett all day long. Yeah, I like Rhyhorn. Diglett all day long. I I got. I Diglett. always catch a Diglett, and I name him Archimedes, um, and that's like my main bro. I usually, I always start with Squirtle, and I've got a Blastoise named Abe Lincoln. That's that's my other main main bro. Um, I usually get a Haunter, and I name him Gene Wilder. Um, and he never becomes I, uh, a Gengar. No, no, never no, no, gets no, 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 Gengar. no. I didn't have friends. I couldn't trade him. Um, that's that's where uh, I was. Well, I didn't have a link cable. I didn't. Those link cables were hard to come by. Um, the the tradable Pokemon were re they really sucked for those of us who didn't have link yeah. cables or friends. <laughs> yeah, or friends. Dude, um, I uh, shit. I was gonna say something. Shoot. I mean, I was gonna say something about Gen One that was. I I have a thing about Gen One. What was I gonna Stop. say? I'm gonna remember it later. Stop just, the just stream. Erica said shit. We can't have that. She said shit. I'm trying now to, the stream's listen, over. Listen. I actually Language. have a horrible I have a horrible sailor's mouth, but I try to I try to not utilize it on on stream. <laughs> Damn it. What was my there I go again. Okay, skip. Just keep going. Yeah. Just keep going. Okay, we'll come back to it. Uh, Ten dollars from Robin Webster. Uh, could some evolutionary changes be responsible for an increase in gender variations on the spectrum, uh, or just more acceptance? Uh, great job, Erica Forrest and Arden. I don't know about evolutionary changes, but I will say that, like you know, there's the the classic what we point to the graph of left-handedness. Um, it tended to dip whenever people were arguing about it, and it became controversial, and then it skyrocketed, and it was accepted, and then it plateaued, and it's been at that plateau ever since. And I anticipate we see the same thing now. You know, uh, 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 non-binary gender um, and gender nonconformity um, has been controversial for a little while now. It's becoming more controversial. It's becoming more dangerous to be trans or non-binary um, as we have an, a rise in fascism. Um, and so I expect to see a dip, and then as we reach acceptance, See a skyrocket in the plateau, just like we did with gay marriage. You know, we saw this, uh, you know, a lot of people trying to get married, and then we had a controversy where it kind of became an issue. See a big skyrocket in, in, in same-sex marriage, and now we see a plateau where it's just, it's a thing that can happen. Um, and so it provided the Supreme Court that down too. Um, so yeah, I would say it's probably the probably same, same business. Um, yeah, I don't know about evolutionary I, I pressures on gender, but whatever. I tend to agree with Forrest here, um, primarily because they, I don't think it's been enough time for something to, for that to proliferate evolutionarily speaking. Uh, we are social animals and we, um, we can evolve socially. And I use the term more colloquially when I talk about like social evolution. So it could be like a social evolution thing, uh, where we are, um, just changing our behavior because we're super flexible critters. But as far as like an actual biological basis for it, I just don't think there's been enough time. Um, certainly the fact that 
that uh, gender nonconforming folks have existed since the dawn of recorded history suggests that that variation has always been a natural part uh, of human variation, though. So that is to be appreciated, yep. I think. Yep, yep, absolutely. Uh, remember, trans and non-binary people have always been here. They're just now interesting enough to be a scapegoat for people. And that's they've always been around, though. Um, Ten dollars from Garcia Buckner. Y'all only get one shot at time travel anywhere, anytime, completely safe. Which organism do you wish to see in real life for only 10 minutes at any point in the past, present or future? Um, I would say Homo erectus, because then I can finish this goddamn thesis and move on to my second <laughs> master's. That's that. Yeah, I'll be, be done real quick. <laughs> yeah, this is an easy one for me as well. I, I want to see the uh, Laetoli track makers. I want to see the small family of Australopiths making their way, picking their way across a, an ashen landscape with a male and a female and a little a little tyke, a little youngster following, stepping in the footsteps of his dad. Um, I, I would love or just a, an older male relative. We're not sure. Um, I would love to see mm -hmm. that. I, I imagine it would look quite familiar. Yeah, that sounds really cool. That was really cool. Uh, nine ninety nine from Brian Gack. Uh, I love these shows. I can listen to you two talk about science all day. Thank you. We could as well. That's why we have to work hard to keep the show moving. <laughs> We're really doing our best to keep things concise. This is as good as you, you guys are going to get for brevity. <laughs> this is seriously yep. maximum yep. effort. <laughs> it's so good. Uh, five dollars from Brad Bingham. Erica, please say at least one thing nice about Eric Ho uh, about Ken Tovin. I keep forgetting it. Uh, Ken Tovin exists. I keep saying Eric. Uh, something genuine. I got to go. You two are great monkeys. Oh, easy. I love that he wears Hawaiian shirts all the time. I think it's really funny that Kent is like this older guy and he just wears these Hawaiian shirts so consistently that you can draw any little cartoon character in a Hawaiian shirt. And if you show it to the people in the Young Earth Creationism or uh, Creationism or Skeptic Circle, people will know exactly who it's supposed to represent. And uh, I do think that that is kind of charming. Although all of that quickly flies out the window when you remember he has been convicted for domestic assault and harboring a, um, how do I say this in a way that's not going to get demonetized? Someone who is interested in very young people. So that way we won't demonetize this. Kent Hoven has harbored one of those. So. Yeah. But I like the Hawaiian shirt. Did you see? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did you see he did another whack an atheist about me recently? It was about my, uh, my interview with Seth. Um, yeah. He, uh, so he did one on me a while ago and he was like just begging for a debate. And then he did another one uh, just recently where it was a uh, uh, him about me on uh, well, my first interview with Seth Andrews. Um, and he said, I remember when I debated Seth Andrews and, and, and I tore him apart or whatever. And like, I don't think he ever debated Seth. I think he's making that up. Uh, and then he consistently, he, same thing, just in his desperate quest for relevance, kept fucking saying like, Seth and Forrest, I'll take you both at one time, two against one. You can both go on. I'm calling you out right now. Please, you know, please God, please, please call me. Please, please call me on the channels. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take you on with half my brain tied around my back. Come on down to Dinosaur Adventure Lane. We'll put you <laughs> up. Like, he, he's just, uh, he is incorrigible, isn't he? Um, and actually, he's been yeah. harboring, he's been hanging out on Standing for Truth's channel these days, another Young Earth creationist, because his channel keeps getting <laughs> striked off of YouTube. So, <laughs> very funny Yo, stuff. I'm I glad mean, to fuck, see man. that he's actually up with him. When you hang out with fucking Matt Powell and put him up as the main guy on your platform, and that guy is literally calling for genocide against all LGBT people, he says that all LGBT people should be put to death. Like, fucking, come on, you have a fucking genocidal maniac as your front man. Like, I've ended business relationships for significantly, I've ended profitable business relationships because i found somebody was like in a domestic violence issue one time and i don't want to be associated with you because you hit somebody i'm not going to be involved with you like and this guy has this fucking dude up here saying we should kill all the gays and he's like yeah, this, Wait, this guy is great he really represents our organization like you don't have to say it you associated with this guy on purpose you support it tacitly fuck off <laughs> like it's oh my god yeah. 
It's the thing is, is that it's like Kent is genuinely like a cartoon villain. Like he only associates with Matt Powell because he's hoping that Matt Powell will like be his weird successor or something like that. Or he likes having like someone to boss around. It's I don't. Weird. I don't. I don't even know. I, like, I mean, gosh, there's so many weird rumors about Kent Hoban on the internet. But like, I don't even know if Kent. Like, I don't even know if Kent cares about like lgbtq people at all like i don't even think he has feel strongly one way or another i think he does what he does because he's trying to garner attention um and i think he's a yeah. psychopath like yeah. the guys like not a psychopath i think he's genuinely sociopathic like i don't think he's capable of, yeah. of be yeah. feeling a lot of empathy for other people uh as emphasized by his reaction when that young child drowned at his concrete illegal illicit theme park um yeah yeah kent, kent belongs in jail <laughs> kent should kent should be in jail it's it's wild to me and like that that like it really does seem to always boil down to what attention he can garner and like the yeah, fact I'm that he has you know I, I think you're right i think the reason why he keeps matt powell around is not necessarily that he agrees with him it's that his asshole is cavernous enough that he can get his whole hand up there to control him and 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 you know have him as a, a mouthpiece that he can then draw more attention back to him he's an internet troll with way more steps and i just i'm not that's why I'm not debating the guy. I don't. I don't want to fucking no, don't, put my don't, don't face towards his quest for relevance. You know what I mean? Don't do it. I when you know I debated Kent Hovind, and I did it when I was a very young YouTube channel, and I was like, I, I naively thought, well, if I, maybe I'll be the one to reach Kent Hovind. Um, I'll so be I, the I, one. I yeah. Like, um, It'll be me. I'm the chosen one. Um, and you know, it, <laughs> the thing about Kent is like, I, I would never associate, I didn't, he hadn't either. I'm sure he had done those illicit things at that point, but they weren't public and I didn't know about them other, but I wouldn't appear in the same venue with Kent because of what it would do. Like it be literally being near him would be like getting a permanent oil on your skin that you can never get off. I mean, the guy is just, yeah. Grimy. I wouldn't do it. Um, and I wouldn't recommend it either just because like if he'll only debate on S Donnie standing for truth channel anyways, and I wouldn't give him free views either. Um, it's just a whole right. mess. All those yeah. guys. It's funny, right? Like you get like a young earth creationist and like 90, probably 7% out of, <laughs> out of the time. Uh, they've also got some other horrible bigoted <laughs> perspectives, uh, that make appearing with them at all. Um, all a liability to be honest. Yeah. Well, that, that's the thing is like, you know, standing to truth wrote to me not too long ago. They sent me an email asking me to come and do and they're like, I can debate whatever as a channel. It's like, I'm not, I'm not interested in using my hard work of building my credibility to then draw views to you. Even if people are coming over to watch me mop the floor with you, I'm still using my name to give you money and I'm not interested. Yeah. And like, that's well, why, you know, no, no matter how, how much Kent Hoven continues to, his 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 tactics of you know whatever insulting me or anything like or or trying to call me out. I'm not gonna take criticism from somebody that I wouldn't take advice from. Like I'm not. It's not yeah, gonna no, do anything. It's all bait, honestly. All of it is bait. Like they just yeah. they want to pull it, as many big names as possible over to that sort of sphere. To and they don't care. This is the thing about Kent. Kent does not care if he loses. I mean, I don't know if he knows no. he's losing or not. I think he probably has an inkling when he's just absolutely been steamrolled. Uh, but he doesn't care because attention is attention. Um, and Donnie doesn't yep. care either. So it's it's lit. It, honestly, I really use your views. Unless, yeah, unless you win it. There's there's a, a friend of mine, Ian, who has debated uh, Kent a couple of times, and he uses it completely as a platform to go on there and ask Kent about his numerous crimes, which I think is the only acceptable reason to debate Kent Hope <laughs> at this point. I'm going to have to look that up. That's great. It's That's really fantastic. funny. It's very funny. Uh, $5 from Brad Bingham. Forrest, uh, name your favorite paradox if you have one. Sorry, Erica, for the other super chat. It's rather difficult. I don't know what other super chat. It would have been a long either. time. Or was it, it was, the last one? It was the last one. Yeah, about Ken Hoven. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, that is, uh, that was really hard. That was really hard. Uh, see, at least favorite... I had the blind shirts. If, he, if we didn't have the shirts, I would be up a creek. <laughs> right. My favorite paradox is uh, uh, Zeno's paradoxes, where he talks about, like, if I fire an arrow at a tree or something, Right, the distance between here and the tree is a set amount of distance, and it takes a set amount of time to get there. I can divide that in half. 
that's a set, half the distance, half the time, it is still a number. And I can divide that in half. Half the distance, half the time, it is still a number. And I can divide that in half and that in half and that in half. I can do this an infinite amount of times. And even though these numbers are infinitesimally small, they are still real positive integers of distance and time. Therefore, neither, you know, no motion can exist and no time can pass because there's always half of that time and half of that distance that exists. There's no way to travel any distance. There's no way for that to happen in time or in space because there's an infinite amount of time and space between any two events, between any two objects, um, because you can always keep dividing it and getting a positive integer. That's you know gross, I mean? Forrest. That makes my head hurt. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Pass. I'm good. I'm good. Five dollars from Alex. That's gross. Five dollars from Alex Williams. Really appreciate you both. Please keep creating content. Just because you asked, we will. Thank you, Alex Williams. I was going to quit um, personally. Right. <laughs> this was it for me. Uh, no, seriously, though, thank you very much. We appreciate the shout out and the kind words. Um, uh, $13.99 in fake money from uh, uh, Fort Gary Brewery. Uh, thanks for the I Think shirt. Hey, uh, it's amazing and everyone should buy one. I agree. You can get one at ValkyLabs.com. Um, Forrest, you mentioned brain differences between genders. Could you expand further on this? Um, how this is or is not problematic. So like it is problematic insofar as like when people talk about like boy brains and girl brains, they often go down this bullshit sexist route of like women's brains just work different and have different capabilities. And it's like, no, but, um, uh, when we talk about like gender as it plays out in the brain, we do see some things there. Um, and this is a, a, a bit of controversy right now in terms of me personally. Um, so I'm going to put another YouTube link in here. This is Robert Sapolsky, who's a neuroendocrinologist at Stanford, talking about gender differences in the brain um, and how trans people have neural architecture that aligns with their gender identities. Uh, Sapolsky brain gender. Let's pull that up here. Um, and when here's I'm going to put a couple of them here. Um, so here's two different links. Um, and there's, you know, uh, uh, some some people on Twitter that are trying to debunk everything I say about trans folks. One of them has a master's of science in neuroscience um, who says that Sapolsky here is wrong because he's uh, not taking into account uh you know, the, the fact that some of these things become sexually dimorphic well after puberty or well into adulthood and not taking into account the effects of hormone therapy and what they might have and things like that. And I don't have a master's in neuroscience. I have a few undergrad classes in neuroscience and I specialize a different way. So I have no way of really, I'm, I could read this literature. I wouldn't be as good as somebody who, who has this education. So I'm interested in what these people have to say. But at the end of the day, if I had to pick one to believe, um, Stanford PhD biologist, longtime professor, here's another one. Yeah, I've recommended this book a million times, Evolution's Rainbow by Joan Roughgarden. Joan Roughgarden is another biologist from Stanford who says the same things. Um, you know, these are people who've been in this industry for a little bit longer than this guy who's a, a, a master of science. So like, I, I, I say this to say like, you know, this, this person, I'm not going to shout them out or anything. I'm not trying to draw any heat their way. Um, I am interested in their arguments and what they have to say. I take them seriously and I will investigate them further and learn about them. But like, as far as like what I know about it, these are the professors that I learned from as well as the professors in my undergrad training that I'd said the same things. If all of them are wrong, it's news to me. If you know something that they don't, awesome. I, if, if, if that's the way the evidence points, then it does. And I will learn and I'll, I'll adjust. But I'm going to wait for a few more reliable sources than one dude on Twitter for the time being. Um, so just, just suspending, suspending my belief for just a minute. I'm going to maintain disbelief until I have a little bit more evidence, a little bit more reliable source, or until I myself gain the education to really tackle that myself. There's a reason why I don't sit here and give long lectures about neuroscience beyond just regurgitating the shit that I learned in, in undergrad and grad courses, um, gra undergrad courses about neuroscience and grad courses that are directly are kind of tangentially aligned. Um, so yeah, that's, those are some things you can look up to. Um, 499 
from I Got the Blues. I'm, I hope you feel better. Yay, science. Thank you both for today's lesson. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. Woohoo. Um, uh, $10 from, I'm going to say it wrong. Is it, is, is it the double L making a Y sound? Is it Yewellen? Y- y- Yewellen? Y- Yewellen? Do Kante? I'm not going to say it right, but I like your avatar. Little profile picture there. It's a rainbow hearts, and I love them. And they make me smile. Cute. It's very sweet. Cute. Um, ten dollars from Nipocrates. Uh, love both of you two, but not in that way. Tehe, uh, Tehe made it sound like it was in that way, and that's ooh, that's something weird there. Uh, uh, keep up the great work. We will. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Me, me teleports behind you. Nothing personal, kid. Pulls out my katana. <laughs> <laughs> Your katana. Since we're doing, since we're doing uwu, um, since we're doing our uwu whatever copy pastas right um uh five dollars from chris p uh for forest professor day say that uh, gender is a biological construct not a social one yeah i so i still haven't watched professor dave's thing on on gender i i just haven't gotten around to it again can't stress enough i have nothing against professor dave i genuinely don't know anything about him i've never watched this stuff not because i don't think he's cool i just don't have time and so um, I haven't, got, have, haven't had the time to get into a new thing right now. I'm sure I will. He seems great. And I've heard nothing but good things about him. Um, I follow him on Twitter. And I like many of his posts because he's a, a, a very he's a dick to all sorts of anti-vaxxers. And it makes me smile. So, like, I, I, he seems like a great guy. Um, but if I remember right from what I've heard about the thing that he said was that, like, he called gender a biological construct, but, like, gender identity was the social construct and it sounds an awful lot like he's saying the exact same thing just with slightly different language than the textbooks that i learned from so like you know if if he's talking about gender in terms of like brain architecture and like how it, it it plays out in your head and he's saying that's biological i could get behind that i could i could vibe with that um but I don't honestly know if that's what he means or not and i'm not gonna not gonna go any further because i don't fucking know what to say (laughs) Uh, ten dollars from um, uh, William Moore sent you an email relaying who slash when the kerfuffle about transgender started. Uh, to Erica and the line. Sorry, do not for his email address. Ooh, an email. Uh, yeah, an email about when yeah. transgender kerfuffle started. The kerfuffle is a reference to something that happened with the ACA. I don't know why anyone needs to be emailed about that, but I. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, nah, it's that was a shitty and unpleasant situation that was handled as poorly as possible, and like, it's it is what it is now. I don't know anything. About, uh, I yeah. don't know anything about any of this. I'll read the email when uh, once we're off the off the line I'll, here. I'll See. I'll I'll fill you in after the show. I don't oh, think it's yeah. worth bringing up now. It's it just a bunch of people made a bunch of errors, mainly seemingly because of like some hierarchical nonsense and a bunch of egos, and then we all moved on, and so like are kind of just seeing what goes next. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. After that. Uh twenty dollar from Northern Spike uh is the marbled crayfish that is parthenogenic, a new species. Depends on who you ask. I don't know what that is. I've never heard of that before. But like it, it depends I mean, on who you it, ask. Yeah, I mean if it's if it's parthenogenic, perhaps. I mean, <clears throat> if it's parthenogenic, I don't know. If something becomes parthenogenic, does it become reproductively is it considered reproductively isolated? It's basically reproducing. I don't know how it could be anything else. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know. know how it could be anything else. Really, really that's actually isolated. really good question. I have no idea if, if that if a transition of parthenogenesis counts as isolation. So maybe good question, Ordered Spike. I've yeah. literally never considered yeah. that before. I will <laughs> look up that thing and then think about it thoroughly. Uh, the squirrel nest HH sent four ninety nine to say I see so many species referred to by the ECU, but never squirrels. What's up with that? Well, it's the simple fact that squirrels are gross. Next question. Yeah, I'm not a big squirrel fan, but I do. What I do like is tree shrews. Those guys I like, hey. but squirrels not so much. Squirrels are very dumb where I live. They run in front of my car. I, and I, I genuinely squirt. like for real. I don't have a problem with squirrels. I like squirrels. Uh, I just never think to bring them up because they're not the most interesting animal, as far as I'm concerned. But that's just my preference. I'm sure that there's some young mammologist out there. 
or, or, or some uh, woodland ecologist or some rodentologist uh, that, that, that digs them and wants to talk about them. Uh, I'm pretty sure that their courtship rituals involve chasing each other and you have to be able to catch up to the female in order to, to mate with her. And that's why they're so fast because they have like a sexual selection situation going on for like chasing each other. Neato bandito. That's a, a thing that I heard from an exterminator of all people taught me that. <laughs> and I don't know if it's oh true. That's, that's so tragic. It's directly related to their line of work, taking squirrels out. Right. I, there's the um, there's the cool thing with the speciation along the Grand Canyon as well, with the, the squirrel species on either side of the canyon being reproductively isolated from one another. So squirrels are cool. Squirrels are yeah. neat. Do, I feel bad about what I said about the squirrels earlier. I, I like squirrels okay too. They're not they're not bad. I just they're not my favorite, you know. Cyber yeah, yeah, That's what sure. they are, right? Something like that. They're cyber Ignathic. It's hell on me. I don't know. Whatever. Maybe I don't know. That's it's been a long time, whatever. man. Nineteen ninety nine from mad, R Banks Five. Now I don't like them. Get <laughs> right. Fuck you, squirrels. Uh, holy crap, I caught the deem tr dream team live. Uh, can you explain why there's so much genetic difference across Africa for Homo sapiens uh, than for the population of left Africa? It's because of a bottleneck event uh, uh, around 7,000 years ago, wasn't it? Uh, significantly reduced the numbers outside of Africa, reduced the human population down to like a few thousand. Um, those that stayed within Africa had much more genetic diversity. Um, and as far as I remember, we still don't know why that happened for sure. But it did. Uh, yeah, the population. I, uh, so honestly, my understanding of it is that there wasn't even like it wasn't an event in the sense that like, you know, previously they proposed like it was like the Toba eruption. Uh, my my understanding is that currently we think it, it was literally just a series of founder effects. So, you know, you have a population that's yeah. in Africa that has generated a ton of genetic diversity just through accumulating mutations and variation, blah, 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 blah. And then, of course, one of the many mechanisms of evolution is genetic drift. So little populations, you know, plink off, as I said earlier, from this parent population and go found new areas that have considerably less genetic diversity. And overall, the human population experience is a bottleneck um, that, that reduces the diversity um, in, in the grand scheme of things. That's my understanding. So I, I don't know if that's consensus, but that's what I thought the most recent thinking was. Just but I don't know. Up, there's like 29 Super Chats left. Fucking shit, so, dude. So um, go, so go <laughs> We're going. Yeah. We need to go fast. Ten dollars from Ericopedia. Forest sex and sensibility is already a perfect video. I don't care about the sound of the arm fuzz. I'll definitely watch the reboot, but the original will always be the best, like Robocop. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. It could definitely be better, in my opinion. 99 from Emerald City Witch. What are your opinions on hum human interference and keeping animals from going extinct? I.e. pandas would have died off to do us. Poor choices have died. Uh, so, um, a couple things is like whenever you do like reconstruction of ecology, you have to think about what are we going back to? Are we going back to right before humans got there? Or are we going back to, you know, a couple thousand years before that, before like human influence as a whole got there? Or are we going back to several thousand years before that when like it was a completely different ecosystem? And also what are the ramifications of that? Um, the reason why we saved lions is because they thought lions were cool, but cheetahs are also in decline mainly because lions fucking kill cheetahs. And so when we were like, lions are cute, we'll save the lions. We are devastating cheetah populations. And like, that's a trade-off that we have to take into account when we're like, but we like lions. What, do you not like cheetahs? Of course we like cheetahs, but you can't have both. So um, yeah, like it's, uh, it, I, I do think it's important that we protect and conserve ecosystems. I think that's really important. Um, I don't think it's important or a good idea for us to interfere with ecosystems in order to make them the way that we like them. That can be a problem. But like I, conservation I think, as terms of just getting the fuck out of the way, that's huge. Yeah, I, I think it's dependent too, like with regard to the pandas. I don't think pandas would be in the situation that they were in just a short time ago if it weren't for human interaction anyways. I mean, pandas are ridiculous, but they wouldn't be in trouble if humans weren't kind of decimating their habitat. Um, they're, they're just a very weird animal that has managed to survive on a weirdly specialistic, but all, on a weirdly specialist, I guess I should say, on a weirdly specialist, uh, but simultaneously kind of horrible for them diet. So I, I, I tend to agree with Forrest on one hand where it's like, yeah, I, I think that we, we intervene where we have been the problem. But at the same time, 
I really want there to be mammoths on the Mongolian steppes again. <laughs> selfishly, selfishly, I want that. So whether or not that's a good idea, I don't know. Uh, but I think conservation, as as Forrest said there, um, when we are the problem, rewilding is a great idea. Um, and I think mm. it, it's all about finding a, a balance and, and really making sure you do your due diligence when you're reintroducing a species to an area, like they did with the mm. wolves at Yellowstone, which went absolutely swimmingly and was great. So. Yeah. Uh, four ninety nine from Claire, Erica, Jimmy, and Matt. Uh, would you uh, would have a lot to say about you being supported, uh, supposedly being resident agnostic fence sitter? Oh, so Erica, Jimmy, and Matt would have a lot to say about you being the resident agnostic oh, yeah. fence sitter. I see. Oh, I know they would. They they'd probably bust my chops for it, but that's okay. I listen. My my perfect defense. It's unbeatable. I've never been roasted for it. Is IDK. I literally just I don't know. Right. Like if I, I, this is why I like science because it's so concrete and I'm perfectly comfortable being like, I don't know. I don't know. So yeah. that's my, it, it, that's my, it also, uh, my, from, from what I've heard from you, heart. right. It, it, it like, we also, I also try to draw the line when people say about atheism versus agnosticism. Atheism is just, I don't believe in a God. Gnosticism is knowledge. So like you can be an agnostic atheist or you can be a Gnostic atheist. I know for sure there isn't a God and that also requires evidence. So from what I'm hearing from you, it sounds like you're in the agnostic atheist camp. I don't believe it, but I could be wrong. I'm waiting to hear it. Wait, you know, just tell me what you think. Show, sh show me the evidence. And I'm pretty sure that's where all of us would lie as well. We may be shittier yeah. about it than you are, but like... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically exactly it. I mean, if I, I'm open to the idea, I haven't seen anything that has convinced me yet, but that doesn't mean I won't. Uh, so that's that's where I'm at. Um, so ro roast mm. me, bust me yeah. for it. <laughs> uh, $10 from Cody Lee. My friend asked me why they were all, uh, uh, we are the only creatures as smart as we are and able to build like us. All I had for him was we won. Uh, what should I say? <laughs> Love you, Forrest and Erica. You're both so smart. Don't let us fool you. Uh, and go fuck yourself, Jimmy. Go fuck yourself, Arden. I said, we're training them all Ooh. to Arden. It's Arden's, Arden's doing okay. the thing. Um, uh, and by wait, the way, wait, in wait, case I you didn't to... see it. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll answer that first and then I'll say the thing. Okay. Okay, quick thing. Uh, what I would say to that is ask your friend, like, because usually, you know, we hear this a lot. It's like humans can build skyscrapers and space shuttles and chimpanzees can't. Okay, do it then. Do it. You, yeah. the person who's saying that, go go build a skyscraper or, or a space shuttle. Go do it. Because the answer isn't that humans are cognitively, like, incredibly superior to the hominins that came before us. It's that we have the cultural, like, knowledge already at our fingertips like newton newton did uh physics and einstein did relativity because einstein had regular physics to build off of we stand on the shoulders of giants right. so i guarantee you you could take any rando including your friend and drop them on a desert island and leave them and when aliens come and find their skeleton they would conclude they were a hapless hunter gatherer from you know five hundred thousand years ago uh, because all they would find is, yep. is stone tools. In fact, they would think that they were like earlier than any hunter gatherer that we know of because their stone tools would be so shitty. <laughs> yeah, man, that's that's the whole thing is like, yeah, humans in terms of like we won. I think that's a fine way to say it. We are the species that survived all the other hominins. But uh, yeah, it's, it's just that was selection pressure. And we did it as a society. We figured it out together because we had like communal learning and generational knowledge being passed down. Um, yep. Uh, Arden uh, just posted, by the way, in case you don't see it in the chat, that we are raising the super chat minimum to ten dollars. That's for us to read it. You can send in whatever you like, but in order to have your chat read on the uh, anyone who has already sent in a super chat up to this point, we're still going to read it as if whatever. But mm -hmm. new chats coming in from now on, ten dollars instead of five is a new minimum, uh, and that's simply because we already we have like several dozen left, and we've already been here for yeah. several hours, and we got to keep moving. So it's not that we don't want your money. Dear God, we want your money. But in terms of like the time that we have, uh, we need to make sure we're using it effectively for everybody. Um, and, and we've got lives and whatnot. So if you'd like to send us something, $10 is a new minimum. Yeah, uh, that and- I hear Arden. Um, just also, I want to iterate that like eight minutes ago, I told you guys you had 29 left and currently you have 31 left. So like that, that's the state yeah. that we're in. So we definitely got to like what, actually yeah. get through these. We're not, sorry that's, Arden. That's exactly why. It's like didn't. honestly, Nobody and it's because it. you Modding people out there are forever. sick, and you'll keep us Modding here all forever. night answering your questions. Um, we will. Right. 
send your send your no. chat. And and you know what? If we keep going and like an hour later we're still getting ten dollar super chats, we'll raise it again. And eventually we'll only take hundred dollar questions and we'll just keep answering them all night long. Uh $4.99 from Sarah Christine. Love you both. Your content means so much to so many. But Erica, did Lee Berger ever say what the two bigger uh, HN surprises were? I couldn't find it. I don't know what the HN surprises are. Yeah, I'm I'm a little salty about this. So you remember first when uh, Berger talked about the Homo Naledi utilizing fire, and then he was like, this isn't even the oh. biggest surprise. The biggest surprise is coming, and then we just haven't heard since then. Mm. No, uh, Sarah Christine, he is not, and I suspect it's because he just published his book with uh, John Hawks called Cave of Bones, and I would wager that hints, if not the surprises themselves, are in there, and my guess is symbolism based off of the cover, uh, that Homo Naledi was capable of symbolism. Whether or not that will bear out, we will see. Right on, right on. Uh, $20 from Randy Clark. Erica, what's your opinion of Dr. Uh, Harari's book, Sapiens? Oh, that one over there. Um, yeah. yeah, Sapiens. I thought it was a good thumbnail for a human history. Uh, love some of it, dislike other parts of it. Um, the, the early stuff I found particularly interesting. My favorite thing, my favorite takeaway from it is the idea that the agricultural revolution was like the biggest con, like a giant mistake in human um, ingenuity, which kind of makes sense. If you look at the actual energy budget for hunter gatherers in the modern day versus pastoralists and uh, agriculturalists, hunter gatherers actually kind of have it figured out. They get to spend most of their time hanging out with their friends and bonding with family. And they don't actually have to spend all that much time uh, acquiring sustenance because they're really really good at it and um they kind of have, have it mastered once you become sedentary not only do you open yourself up to having your stuff stolen by people who know where you are uh, but you also risk especially for for um for women you risk being separated from your family and you kind of lose the the kinship networks that maintained egalitarian lifestyles and hunter-gatherer groups and that's ultimately how we get if Ferrari is correct here, and if others who have built upon it are correct, uh, early forms of uh, uh, gender disequilibrium or sex disequilibrium and gender disequilibrium amongst um, uh, power, and you get patriarchy, as it were. Um, so, interesting stuff. That sounds an awful lot like Marxist theory. Um, uh oh. 1990, uh -oh. right? There's a reason why Marxist archaeology is so controversial and also so fucking cool. Um, Nineteen, uh, $99.99 from Kabeen. Kabeen, uh, I love it when you two are on. I learn so much despite not understanding 85% of the words you say. That's how I feel anytime I listen to uh, like Naomi talking because Naomi is a computer science uh, major. I don't know shit about it. And like, it's so yeah. cool when she talks, but I don't know what the fuck she's saying. Um, I'm not sure who's producing tonight. It's Arden. So I'll just say, I love you, Arden. There you go. And go fuck yourself, Jimmy. It's all the love to Arden tonight. Uh, $10 from uh, Slackback. Does anyone else in the scientific community suspect that the controlled use of fire may have occurred earlier than current evidence shows? I'm curious if it's possible Australopithecus used fire. So the they would, like, it's possible, but there's a huge amount of evidence missing there, and it's like a million years worth of missing evidence. Um, if I remember correctly, the earliest, like, evidence of controlled fire goes back almost a million years around a million years and the earliest evidence of cooking is like eight hundred thousand years so like also yeah. almost a million there's so like, there's some really there's some controversial stuff that'll push it back further for homo erectus and fire use like not quite two million but closer to that i think it's like one eight or something like that but it is super controversial mm -hmm. because how do you tell the difference between controlled fire and like you know, wildfire burns and, uh, you know, harnessing, yeah. uh, harvesting fire briefly and like all this kind of stuff. Um, it, it's hard to tell. That being said, um, it would not surprise me if given a time machine, we went back in time and, and found that some early, you know, genus homo member or or perhaps even an australopith like picked up a fiery stick and burnt something and was like, damn, that's pretty cool. And then it went out and they didn't know yeah. how to make it again. Um, because almost certainly harvesting mm. fire came before learning how to make it yourself. So we'll I don't know though. We'll see. Yep. Uh definitely. It's it, it, it's it's just, I don't know, man. It's one of those things where like I think it would be really fucking cool uh if it can go back that far, but um I, I'm not going to believe you until you give me a ton of conclusive shit. Because you know, it's a, a million and a half years of nothing. Nine ninety nine from Eric Mork. Um, I just got here and I'm so sorry if this has already been mentioned, but Erica got the swag today. Love it. Uh, and Forrest got that, uh, though. 
don't know what that is. Um, and finally, uh, go forth and effeth thyself, Jimmy, or Arden in this case. What's what's the pho? The pho. I don't know. All I know is I was accused of having drip, and I'm I'm glad that I'm glad someone has finally noticed. <laughs> I'm finally getting the credit I deserve for my t-shirts and hats. Uh, $10 from Jason Jack to say absolutely nothing, but thank you so much for the $10. I will enjoy all of those $10. Um, the $10 again from Ericopedia. I was thinking about calling with a legit question about ERVs, but what's happening mm -hmm. with David is way better. I'll call some other time. Hey! We love, yeah, man. We love a good time. Retrovirus conversation and endogenous retroviruses are cool. Call back and we'll talk about them next time because I I don't think I can limit sure. myself here and I know Arden is sleepy. <laughs> we'll talk about placentas and where they come from. It'll be dope. Um, ten dollars. Uh, send your super chats to keep Arden sleepy. Um, ten dollars from Della Luna. I was wondering what you think about universe before a universe. Roger Penrose seemed to think the Big Bang was the end of the previous universe and the beginning of the current. Thanks for the show. Um, yeah, if we had like a big bang, big crunch situation, if we were in a closed universe where we had like the repeating cyclical cycle that Erica was talking about earlier, maybe, uh, the only, uh, physicist who I've read anything on it, it was Lawrence Krauss's A Universe from Nothing, where he, he seemed to say mathematically speaking, that doesn't make any sense. I don't know enough cosmology or astrophysics to say he's wrong. Um, and I'm also My not reading any more books about it at this moment. So like, yeah, me, who knows? me, me either. my understanding is that Penrose, because of exactly what Forrest is talking about, had to tweak his idea of a cyclic universe. And that's where like brain or membrane cosmology comes from. Uh, it's different. It's yep. not the same as a single universe, big, big banging and big crunching, but there's still a cyclical nature to it. Um, I like it. I think it's romantic, but I, I also don't know enough yeah. about physics to, to say if it has any yeah. merit. Um, I do know that one thing that Penrose has in his favor is uh, Hawking radiation, evidently. Um, he he suspected that given the nature of black holes, if universes are, are sort of collapsing and creating uh, themselves again, as it were, um, black holes, large enough black holes would leave traces of themselves, almost like echoes of a previous universe. And mm -hmm. Penrose proposes that Hawking radiation is that. But again, I'm a big dumb when it comes to physics. I hear that and I'm like, Hmm, that sounds cool and reasonable, but I, you know, I don't know. I mean, Lauren Cross is saying it isn't. Who am I to say? Who am I to say? You know, who is who is right here? I don't know. I just like the idea, so I, I'm not saying I buy it. Right. I'm saying it would be cool if it's the case. It'd be super neat. It'd be super neat. Uh, Ten Australian dollars from Hillhugger. Hi, Forrest and Erica. Great stream. At any time during your science education, were you made aware of the concepts of bias and paradigms? Very yes. Very Constantly. yes. Um. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a whole thing. Is like whenever you're talking about the history of science, um, like we talked about Piltdown Man earlier. Why was it that so many early anthropologists were willing to believe that Piltdown Man made any fucking sense because they were trapped in the heuristics of their narrow little worldview and they had to break out of that? Um, uh, it, it also, you know, we just just a minute ago we referenced Marxist theory. Um, Marxist theory was like straight up banned from archaeological thought for a long time you weren't allowed to bring that shit up because it went against you know the the paradigm uh, that we were in and it's still controversial to this day the fact that feminist theory in archaeology was a shockingly new development in the past like 50 years we realized that women have existed this whole time and they've done stuff and that's crazy um bro that is so nuts. like that is Crazy women, femoids right. in my archaeology, the duplicitous femoid uh, in my early society. That's crazy. But like, yeah, like the that's absolutely the case, and like that's why you know I always talk about in in archaeology and anthropology. It was started by literally Victorian men with literally Victorian ideals. When you talk about early, um, uh, uh, it, it, we talk about biology in, in Darwin's time. They still believed in the great chain of being. Creationism was the doctrine of science. Um, and, and Darwin was, you know, a geologist who then became a biologist because of his discoveries. Um, and even geology was a revolutionary thing. The discovery of fossils going back as far back as the 1600s changed everything we thought we knew about everything when we realized these tongue stones are actually shark's teeth. Um, and so like, yeah, there that's that's like yeah. 
very, 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 very often in science education, especially in higher science education, you were reminded constantly the reason why this was thought to be the case was because these people were trapped in this line of thinking. It's your job to challenge your line of thinking and seeing if this new thing actually holds up. Um, and that's that's a huge part of it. And that plays back into the recurring theme of this whole thing. We keep talking about sex and gender and stuff. The reason why there are real actual scientists out there that are are, are saying this stuff is all made up, liberal nonsense from the the the, the you know, space Jews or whatever, is because of the exact same reason that there are real actual scientists out there that are creationists. And there are real actual scientists out there that are flat earthers. It's because they're trapped in their own heuristics and, and they're not challenging themselves in the way that, that we think they should. And they would say the same thing about us. Um, and so it's it just a matter of like where collectively we can go. Um, yeah, anyway, I go on that all day. $20 from Northern Spike. Does it say the earth is flat in the Old Testament? Uh, the book that says it, therefore it's true. Um, I'm pretty sure it like there's some stuff about like the earth having four corners and having pillars yeah. and like yeah. being having a line like a like a, a, a there's a level across it or something like that and therefore it's flat. I if you talk to a Bible literalist who is a round earther, they will tell you that it's all contextual and it you have to draw the meaning from it. But also there are plenty of flat earthers that maintain their belief because the Bible. The same way they as, also, you know, you have the people, what's that? The, the, the Hebrew cosmology is, I mean, this is like the ancient Near East cosmology. Like this wasn't just the Hebrews. This was like basically every guy that was <laughs> alive in the ancient Near East at that time. And not only did they believe that the earth was fat, flat and held up on the pillars of the earth, but they believed that it was encased, you know, you had the firmament, right? So this big dome. glass dome. Yeah. Yeah, with the firmament present, you know, and the word for the firmament there is rakia, which means like set in steel or hard metal or something like that. So like they they did believe that this yeah. stuff was that the cosmology was solid and and kind of knowable, not the globe globe Earth classic heliocentric cosmology that we understand today. Um, but yeah, like right. as Forrest said, if you're a young Earth creationist, you'll be like all of the Bible is literal except those parts. So. <laughs> Yep. Those parts are, and it's, parts it's are the same right. thing. It's the same thing as today when we, when somebody calls in and says the Bible is only good, and we immediately bring up Exodus where it tells you how to own slaves, and they're like, "Well, you know, it's all you know, you're not reading it right, and it means this, and it means that, and it's actually these reasons." Okay, but also the slavers back in the day used the same Bible and had a very different meaning of it. So if you can read this book and get two very different meanings. Maybe the problem's the book, you know what I mean? Like that's oh. Uh. Also, to <laughs> Emery King in the comments and the chat here said the only book Forrest won't recommend is the Bible. I get the joke you're making, but also legit, everybody should read the Bible. It'll make you a better atheist. Um, you'll learn more about why it's wrong. Ten it's pounds from Sean Isherwood. Book. It's interesting. Yeah, well, it's an it's, interesting yeah. book. You get a ton of insight into from how a, people during that time lived and what they thought. So that's dope. Yeah. If you want to understand most early English literature, you should understand the Bible. Like it, the Bible as literature, super important if you want to understand that kind of thing. Yeah. Fascinating. Just don't take it seriously is all. Um, $10 from Sean Isherwood. The number 0 0.21s. Oh, this is, this I know what you say. The number 0. Yeah, uh, point two ones, three zeros, four ones, etc. is infinite, doesn't repeat, but it can contain, doesn't contain two. Uh, the property in pi is conjecture. If you can prove it to be two, you'll be the very famous Google it. Yeah, I, uh, I, I would say again, just like that's the nature of infinity. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to prove it. Uh, look up number file. They're, they're, they're mathematicians. Maybe they have something on it. $10 from Rob <laughs> Irwin. Um, Jimmy, you know, Arden, sometimes these forest and gut sick given casts uh, so long. Arden, oh, that should, oh, I'm sorry. Jimmy, you know, Arden, sometimes these forest and gut sick given casts go long. Arden, oh, yeah, that should be okay. Jimmy, thanks so much. Jimmy off the phone. Ha ha ha. That's the, I, I, I get the vig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get the whole vibe. 
true. That was my Arden impression, by the that way. Was <laughs> spot on. That was, couldn't have. That was I, sounded funny. just like. I her. couldn't have done it better. It was so. Good. I thought she was talking just, just then. I thought she was jumping in and it reading. Was perfect. Yeah, I, I was. I was genuinely stunned. <laughs> so stupid. Uh, uh, thirteen ninety nine in Canadian dollars from Kathleen Moncrief. Um, throwing some of the sweet cash from Big Gender TM your way. Thank you so much. I see you also Finally. got your trans checks. That's why they're called fun transfers. See trans in there? Transfer? Oh, yes, it's oh, no. oh my God. Yeah. If you've ever used a bank, you're funding the transes. They've got you. They've um, got you in their clutches. Uh, twenty dollars from Corey Williamson regarding Paul's question on human speciation. How can we know we haven't speciated through time from our very old ancestors? Surely, new mutations could make us incompatible with them, despite our global presence. Uh, you should talk to a paleoanthropologist that likes to separate between like uh, uh, archaic Homo or uh, archaic Homo sapiens okay. versus modern Homo sapiens, because there's definitely phenotypic differences. But are there genetic differences significant enough to make a species? Depends on who you ask. Uh, so what yeah, are, no, that's what, are, the, yeah. what are genetic differences big enough to make a species too? Like what what counts? What what yeah. counts is a genetic difference big enough to make a species? Um, and I would point them to the different mm -hmm. like the, the compatibility of humans and Neanderthals. We are interfertile and very very similar. And at the same time, yep. no one would pick up a Neanderthal skull and be like, "Hoo hoo, this is clearly Homo sapiens." It, it's just it, it, that yep. was messy. It's not easy. Uh, five dollars from James Call. Silver Fox Lynx gene was wrong. Differential migration of Neurocrest ectoderm is the far the current explanation, as far as I know. Um, I don't know anything beyond what I read about that experiment in the Greatest Show on Earth. Um, so like, if there's something more to it that I don't remember, then like, I'm not there. I didn't know this either. This sounds cool, though. I'd like to look into it. I'm uh, the last I'd heard it was okay. Lynx genes, but it's been some time as well, so. I'll chew on it someday. Uh, nine ninety nine from Claire. I'm addicted to complaining about my parents in chats. We argued yesterday about trans people. They won't call because they have no desire to ask questions or debate, and don't care what trans people say because they're crazy. Um, they sound like well balanced, rational people who often uh, engage in intellectual discourse because that's how we think. You you just don't talk to people because they're crazy. And you don't have discussions because you don't want to have discussions. That's how you learn. Really well adjusted. You love to see it. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear about your circumstance. Uh, pen send pen, oh pen, eleven Pennsylvania dollars from uh, Ren Piero one. Uh, is the pinky finger really going to disappear in the future? Um, I use mine to type and play games on PC all the time. Could PC gamers seem to be? I don't think that's reasonable. Um, your pinky finger is the main source of your grip strength. Um, uh, the, this this whole side here. Notice how big and thick that muscle is. You need that guy. Um, so I don't you think that's heard, going anywhere. You might have heard the pinky toe is disappearing. And um, also, no, you need that to balance yeah. quite a bit as well. Yeah, super important little bits of you. Keep them. Little tiny. Keep yep. them. Uh, yeah. ten dollars from Ericopedia, Crayola Black Pile. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. Dude, yellow bile, like the in the middle of your gut, is I think actually the worst smell in the world. Uh, because I, like I can, I can tell you for it, a fact it is because remember I told you my dog threw up this morning and there was a yeah. lot of bile. It like it was it was so bad i mean i used to work i used to work at a vet clinic and when i worked there we would take care of puppies with parvo and i thought that was the worst smell until i smelled my dog's uh, yellow bile vomit because she vomited up a sock so it was like from the middle of her gut it was bad it was so bad oh that's a hard time yeah uh was, my dad had a uh uh ostomy bag going on uh, towards the end of his life mm -hmm. he had the, the this cut open in the middle of his gut and had to dump that out and so this is mid gut oh. yellow bile coming in there because you you have bile coating inside your stomach. For those who don't know, you have bile coating inside your stomach to prevent your stomach from digesting itself. It starts green, and then as it transverses your gut, it turns yellow, and then it turns brown. And when you poop it out, you poop brown. Um, you the do. yellow in the middle of your gut there is the where it's like half fermented, half shit. Um, and 
what's crazy about it, the reason why I think it's the worst smell is because it is half digested food that's almost poop. It mm-hmm. smells like everything. And when you yeah. smell it, it smells horrible. And then for the rest of like the year, every time you smell anything else, it smells a little bit like yellow bile. And like you can't you can't escape it forever. And like it just you have to just forget eventually over the course of months, you'll slowly forget. Um, but it is it sticks with you. It's a wild experience. Um Zero out of ten. Do not recommend. Yeah, I don't um, like that for it. Five, I don't like that at all. <laughs> it's a bad time. Five dollars from TV Goat. Thank you so much for being a tuberculosis goat. I don't know what it means. <laughs> Thank you for five dollars, though. Don't forget, if you're watching, this is an old chat. The chat limit now is five. Uh, ten dollars to have your chat read. Um, ten dollars from Strawberry Vein. And guys, I own a nail polish and makeup brand. Uh, called the Velvet Hexagon. I will literally do weird colors to collab with you guys. Please send us an email. We'll look into it someday. Yeah, I can't make any promises, grow. but my that inbox is now. open. I the, the it's gonna the answer is gonna be probably not anytime soon. But if it's compelling enough, I'll see. I want to see the email. I want to see the offer. I might. Be I, I, I also might would like to see. Yeah. <laughs> Send me the links. Send me the links to your website, to your brand. Let's talk about your numbers for the past year and see if it would be something that we could actually do and it would be feasible. And if we can do it for charity, especially, I'm into it. Um, Nine dollars ninety nine cents from Jessica M. Forrest and Erica all night long. Uh, I always feel a tiny bit smarter. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Heck yes. <laughs> Uh, $10 from Ericopedia. Kent Hovind's motivation is money. For sure. For sure. Ken, Kent Hovind is like a, a giant bigoted Mr. Krabs, but he's also like a criminal. That's that's what he's like. Did you, uh, did anybody see that clip where he said that all Chinese people look alike? Everybody should go <laughs> look that clip up. Kent. Ken Hovind, dude. You cannot. Arden just texted me and said that we only have 15 left. So if you want to contribute to making Arden sleepy, we're raising the chat limit to $20. Send them in and keep Arden sleepy. She will stay tired. Uh, $10 from... Right. She Make sure that Arden doesn't get any sleep. Um, Leave Matt cold and lonely as Arden hunches over like a hungover vulture over the computer all night long. Typing away. And we, and we slowly get richer. $10 but from even, Ericopedia. So eventually, the lim- the, eventually the limit is going to be like, call in with $15,000 to keep Arden awake. <laughs> and it's just... And it's like the the Russian sleep experiment. It's just been like seven days. <laughs> She's exhausted. <laughs> Did you ever watch Price Master on on YouTube? No. It so sounds, everybody, I'm everybody, well. do this. Go to the YouTube that you're already on. Look up after the show's over. Look up Price Master. I'll, I'll put the link in here. Look up the fucking Price Master. It's like a whole thirty minute thing, but there's a like a two minute clip that'll give you the whole gist of it. Um. Here it is, Price Master. <laughs> um, this is this clip from like, uh, it's from 2001. I just put it in there. And it's like this garage sale, and there's just all this shit out. And then there's like this stage, and on the stage is like this guy in like big red pantaloons with like a ski mask and like a pantalone mask, like a, a Commedia del art mask in gold. And he's like wearing this jacket and he's got like this microphone. And he's just standing up there like this and people come up and they're like, how much for this stereo? And the guy you're like, price master, how much for this stereo? And the price master, the guy on stage leads and he goes, 17 thousand dollars <laughs> <And> like, <laughs> then, just, then they're like i won't pay that i'll give you like 15 bucks for it and he's like 15 million dollars <laughs> and he just keeps going up and it's just so stupid up and, up and there's and like up. this weird music 
everyone go watch Price Master. It's fucking hilarious. Um, like early surreal on YouTube. I love it. It's so good. Ten dollars from Ericopedia. Standing for truth's motivation is also money. I'm giving my money to you. See above all these super chats. If you if you keep bringing him up as I did way too many times, we will summon him and he will show up here and irritate everyone. So don't don't bring him up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for giving us all of your disposable income, Ericopedia. We appreciate it. Five dollars from James Call, Valkai Razor. I won't take criticism from someone I wouldn't take a compliment from. <laughs> yeah, as uh, I, I, I won't take criticism from somebody that I wouldn't take advice from. That is the Valkai Razor. I love that. <laughs> somebody put that shit on a T-shirt. I own a merch store. I'm not going to put it on a T-shirt. That seems incredibly vain to put it on my own merch. But somebody else no, make one of those it. things. <laughs> Valkai's razor. Definitely, Don't take criticism definitely. from those you wouldn't take advice from. Just do it anyways. Uh, uh, right. 279 uh P Wiggles. Is it pesos? Is it is it I don't know what it They're is. Philippine pesos. They're mm. Filipino pesos. All right. Um uh from Alhino Lambino. Uh my dream someday is to make four a four X game a, a la civilization, starting from protocell, and perhaps the end goal is to venture out into the cosmos. What materials do you recommend that I need to check? Um oh, oh, fuck, boy, dude. boy do I boy do I have some disappointing news for you. Someone attempted this and it was not good, so you should definitely make your game and make it 20,000 times better because spore made everyone sad. So do a do a spore but good. Do spore but good. For do sure. spore but good. Just do it but good. Spore was like spore is like amazing island meets meets, you know, like like the sims. It was interesting. <laughs> The spore creature creator is so fun, and almost everything else wasn't. Um, I, I do like the creature <laughs> stage. I like stage two. Uh, that was the fun stage, and then the rest sucked. But I, just me. I remember forward. just. I remember hanging out with the creature creator for fucking hours on end, just making different stuff. It was radical. Yeah. The creature creator was dope. Um, okay, someone already said avoid making spore again. Beautiful. True. <laughs> yes, true chat. Very, very correct. Very good opinion. Pick up, uh, pick up any cool like like the ancestors' tale or something that like details out uh, evolutionary biology. Because if you're wanting to do something where you can really play with it, get the trends down. But then also, fuck man, I bet you anything. If you write to some some like cool biology professors at universities, they'd love the opportunity to do this as like a science communication thing. You could even maybe get a grant, yeah. like get a fucking NSF yeah. grant to make a fun game. Find a um find a PDF of any of Dougal Dixon stuff too. He was a big Spec Evo guy, and Dougal Dixon is a crazy person. His Spec Evo is nuts. I love it. I my dream is to one day own a copy of Man After Man, but my husband did buy me After Man, which is the, the early version of that. And his Spec Evo stuff is just a blast. And that I think it's must read for anybody who's doing like evolution anything because he takes it to such fun places. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, four ninety nine from Sarah Wilson. Uh, to add to the squirrel hate, one time when I was a kid, a squirrel in the trees beat on my dad and then threw acorns at him. Hey. Oh, God. You can't do that. That's my dad. Oh, so specific. I got like, <laughs> it immediately jumped into like the game grumps where they're like, it's my dad. <laughs> my dad <laughs> says I'm great and he's right because he's my dad. Uh, fucking. I don't know if anybody else watches Game Grumps as much as I do, but I fucking I watch them every day, and like it, it's oh my god, the the amount of times they link back to just like using dads as humor. Fucking like this song, of fucking I'm gonna fuck your dad. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, Five dollars from skeptics and scoundrels. You and your primate of choice have to team up to survive the zombie apocalypse. You may arm and train it however you wish. Which do you choose? Hmm. Dude. My name is Gutsy Gibbon. I'm picking a Gibbon. I don't even care if we die right away. I want a Gibbon trained to fight side by side with me. That would be the cutest mm -hmm. thing ever. Their long arms would give them impeccable reach with any kind of of, of bladed weapon as well. Uh, this is just a this is an easy pick. Uh, and I would the specific Gibbon would probably be uh, I got to go with the classic a Lar Gibbon or maybe even a Simang. It's it's difficult to choose, but I, I love them both, and uh, that's my pick. 
I'm tied between orangutan because they're big and they're strong. And then I'm thinking the, the thick fur would protect them from bites a little bit. You know what I mean? That's probably Because I don't want it. Like I was, my original thought was like, oh, I'd just get like a big ass silverback and he'd smush everything. But then if that thing gets bitten, I don't want to have to fight it, you know? And so like, this is, if this is a good point. Yeah. And so like, I'm thinking like maybe orangutan, but also I could be totally into like, like black and white roughed lemur. You know what I'm saying? Oh my like they, God. They get the, oh my God. the agility. They'd be all so over. They'd cute. be able to get stuff for me. They'd be so helpful. They'd be very, very, very fucking cool. That would be adorable. If we can do extinct, it would also be funny to have like a gigantopithecus, like <laughs> big, big yeah. man. That would be great. Amber is listening and she just texted, I thought you'd pick me. <laughs> She's, <laughs> you're right, babe. You're the primate I choose. <laughs> Sure, 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 babe. Of course, it's like me I wasn't, shoving my. I wasn't out of thinking the outside the box. I wasn't thinking outside I, the box, and I should have been. I um, I considered picking my husband, and then I didn't because he would be offended if I didn't pick the Gibbon for both of us. He would be upset by that. He's also a Gibbon. <laughs> this is, I'm doing this for us, babe. Five. Five dollars from Strawberry Vane. Shout out to Dapper Dinosaur. Let's get him to ten k by the end of the month. I have never seen Dapper Dinosaur stuff, but I've heard lots of good things. So if if oh, yeah, if he's cool, that. then hell yeah. Dapper and if he's not, then Dapper fuck that guy. I'm I'm glad he's not doing. That. Dapper is awesome. I will vouch for him. Please uh, go sub to Dapper Dinosaur. He is trying to get by ten k by the end of the month, and he's an awesome guy. Hell yeah! I'm looking him up. Um, 999 from Enoch Siebert. Absolutely love this duo as a former Christian turned atheist. Uh, I'm so glad. Um, one of my goals in life is to be more like Forrest. I don't recommend that. Mm -hmm. And one question for both of you. What is the secret to happiness? Uh, mine's going to be real poetic and dumb. So you go first. But mine is also poetic and dumb, but I will go first. I, I would say, enjoy the little things. Take, take moments to appreciate the moments in life that you are you have shared with every other every other living critter that's that's ever managed to uh to survive on this planet when you feel the warm sun on your skin or you know the the the, the warmth of the um of the pavement underneath your feet or the feeling of grass between your toes or a good meal or getting cozy before you go to sleep or getting warm after you've been cold for a while or in the feeling of embracing someone you care about or the look in your dog's eyes or your cat's eyes when you haven't seen them all day all of these little things at least to me when i experience them i try to take stock and think about how lucky i am to to be here at all for one but to be here uh with with all of this so that's that's how i stay happy but mine's mine's a little yeah. bit of a goober mode too no that's fine uh yeah. i would say something similar i think that um when you chase after the the moment that you start to chase after happiness you've immediately already stumbled past it um you are where you are right now you have the ability to be happy and like, if you're constantly thinking, once I do that, I'll be happy. Once I get that, I'll be happy. Once I get there, I'll be happy. You're never going to be happy. Um, happiness is right there where you're at. And I think the idea of enjoying the little things is great. Just remember, you know, as every time you check to make sure you're happy, you're not being happy. And that's something I struggle with a lot. I used to struggle with a lot more. Um, I would all, always constantly be like checking myself to make sure I was feeling emotions the right way. Am I happy enough in this moment when I'm supposed to be? How am I supposed to be feeling right now? Am I expressing that properly? Am I experiencing that properly? And in all that time that I'm doing that, I'm not actually just enjoying the moment. And so like, sometimes like, you know, I'm really cold and uncomfortable. How awesome that I get to experience being cold and how awesome that I'm so comfortable most of the time that I'm able to understand and appreciate not being comfortable. I'm sad. I've had a bad day. How lucky for me that I get the opportunity to experience this sadness. That means I must have a lot of happiness as well. And that doesn't take away from the sadness. I don't have to stop being sad because of it. I get to experience this emotion. And that in itself is worth celebrating. And eventually I will have the ability to do so. I'll, I'm going to deal with this sadness right now. Pretty soon I'll be right on back to, to this other thing and I'll be able to enjoy the next thing. Just, you know, I, 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 not to parrot too hardly what you said, but just like life is fucking awesome all the time. I, I, every, every day that you're alive, you get to experience this weird little world and 
it's not always fun and it sucks sometimes and it hurts sometimes. And you can get into the, the, the philosophy of like grief is the opposite side of love, two sides of the same yeah. coin. I feel all this love. So therefore when I lose that love, I will feel the grief. Happiness okay. is just the other side of sadness. I'll feel that. Um, uh, pride is just the other side of shame. How like all these emotions are actually one thing. And there is no picture perfect, beautiful romance of happy ever after movie style shit. And how wonderful, because how boring would that fucking be? Um, yeah, just where you are right now and, and what you're doing right now. I guarantee there's a reason to be to smile and a reason to celebrate. Um, so give yourself permission to do so, and and if, don't try to chase after that feeling. If things suck, I would take a moment to consider like the the, the earth is always changing, life is always changing around us. So the conditions won't last forever. You'll you'll get the opportunity to to improve your situation. And the flip side of that, as Forrest said, is when things are going really well, enjoy that too, because nothing lasts forever. And there's there's a beauty oh. there's a beauty to the temporary nature of that, I think. Uh anyways. Yep. It's like that old Chinese parable of like the the uh guy's horse runs away and and uh, everyone's like, that's terrible. And he's like, No, it's not. You don't know what's going to happen next. And then the horse comes back with like several other horses wild that it found in a little herd. Now this guy's got a bunch of horses. Everyone's like, amazing. That's great. And the guy's like, no, it's not. You don't know what's going to happen next. And then the son is taming the horses and he falls off and breaks his leg. And everyone goes, that's terrible. And he's like, you don't know what's going to happen next. And then the, yep. the draft comes along. There's a war breaks out and the son doesn't get conscripted because he's got a broken leg and he gets to stay home and not die at war. Amazing. No, you don't, you don't know what's going to happen next. And it's just on and on and on. Every good thing has a bad thing attached to it. Every bad thing has a good thing attached to it. And just life is what life is. And you just got to be here for the ride. And, and how fucking great, how lucky you are that you get to experience the ride. It's pretty dope, dude. It's pretty sweet. It's pretty epic, I would say. Pretty fucking tight. It's pretty. It's pretty rad. <laughs> Arden is like, oh my god! Can we Hurry please, up. please move on. I'm trying to go to bed. <laughs> Just waxing poetic about <laughs> Chinese proverbs. <laughs> Sorry, Send Arden. your twenty dollars so super chats. Right? Send your $20 super chats and we will tell more parables and keep hard and awake. I've got great stories up in here. I, I, I learned so many cool ones. I'll tell you the story about the donkey in the well. Send your $20 super I, chat. I'll tell you the story of the donkey in the well. It'll change your life. Changed mine. I did, I did speech meet in middle school and I still remember those Aesop's fables, baby. We could go all night long <laughs> telling stupid little Teaching stories. you fucking life lessons and shit learning the value of patience and all the virtues that uh that a greek man came up with thousands of years ago it could, could be fun <laughs> i love it next super chat isn't isn't this the next one the last one was like about finding hap oh no you're right this is the finding happiness my oh, bad we just talked about happiness. <laughs> Five dollars from Emery King. Just joined. I had to work, but glad I can count on Erica and Forrest to keep going. Just for me to join at the end. Gefuck yourself, Jimmy. Like, I don't know what that no. is. I'm, 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 I'm guessing the fear. Yeah. Is that more no, acronym? That, that's probably right. I think what you did was probably right. It's probably fine. Go fuck <laughs> yourself, Jimmy, Forrest, Erica, and Arden. Maybe. Okay, yeah, that's, that makes more sense. Yeah. Ten dollars from William Moore. Send us more, William Moore. Please give us more money. We're very poor. Ten dollars from Lee of Lee. Uh, Jimmy may get mad like last time, but I don't care. Can you each share three or more books that you love? We already did it. Dude, I, we did. We I we stocked it. up. Okay, now now so I forgive you guys for the book tangent. <laughs> I, I was holding it against you personally, <laughs> but now Neil Shubin. The now, author of Your Inner around. Fish See, also like wrote the, the Universe Within. It's the monkey's paw. It's the monkey's paw. Forrest was ready, though. He was like, yeah, don't, I, I knew he would do this, too. He was like, that way we won't have to do three books later. It was like, no, he'll just do three more books. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll do much more. Here's a theory and reality, which is about the philosophy of science and uh, why have- civil or civil resistance, what everyone needs to know. There's two more. Enjoy those. Ugh, reaching. Oh, God. Okay. I dropped the thing. Ugh. Where are we at? Uh, $10 from William Moore. They did it. Uh, sorry, it was not clear. Nothing to do with ACA, but who slash when the anti-trans people hate showing up with the politicians in public, uh, and with anti-trans, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? What are we saying here? Does this connect to something else? I don't know. I, I guess we'll have to look at the email to find out what William Moore yeah, wants yeah. us to know. We'll, we'll read the, we'll read whatever it was. Ten more dollars from Ericopedia. More money for my favorite people on my favorite channel. Everybody be like Ericopedia, except the threshold is now twenty dollars. <laughs> twenty dollars from Joe White. Hilo, my O step one true science educator pairing. I have three trans mass friends um, that I am aware of. Two of them are I perceive as guys. Uh, one I do not. What's up with that? Maybe you're just, just, your your brain has some shortcuts for, like, whatever you're looking for, and, and it's weird. Just talk to them about the way they feel, try to get more on their level, and, and accept them for who they are, and, uh, maybe your mind will start to, to follow up with that. Um, I have a friend yeah, are- who recently came... Yeah, I have a friend that I've known since high school that recently uh, came out as non-binary, and I knew them as him for their whole life. And so it's difficult for me to remember to use their pronouns properly and to see them any differently than the way that I've seen them for the past almost 30 years. But the more I talk to them about their experiences and who they are and how they feel and how they felt for a long time, the more that works out in my head. So yeah, I would, I would, I would do that. Uh, just, just talk to them more and, and be honest about it and be like, Hey, I, you know, i I'm curious. I'm I'm trying to figure out what's going on, and I I I want to ex- understand this more from your level so that I can see you the way you see you as much as possible, and that's important to me because you're my friend, and I want to make sure that I my perception of you is as close to reality as possible. That might be the way that I would do it. Mm-hmm. True. Uh, nine ninety nine from Sarah Christine. Um, uh, the the the. Uh, what S Milo recently suggested the 12 yeah. homo erectus skulls from Nangdong are actually Denisovans. He makes some pretty compelling arguments using DNA and lack of fossils. What do you guys think? I have no opinion on this because I haven't read it. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I saw this. So Milo, Milo, this is a uh, stuff on Milo, I think. Yeah. He's a YouTuber. He does pale ant stuff. Um, I saw this video. I think it's interesting. I mean, I don't know very much about Denisovans. I tend to focus on like Australopiths or early genus Homo and earlier than that. So like from like Homo habilis earlier, cause I, I like the ape stuff. Uh, but that being said, yeah, I, what I will say about this is that we know Denisovans are really closely related to Neanderthals and a lot of the um, sort of Homo erectus-esque skulls that we have lurking around um, are, are kind of getting close to the derived morphology. I think it's really interesting that we have Denisovans DNA and yet we haven't found any Denisovans fossils. I find that to be very um, curious. I know that the Harbin skull, Dragon Man from a maybe a year or two ago has been bopping around or it's been formally called homo longi but people have suggested that this may actually be denisovans it wouldn't surprise me as my answer but i don't know enough about the characteristics that we're utilizing for um for uh the ngandong uh, material to say i think you could solve this pretty easily try to get some dna you know see if it matches denisovans um but yeah it, it's tough with morphology because of hybridization as well um dicey stuff this is this is why the earlier stuff is easier because things are hybridizing probably just as often but they're not leaving as many fossils because their hybrids are rarer inherently than your sort of generic version of the species uh amber is also correct in the comments she she was like four should only be recommending books that he's read and uh she is correct i have not actually read these they are on my these two are on my i need to read these right (laughs) These are on my, I, I, I need I, to read these when I have time shelf and like, I'm getting to them. I know they come highly recommended and I've, I've read bits of them, but I haven't actually read the whole things. 
destroyed by the SO, absolutely annihilated. I know the feeling. Yep. <laughs> like my, my oh, no, I just wanted to... <laughs> she, she called me out and somebody came to my defense and was like, he's read those. And she was like, I promise he is not. She <laughs> is correct. I am a loser. <laughs> but like, I, the other ones I've suggested, usually I only pull out books that I've at least read most of. But like those two, I just grabbed two other books that I know I haven't recommended before, and they're on my to be read pile over here by the desk. I've got a, a bookshelf here, and like one side is books that I'm reading currently, and the other side is books that I want to read soon. And so, like, you like rank them. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's hard. Uh, $20 from Northern Spike. Hey, Arden, can we get every link for us shared in the live chat put in the description, please? And thanks. Yeah, Arden, can we do that? <laughs> I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and say this is either a joke or you have absolutely no concept of how fucking impossible that is. Uh, no, <laughs> that will absolutely not be happening. Thank you. Arden, Send in your $20 super chats to pressure Arden to fucking copy all the links into the description. <laughs> Arden is going to be getting snug as a bug in a rug and doing a little honk shoe, honk me, me, me sleeping after this. Going to be getting all cozy, going to bed. Oh, 100%. No time for length. No time oh, yeah. for Honk shoe, honk me, me, me. You know, you know um, what I'm talking about. The, the no, I know exactly that, what you mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, I know exactly. It's just the fact that you had, the fact that you said it that way is so good. Um, $10 <laughs> of strawberry vein. I would be 100% down for doing a charity. You guys can each pick one and dedicate a color to them. Give me your emails for real. Uh, go to ValkyLabs.com. There's a contact page on the bottom uh, of the thing. That's Just send me. Send me. Email.com. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go to ValkyLabs.com. Use the contact form on the bottom. Like I said, I want to see a, a lot of things. I'm going to see. Uh, I'm going to be very interested in like your your record your your sales so far. How much we can actually yes. get out there. What your marketing looks like. Blah blah. blah. I'm going to have a lot of business questions. Um, and then still, even if it's like perfect, the answer is probably still going to be not anytime soon, but maybe later. So it just, I'm letting you know now, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but like, it is going to be a very difficult sell, but I do really want to do that. I just don't know how it's going to be feasible for me at this moment. Um, $10 from Ericopedia. I'm training the squirrels in my neighborhood to fight for me when the world breaks down. The leader is Hans. He's a girl. Hell yeah, trans squirrels. <laughs> This is a, this sounds like a powerful leader. Right. <laughs> uh, 1999 from Bryant Gack. Donkey in the well, I'm interested. So the story goes thus. Um, once upon a time, there's a farmer and he's digging a well on his property. And uh, the, the, oh, Empress Lizard wants a parable too. You get a different parable. Um, we'll come back. No, no, that one's um, mine, Forrest. Oh. That parable is mine. Oh, that's right. No, I forgot we both have parables. Okay, cool. Mm. Um, so... This guy digs a well on his property. He's digging a well. He hasn't struck, struck the water yet, but it's super deep. Um, and one day, this donkey that he, this guy has, walking along, not paying attention, falls in this well, well hole. And the donkey's super deep in the ground now. Um, and this donkey is like a prized possession of this guy. He needs it to keep his farm running. It's a work, a beast of burden that he needs. Um, and so the guy tries to pull this donkey out of the well, tries ropes, it tries pulleys, it tries levers, tries everything, can't get it out. Eventually, the guy decides, fuck it. I can't get this donkey out. I'm not going to, I'm just going to have to cut my losses. I'm going to bury this donkey alive. I'm just going to fill in the well. Donkey's going to die. I'm going to start over fresh with a new well, new donkey, new everything. So the guy throws a shovel full of dirt down the well. Dirt lands on the donkey. Donkey shakes off the dirt, steps up on top of it. Guy shovels in more dirt. Dirt lands on the donkey. The donkey shakes off the dirt, steps up on top of it. This goes over and over and over until eventually the well is completely filled in and the donkey's standing right on top. And so the moral of the story is sometimes you find yourself in a shitty situation. And just when you think things can't get worse, life starts throwing more dirt down on top of you. And it's your job to keep a positive attitude. Look for a, a solution. Always be looking for a solution. Don't be trying to problem solve. Be solution finding and shake off that dirt and step up on top of it over and over and over as long as you need to until eventually you'll be out of the shit You'll be out of the hole. You'll be on top of all the dirt that everybody tried to throw on top of you, and you'll be living your happy donkey life. And that's that's a story then, I learned when I was like ten. It, then you can trample the evil farmer, taking out your revenge for his anus right? plot. 
Okay, my parable for Empress Lizard goes something like this. There once was a dog that lived in a village, and in this village there was a butcher. And the dog was minding its business, strolling down the city as usual, when the butcher took pity on him and gave him the most delicious ham hock that he had. He leant down, gave it to the dog, and the dog chomped down on the ham hock and happily scampered away, thinking to himself, how lucky am I that I've got this delectable ham hock? This is just the best day of my life. So he strolls back down the, the, the way, down the, the primary road in the city, and he finds himself crossing over a shallow river. He looks over the bridge to the river, and he sees his reflection in the river and thinks to himself, where, where did that dog get a ham hock? He thinks to himself, Man, this ham hock that I have is pretty good, but it might be even better if I had two. I'll take the ham hock of that other dog, and then I'll have twice the good time. So he leans down to snap the other ham hock out of his reflection's mouth, and in doing so, drops the one in his mouth. It plops into the river and promptly floats away, leaving him ham hockless. And the moral of the story in this fable is to appreciate what you have. Don't get greedy. Love that. That's excellent. That's a good one. I like that one a lot. Thanks, Forrest. Um, I had to memorize $20 it. $20 from James Eat. Call. <laughs> $20 from James Call. Inner fish, please spin a parable about the recurrent nerve. Um, once upon a time, there was a nerve, a, a man, a man nerve, uh, who sought happiness. And so he traveled long and far around the whole world uh, to find the happiness he sought, but he couldn't find anything. And then he got a letter from his uh, spouse at home saying that she was uh, uh, on fire and she needed help. And so the man turned around and went back home to save his spouse and was so happy to see her, not realizing he had missed her for so long. And then he suddenly realized that happiness was where he always was in the first place and that he's, he's always happy the whole time and he, he his happiness was right in front of him. And that's that was the really beautiful. parable of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. That was really beautiful, Forrest. You should you should have that uh, knitted into embroidered. Some needlepoint. <laughs> Some uh, needle. $20 from Brad Bingham. Forrest, another paradox, please. Erica, another nice thing about Kent Hovind. I don't know any other paradoxes. Uh, fucking shit, bro. Um, if you travel back in time to change a thing, then you will change the thing, and then there will be no reason for you to travel back in time to change it. So you won't travel back in time, and that means that the thing will not have been changed, and so you'll travel back in time to change it. And that means that the thing will be changed, and so you won't need to travel back in time, which means that the thing will be the thing, and so you'll have to travel back in time to change it. And that's why time travel is a bad idea even for white people. Time travel is always a bad idea for anybody who isn't white. You, you, like White people can fuck with time machines. There's no reason for anybody else to want to go back. It only gets worse as you go back. Like, even for us, going back in time is, is a bad, bad idea. You get trapped in a loop. I'm still trying to come up with another nice thing to say about Kent Hovind. <laughs> um, hmm. Sometimes he says things that are funny, but they're unintentionally funny. Like he'll he'll just say the same thing, his little mantras, and it, it does kind of tickle me sometimes. Like when he when he he asks you if you believe that pine trees and mosquitoes are related. Like that's such that's such an iconic quip. Everybody instantly knows where it comes from. I mean, Kent Kent really is kind of a noxious little brand, isn't he? He's got his Hawaiian shirt and his stupid quips and his domestic violence, and you just instantly know who we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> he's uh he's a guy. That's he's he's a little gremlin. <laughs> that that sentence right there was so good. He's got his Hawaiian shirts and his stupid quips and his domestic violence. <laughs> That's <laughs> such a good summary. <laughs> God damn, dude. Oh, that's it to brutal. <laughs> that's fucking vicious. You don't have to explain it. Anyone knows. He's like a he's like a Pixar cartoon character design. He's like, you, you know what he's about. <laughs> that's fucking wild, dude. That's fucking wild. Uh, 20 <laughs> Canadian dollars from 18 Miss Mechanical. Forrest, I love your merch and excited to get some. Could I get one more book, please? Love you all. Um, Billions and Billions by Carl Sagan. 
Uh, mm. It's just his take on some stuff, and it's a great little, little read. And he has a whole chapter in here about um, uh, uh, abortion, which is good <laughs> to this day. Um, so read that. It's pretty dope. Uh, remember, the threshold is raised to $20 now, uh, but I'm still going to read Lena's anyway because I want to. Uh, $20 from Ericopedia. Go fuck yourself to Arden as producer. We know what that means for Jimmy, but for Arden, good fucking yob. Um, uh, good enough. Go fuck yourself. And then Lena True. sent $10, but it's okay. I'm going to read it anyway because I want to. Uh, uh, Lena, not Lena. Lena. Miss the show. Gonna rewatch. Love you both. My favorite host times two. Well, thank you so much. And I think that's thank the you. end of the Super Chats, isn't it? That is the end. And it even is. if anyone sends anymore, I've already moved off the Super Chat screen. So fuck y'all trying to do this oh shit. And you're done. $50 Super Chats. $50 Super Chats right now. And I'll read them myself off the screen. I've got them right here in front you? of me. $50 Super Chat. Oh my we're god, really Boris well. can't talk anymore. You guys, I don't know what we're gonna do. You see, I have He's god powers in this game. $50! $50 super chats! Oh, I am the super weird. chat price master! You, you really are I don't know if I'm... Inner Jimmy. This, it's like Jimmy's here. Oh my god, was Deborah right? Was Jimmy the ghost all along? He's here? Right. He's, he's poltergeisting you? Right. Oh my god. Uh, it's been a great show. We, we 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 we've covered a lot of things. We've been a lot of places. Oh, yeah. We 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 laughed, we cried, we we felt emotions. Um uh, we we made fun of Kentoven. Um if you enjoy this kind of content, um why? But hey, <laughs> go ahead and subscribe and also join our Patreon. Um uh, make sure to subscribe to Gutsit Gibbon. Make sure to subscribe to Forest Falkai's channel. Um Make sure to uh, uh, send kind words to Arden Hart and mean words to, to, to Jimmy Snow. Um, uh, thank you so much for the $10, Joe Miller, for your chat. Um, and uh, uh, Erica, do you have anything coming up right now that you want to talk about? Oh, actually, I do. This Friday, I'm releasing a very long video that I have been working on for like several months now. Um, I am going to systematically annihilate the uh, a portion of the career of Jeffrey Tompkins. And the reason it took me so long to do is because I ran all his experiments again. I ran all of them and I had to learn a lot of new things to do it. So come check it out. It's going to be really fun. Um, and I, for one, am nice. excited. So cheer, come cheer me on. I'm, I'm going to make it a premiere. It's going to be great. $50 from Ericopedia. <laughs> you want a super? Here you go. I love you. We love you, Ericopedia. Thank you so much for your fifty dollars super chat. Um, it was so worth it. It was so worth it. That was truly, um, uh, that was truly a, a fantastic chat. I've got a, a a you laugh you lose biology edition coming out this month because Beautiful. I have been in. I was in St. Thomas for the first week of the month. And then I was uh, shooting a video up there. And then I was camping with, I was doing a paleontology expedition um, uh, uh, as well uh, for another week. Um, and then I'm about to go to Austin to, to do uh, a live show there. And then I'm going to be hanging oh, yeah. out with, with, with Matt and Jimmy and Arden for a minute. And then I'm going to go to New Orleans for a couple of days. Um, so I've got like a week to crank out a whole ass video. And so we're doing a you laugh, you lose video. It's going to be the simplest Laziest video ever done, and I bet people love it. Fifty dollars from Brad Bingham. Thank you, Arden. I am not a rich man, but you did great. <laughs> no. One last parable, please, Forrest. Yeah, I'd love no to. More fucking parable. No, I'm, and I'm doing a parable. Fuck your shit. You I'm doing a parable. Uh, is uh uh uh, uh oh? Here's a good one. Um uh. A guy is is uh, a monk and his student are walking along and uh, they rest by this lake in the shade. And the monk says, go get me some water from the lake. I'm thirsty. And as the student walks over, a turtle splashes into the water, kicks up a bunch of mud. And the student looks to the monk and says, I'm sorry, there's mud in the water now. I can't take water from here. It'll be gross. And the monk says, just push the mud back down to the bottom and then take the fresh water on top. So the student pushes the mud down, and of course this stirs up more mud, so he tries again and tries again and tries again, and the more he tries to force the mud down, the more it kicks it up, and the more gross the water gets. 
And finally, he's exhausted and he's frustrated and he's tired. And he goes over to the, uh, the monk and he says, I don't know what to do. And the monk says, all right, just sit down for a while. We'll take a little rest. We'll come back to it later. After about 20 minutes, all the mud is settled. And so the student goes over, gets some fresh water. They both drink and they go on their way. And the moral of the story is sometimes shit gets stirred up in your life or in your mind. Sometimes you get a bunch of things going on. And the more you try to force it down and control it, the more messy it gets and the more tangled up in those negative thoughts and negative situations you get, sometimes the best thing to do is just fucking relax and let your mind be what it is, let your life be what it is, and just let things calm the fuck down. And then you can work it out your own in a little while. You can uh, take some nice stuff off the top. There's the parable for today. $50 from Lana. Lena, I, I think it's Lana. Um, you read my last one even though you didn't have to, so $50 more for being so nice. Thank you. I appreciate I pronounced your name wrong, but I appreciate you sending in. We're always here this for you. IRL, this is a real parable. It's actually a real parable. You you read the chat when you don't have to. Good things come your way. You could just, Forrest, you could just do another parable about this. You could just Just be one. nice and nice things happen. That's that's the whole thing. Nice I have nice like, I have a million more parables up in my no, brain. I was raised no, on. No, you don't. $50! <laughs> from Tron and Troy. Keep on keeping on. All right. Parables $50. now cost. Steph, thank you guys so much. Thanks, the moderators. We are out of here. Oh, my God. Thank you, guys. Goodbye. Thanks so much Goodbye. for watching. Never stop learning. Bye. Oh, is this the roll? Right, we, we did the outro like it just ended. And we got the credits <laughs> roll happening now. Where's the yeah. producers? Send it. We just have to sit here off from you. You can quickly send a hundred dollars and I'll tell oh, oh it's over. It's over now. Damn.